have these slides that are being shown? Yeah, you can do it over here. Okay, just do it right here? Oh, this is, oh, these right here? These right here?
Good morning. We're gonna. Good morning. Good morning. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you all for coming to the fourth uh, annual uh, symposium on the prevention and early detection of ovarian cancer. We're very pleased to host this here at Memorial, but we're very pleased to host it in conjunction with uh, Johns Hopkins and some of our colleagues. Uh, from Johns Hopkins are here, uh, including my co-course directors, uh, Rob Soslo from Memorial, uh, Bob Kerman, and Yiming Shi uh, from Johns Hopkins, who are all here. Uh, good morning. I hope you found the place um, okay. And um, just a few announcements before we begin. Let's see. The first announcement, there are posters displayed in room 101, which is out to the left. Um, Coffee break and lunch will be out here. You found the room to the right, 116, where there's some tables set up. Also for lunch, we have a courtyard outside. If the weather permits, feel free to take your lunch out there. Um, we'd like to thank the Memorial Stone Kettering Cancer Center Continuing Medical Education Office run by Peter Broadhead, who's standing in the back, who generously organized the conference and contributed bas basically uh, most of the funding for the conference. We're very appreciative to the CME office for, for really setting up the entire conference. Uh, Peter and his group's done an excellent job. We also want to thank the Department of Defense, who's allowed this whole consortium to come together. Karen Wiley, who's going to be speaking in a minute, is from um, the DOD here uh, to introduce that program. Um, and they've allowed um, the research groups from Memorial and Hopkins to come together over the past few years to look into this very vexing um, problem. Um, what else? The other thing, the other story I need to tell you is that we set up this conference about six months ago. We invited all the faculty, and then about a month or two later, we, we were told that the cancer, our cancer center core grant is having their site visit that happens once every five years tomorrow. And so basically, um, the president of MSK, who outranks me by a little bit, um, took away many of our conference rooms. And so the bottom line is that tomorrow we will not be meeting here. We'll be meeting in our, our brand new research building across um, 68th Street called the Zuckerman Research Building tomorrow. All the sessions will be held over there. It's a lovely building. Uh, the room's a little bit smaller. And at lunchtime, we'll have some maps at the registration desk just so you don't get lost. But basically, it's in this position on the north side of 68th Street. Um, it's a big building with a, a glass front. Um, and we'll be meeting there tomorrow started at 9 o'clock with breakfast at um, 8 o'clock. And let me just see these if these run through. Peter, any other announcements? That's it? Okay, good. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Karen Wiley from the Department of Defense who will discuss the ovarian cancer research program. Thank you, Dr. Levine, for that introduction. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I'm Karen Wiley. I'm the science officer of the DOD Ovarian Cancer Research Program of the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs. And today I'd like to give you a brief overview of these programs. The Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs, the CDMRP, is a federally funded organization that supports selected biomedical research all across the globe. Its beginnings can be traced back to 1992 when a grassroots advocacy movement campaigned for an increase in breast cancer research. The U.S. Congress responded to this with an initial appropriation of $25 million, which was to be handled by the biomedical research arm of the DOD. That arm is known as the U.S. Army Medical Research and Material Command, or U.S. MRMC. The following year, Congress appropriated $210 million to be put towards externally reviewed, <laughs> peer-reviewed breast cancer research. And that marked the establishment of CDMRP in itself. It still works within the DOD US MRMC organization, but it has grown to include 15 research programs that are in the cancer, neurologic, orthopedic, and military relevant areas. And since its beginning has managed over $7 billion in appropriations. Our mission at CDMRP, our vision, I believe, um, I'm sorry, is to find and fund the best research to eradicate diseases and support the warfighter for the benefit of the American public. We do this on a daily basis by striving towards promoting innovative research, recognizing untapped opportunities, creating partnerships, and guarding the public trust. So if you happen to have an award with us and you get an email from a science officer such as myself, 
that makes you stop, sigh, and wonder why, this is generally what we're doing. So please work with us. Everything has a reason. Uh, CDMRP, for being a small organization, is, does have a pretty significant impact on the biomedical research funding arena. We are the second largest federal funding source for ovarian, breast, and prostate cancer. Seen here are some samples of the program books that are available on our website and are an, a great um, starting point for anybody interested in the programs and in getting funding from them. Collectively, CDMRP has reviewed over 80,000 research proposals and funded over 11,315 research awards worldwide. Established in 1997, the Ovarian Cancer Research Program, or OCRP, was one of the earliest cancer programs to be added to the CDMRP repertoire. OCRP's broad yet critical vision is to eliminate ovarian cancer. We strive to achieve this by supporting research of extreme scientific merit that is focused on detecting, di diagnosing, preventing, and controlling ovarian cancer. From fiscal years 1997 through to 2012, we've managed appropriations of approximately $196 million and given out 284 research awards worldwide. So for all this time and money, how has the ovarian cancer community potentially benefited from the work of the OCRP? Well, we tend to fund high impact, innovative research that is sometimes considered high risk, and oftentimes the potential benefit from those awards may not be realized till the award has concluded. But I would like to show you today some highlights from some of uh, the awards that have panned out. In a 2003 awardee, OCRP awardee, Dr. Zhang, identified five novel biomarkers for ovarian cancer. This was translated into the OVA-1 in vitro diagnostic test, which was approved for use by the FDA in 2009. Another 2006 OCRP awardee, Dr. David Botel of Australia, discovered a specific BRCA2 genotype that was associated with an increased risk of ovarian cancer. This is now the basis of a genetic screen for ovarian cancer risk. In 2009, an OCRP awardee, Dr. Patricia Crook, discovered elevated levels of BCL2 in the urine of women at high, associated with higher ovarian cancer risk. Currently, there is now a device based on this outcome that is being uh, prepared for commercial use. In the mid-2000s, OCRP made a concerted effort to put together an award mechanism that we thought would be a game changer in the ovarian cancer research field. Um, the intent of that award was to bring together a major multi-institutional research effort that would focus on identifying and characterizing early changes of disease that are associated with ovarian cancer. It would also integrate a team of preeminent investigators from appropriate disciplines and multiple institutions who would propose coordinated plans that integrate and optimize research collaborations within the consortium. So in fiscal years 2008 and 2009, we had a round of awards that went out to several awardees to prepare them towards this big OCRP consortium award which was offered in 2010. And from that group, we had one single awardee for $12 million, and that was Dr. Kerman's group. It has investigators that are across Johns Hopkins, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Yale University Health Network of Toronto. And today, we're going to be graced with speak talks from several of these investigators. I'd like to wrap up with some good news. The OCRP has $20 million for its fiscal year 2013 research funding plan. And the uh, slide here is a home page, which generally opens up to a central features, which is updated regularly. And since I made the slide, this has already been updated to add more programs. But the main point of this slide is to show you that if you go here and click on the ovarian cancer link, it'll bring you to the program announcement or calls for proposals that are specific to ovarian cancer. Currently, we have three up, the Ovarian Cancer Academy Award, the Pilot, and the Teal Innovator Award. Please notice that they all have pre-applications. In fact, the Ovarian Cancer Program has pre-application screening for every single proposal. 
but we now have the deadlines up for both pre-application and application, so that's definitely something to be aware of. We also have pre-announcements up for two more awards. One is the Research Development Award, and another one is the Clinical Translational Leverage, Leverage Award. Um, with that, I'd like to wind up with a few important addresses, such as how to get uh, added to our mailing list, and the application and pre-application email addresses. And all of these are available at our main um, website at httpcdmrp.army.mil. Thank you so much for your attention, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Karen. This is certainly a program that's making a big difference in the ovarian cancer uh, research arena. Um, I just forgot to make two announcements. Uh, one mundane announcement is that if you're looking for bathrooms, they're over here in the corner right by the posters. Uh, but more importantly, for anyone who's new to our center um, and hasn't been here before, would like to see the rest of our facilities outside of this conference room. Um, at the end of today's session, around 3.30, uh, two of our fellows, uh, Karen St. Clair and Jennifer Ducey, uh, will meet anybody outside here in the foyer who'd like to see either our clinical facilities or our research facilities. I know there's a few people who've come from quite a distance. Uh, um, and please feel free to come out there afterwards to, to see the rest of our facilities. Um, and without further ado, our first speaker is Bob Kerman, who really needs no uh, introduction, who will um, open the conference. Uh, thank you very much, Doug. And, and again, just to uh, thank Doug and his colleagues here at Memorial for uh, organizing this program. Uh, we've been doing this for quite a, a number of uh, months and uh, they've just done an outstanding job and we're really delighted and pleased that they've, they've uh, done this. And um, after my talk, by the way, I think uh, Dr. Soslow will be coming up to uh, moderate the rest of this uh, session. So I'd like to kind of pick up uh, and continue where uh, Dr. Wiley left off. Uh, in other words, uh, giving you a little bit of background uh, much of this, this, these initial slides, it, it really, yeah, I realize virtually all of you know about, but it's sort of a good way to just get things started. And then tell you a little bit about the objectives, uh, our primary ob objectives of the DOD grant that, that Karen mentioned, and then get into a, a very brief presentation on the origins, we think the origins of low-grade serous carcinoma are although the focus of, of the entire symposium is on high grade, but low grade is an important one and we shouldn't neglect it. So um, uh, again, as, as I'm sure you all know, ovarian cancer really is an extraordinarily lethal uh, disease for women. It, it's much more, it's fortunately not nearly as frequent as breast cancer, but it's uh, three to four times more lethal in terms of mortality versus the, uh, the incidence rates. So in the U.S. Um, every year there are approximately 22,000 uh, new cases and nearly 14,000 deaths from the disease uh, worldwide, um, nearly uh, a quarter of a million cases, uh, new cases, and uh, 125,000 deaths from uh, ovarian cancer. Well, this is a, an interesting observation, and that is that um, in terms of the war against cancer, uh, which was initiated under the Nixon administration, we have been making progress. And uh, as you can see here, for every major form of cancer that I won't bother repeating, there has been a continuous drop in mortality. But you'll notice a notable exception to that, and that, of course, is ovarian cancer, which is uh, to some extent uh, depicted in, the, in this slide. And although it ends at uh, 2000, I think you could uh, say that it's just as relevant uh, in 2013 as it is in 2000. And that is despite the introduction of uh, new and uh, radical forms of surgery, the introduction of new uh, uh, chemotherapeutic agents, the overall, and I'm emphasizing the overall mortality of ovarian cancer has not changed in 50, 60 years. Now having said that, we have made progress in that the disease-free interval has been extended, and that's been a remarkable achievement. Women who were dying of this disease in the, in the as, probably as late as the 60s and early 70s from, in, uh, with advanced stage ovarian cancer dying in two or three years, now women go on for five, six, and seven. So there definitely has been progress in extending disease-free survival. 
Now, uh, again, the ovarian cancer research program, and I won't spend time because Karen went over this with you, but just to uh, elaborate on that, uh, on the, the central theme, uh, which is highlighted in yellow, and that is that what the, consort what the DOD was looking for were to for a consortium, a group of, of institutions to get together and try to really focus on the early events in the development of ovarian cancer. And I'll keep coming back to that, the, the early events of ovarian cancer, because that's what this program is really all about. So again, just to reiterate what Karen said, this consortium consisting of Hopkins, Memorial, University of Toronto, and Yale, uh, focusing on high-grade serous carcinoma. And um, to, to give you some, again, a review of what many of you know anyway, the way we approach treatment of ovarian cancer, and have for years, is that we, for, and I'm talking about now established advanced disease, is that we use surgery and chemotherapy. And again, just to, as I mentioned just a moment ago, disease-free interval has increased, but over-survival has not. So, Surgery and chemotherapy, the problems, if you will, with them, despite what they've, uh, the advances that we've uh, resulted from them, have had relatively limited success, again, in, 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 dis in really reducing ovarian cancer mortality. Now, when you think about other diseases, we really focus more on trying to prevent them than trying to treat advanced cases. So, for example, infectious diseases, we, we develop vaccines which can prevent them entirely. Cardiovascular disease, we try to reduce the incidence looking at dietary changes, exercise, drugs such as statins, for example. Well, the, what, what contrasts them to what we're doing with ovarian cancer is that these approaches are inexpensive, simple, and easy to deliver. But the reason they've been successful is the fact that we understand the mechanisms of the disease. Now take, for example, uh, the cost of treating a woman with um, advanced stage cervical cancer. When you consider surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, the long hospitalization, laboratory tests, imaging studies, nursing care, follow-up exams, the costs are staggering and the efficacy is, again, relatively limited. Uh, on the other hand, you look at HPV vaccine, which even at $360 is probably too expensive, uh, it, but is virtually 100% effective. And the reason that that's the case is that uh, the success has been based on the fact that we understand the mechanism of disease. We learned, obviously, that HPV is, essentially, is essential for the development of this disease, and if we can eliminate that, we can, el we can prevent the disease from occurring in the first place. So where do we need to go in terms of reducing the burden of ovarian cancer? Uh, certainly, we should not give up on, on therapies uh, that for the treatment of advanced cancer. That's clearly women are still going to be presenting with advanced stage disease, and we need to take care of them. On the other hand, I think we really need to focus, as this grant, I think, is, it was aimed to do, at prevention and early detection. And in order to accomplish that, again, we get back to disease mechanisms, and that's what this, is, uh, this whole uh, DOD consortium is about. So let me very briefly, in very broad strokes, go over the objectives of our uh, consortium grant and the, uh, the specifics of each of the various projects will be brought out in the various presentations by the project leaders of these, of these different uh, uh, grant, of these different projects. So the immediate objective is to characterize, again to repeat, the morphologic, molecular, genetic, immunohistochemical, and epidemiologic features have the precursors of high-grade serous carcinoma. Our long-term objectives, early detection, and prevention by surgical or medical approaches. So in project one, uh, we sticks are serous tubal intrahepithelial carcinomas. You're going to be hearing a lot about those during the course of this symposium, and I know many of you are already familiar with it. But the question is, and, ha and although I think evidence is mounting that we think they are precursors, it hasn't really definitively been proven to everyone's satisfaction that maybe they're not precursors but are the result of a cancer coming from the ovary and implanting in the tube. Uh, so what Project One is, uh, is, is aiming to do is to analyze sticks from women who have um, a concomitant ovarian cancer. 
and determine if the high-grade serous carcinoma in the ovary has acquired additional mutagenic alterations compared to the stick, which would, of course, indicate that it's a progression from the stick to the ovarian cancer and not the reverse. In project two, uh, we're going to be evaluating uh, various proposed sites of origin. Uh, a lot of attention has recently been focused on the fallopian tube, but over the years, as you know, ovarian surface epithelium, cortical inclusion cysts in the peritoneum have all been, at uh, one time or another, implicated as the site of origin. So we don't want to dismiss those entirely. We want to investigate all of them to really determine which really is, and it may be there more than one site. Are the morphologic and molecular features of tubal, ovarian, primary peritoneal carcinomas are the same? Uh, if they are, this would confirm that many of these high-grade serous carcinomas originate in the tube because to remind you, despite all the years of looking for precursor lesions in the ovary and the peritoneum, we never really found them, but we now have seen precursors in the tube. So if they really all look the same and the only precursor we really identified is the tube, well, that would make sense that uh, the, that's where the site of origin is. In project three, we're going to look for uh, early molecular changes that precede the development of sticks and uh, gene expression analysis of what we're going to of morphologically normal fallopian tube uh, from high risk women compared to fallopian tube uh, controls to see if there's something already that we can pick up in what looks like a morphologically normal tube that already places these p uh, women at higher risk and IE is therefore a true precursor lesion. Sticks, some argue, it aren't, isn't really a precursor because it's already cancer but just confined to the fallopian tube. Uh, as part of that project, an in vitro system with a, using a mouse model to generate a molecularly a defined cancer resembling high-grade serous carcinoma and OSE using oncogenes expressed in ovarian cancer will be developed. In project four, precursor lesions of ovarian cancer in a mouse model to explore the role of the microenvironment. We know for, we, we think, we believe for many years that ovulation is somehow uh, implicated with the development of ovarian cancer, so we want to explore that more carefully and really see what, uh, what, the, what is going on in terms of ovulation and other events that may be occurring at the time of ovulation. Uh, and uh, the project five is uh, the epidemiologic project that's going to try to correlate all the other molecular uh, data that's coming out of the other four projects by looking at biomarkers and epidemiologic profiles of putative precursor lesions in the fallopian tubes and ovaries of women with, at a high risk of developing ovarian cancer and determine if these biomarkers and associated precursor lesions are modifiable. Oral contraceptives, again, I mentioned earlier ovulation. Well, we also know that oral contraceptives, maybe by just reducing the frequency of ovulations in a woman's lifetime, is an important factor in reducing the risk of ovarian cancer. Maybe there are other agents, anti-inflammatory, for example. So that is really uh, my overall summary of our grant, which I said, again, is going to be, you're going to get many more details as each one of the investigators who's involved with these grants is going to be presenting uh, data, as well as some of our uh, speakers who are coming from, who are not involved with the, camp, uh, the grant directly, but are working in related areas. And uh, you'll be hearing more from them in just a few minutes. So I'm going to really spend the next 20 minutes or so on the origin of low-grade serous proliferative lesions. And I use the term lesions because I'm using it as a very inclusive term to include not just low-grade ovarian serous carcinoma, but also a, what we term a typical pr proliferative or borderline tumors, non-invasive implants, and in endosalpingiosis. And a lot of the data that I'm going to present in, in this talk comes from a paper that was published uh, not too long ago in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology, and I'll go into some of the background of that uh, study in just, uh, just a moment. So briefly, the birth of borderline. It all started really in 1971 when Figo uh, first proposed a term that, interestingly enough, was not called borderline. It was actually called atypically proliferating cells of blah, 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 blah. Then two years later, WHO, which was a group of pathologists, decided to simplify this and just call them borderline tumors. Well, the, since that time, there's been considerable controversy concerning both the terminology and the behavior of these, of these tumors, but little attention has really been directed to how they originate. 
Another uh, lesion that's been looked at or uh, discussed in the literature to a very limited extent over the last several years, uh, possibly relating this lesion to, to borderline tumors, is tubal hyperplasia. So in one study uh, coming out of MD Anderson, uh, the investigators found that tubal hyperplasia was significantly associated with the develop with uh, with associated with uh, borderline tumors, and here you can see a, a very good p-value uh, in borderline tumors compared to controls. Now, on the uh, then surprisingly, another study, uh, this one coming out of uh, George Washington, indicated they looked at tubal hyperplasia and its association with borderline tumors no significant association. So diametrically opposite conclusions. How could this be? Well, in reviewing these papers pretty carefully, my thinking is that they're, they're, they use very different criteria for the diagnosis of tubal hyperplasia, and that's what led to uh, the differences in, the, in their uh, conclusions that were so uh, opposed to one another. Well, uh, I alluded to in, in just a moment ago that this, most of the data I'll be presenting comes from this study of um, a combat of serous borderline tumors that comes out of a, a larger study, a uh, population-based study in uh, Denmark. It's been going on for now close to nine years and is an ongoing uh, analysis now. It's the entire female population of Denmark, so it's about two and a half million women, of which uh, we're looking at uh, nearly a thousand women with serous borderline tumors, and uh, they were collected over a 30 t uh, over a 20 year period. They've been long term follow up, and all these cases. Originally, we started with about 1,800 borderline tumors as they were classified in various hospitals throughout Denmark. Uh, then uh, Russell Vang, myself, and uh, Yetta Jung, a Danish pathologist, did a, a, a review, sort of a panel type review, and eliminated nearly half of them, mostly because of misclassification. So there's long-term follow-up. Very few women lost the follow-up. It's remarkable. I mean, in the U.S., it's impossible to do a study like this. Well. Of those women, we initially did not intend to look at the fallopian tube. This came out after the analysis in a way, so it's important to understand that why this study boils down to 22 patients. Well, it turns out that 22 of them had um, implants on the fallopian tube. So we wanted to study at the beginning the ovarian tumor and the implants and look and see how they related to one another and see how these women, of course, uh, what the behavior was over time. So in, uh, we didn't really focus, we didn't look, pay attention to the tubes that were not involved. So it turns out that 22 women had implants on their fallopian tube. So because there were implants, we would look at the implants carefully. And those implants had fallopian tubes with them. So that made us look more carefully at the fallopian tubes. And this is where we found a lesion um, that we, I will show you in a moment, that we call papillary tubal hyperplasia. During that period of time, uh, we also had nine cases, I think, no, seven cases that were seen at Hopkins uh, through cons uh, consultation material in which the same lesion was found in the fallopian tube, but we saw no other lesion elsewhere, not in the ovary, not in the peritoneum elsewhere. So it's completely confined to the fallopian tube. So that, those, those 29 cases really provide uh, the uh, study that I'll be showing to you. So as I mentioned, uh, and I'll show you the features of it in a, in a moment, we tried to really make the definition of hyperplasia a little crisper. Because I think in those two other studies, I mentioned the, the criteria were different. I think they were, they were especially the, 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 Georgetown, the George Washington study was very inclusive, included things that may have been the earliest form of hyperplasia, but that was, I think, arguably not reproducible. So. What we're going to look at are, is a papillary tufting and clusters of detached epithelial cells, I'm going to show you those in a moment, containing both secret, uh, secretory and ciliated cells that are sometimes associated with somoma bodies, in fact, most of the time associated with somoma bodies, that are floating in the lumen of the, of the fallopian tube. And that's papillary tubal hyperplasia. So uh, this is what we're uh, looking at. Um, and here's, the, just for you, those of you who are not pathologists, so this is the um, fallopian tube at a sort of medium to low power. These are the pleaky in the, in the, uh, that are filling up the lumen. And uh, I'll be drawing your attention to these changes, which are not normal. And you can't really appreciate them on this magnification but uh, they are not normally found in a fallopian tube. And looking at it higher power, you can see 
these tiny clusters and little papillae that are floating in the tube of lumen. Here you look at uh, even higher power and see some in the, in the lumen with the Samoma body, these little calcific uh, spherules. And here you see one that's in the epithelium of the fallopian tube, and there's one in the actual lamina propria. Well, um, papillary tubal hyperplasia is found in association with these borderline tumors in about 90% of cases. But having said that, I want to emphasize again that this was a small number of cases and was highly selected. They were selected at because they had implants. So uh, we do not know the true frequency of uh, this lesion in women with borderline tumors, other than I will tell you that as, uh, over the years I've looked at I see many, many of these cases, thousands really, uh, over my career. Uh, I can tell you I see it quite often. Not all the time, but very often. But it would be an interesting, th uh, something that needs to be pursued. And we certainly don't know the prevalence of papillary tubal hyperplasia in the population. So those are the, the shortcomings of this analysis. Now what we did find, which was of interest, and I think ultimately will be shown to be important, is the presence of acute and chronic salpingitis or evidence of tubal damage, uh, pleaky that are blunted, or this bridging of the fallopian tube, pathologic changes that indicate in the past the patient has had salpingitis, but it's now been healed, but there's been damage to the tube. So putting that together, the way we see the evolution of this lesion is it begins with chronic inflammation, which leads to a focal epithelial stratification that you see here. So there's this little humping up of epithelium. And some of those, for example, in the, in the uh, GW study were called hyperplasia. But I'm not sure that all of these may, and I think it is the very earliest form, but I don't think all these continue to evolve. Some of them maybe just disappear again, and that's why they didn't find that association with uh, uh, serious borderline tumors. So as these little humped up uh, tufts expand, they form rounded papillae, as you see here. The next thing that happens is these papillae actually get cut off and pinched off and extruded into the lumen, as you see here, and uh, then float off into the lumen. And you can see them in varying amounts, sometimes just a few, sometimes quite a number, as you see, as is, is in this uh, slide. Just a quick comparison of the morphology of papillary tubal hyperplasia, the upper two uh, images, to an atypical proliferative borderline tumor. And I think you can appreciate the similarity. Well, I think that's probably not the only source of uh, atypical proliferative serous tumors. I think some of them, and I think the same can be said for high-grade serous carcinoma, which I'm not going to get into. The other speakers will discuss that, are cortical inclusion cysts which to remind you has been one of the sources of one of the presumed uh, derivations of ovarian serous carcinoma for a long time. I mentioned the importance of ovulation, so I think it, 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 it's a worthwhile to examine more closely the relationship of the ovary to the fallopian tube at the time of ovulation. So here we see a, um, a follicle that develops that then at the time of ovulation, the ovarian surface epithelium is ruptured, the oocyte gets transmitted to the fimbria, uh, but what I'm going to focus your attention on is this rupture site. So we speculate that what's going on is when the fallopian tube fimbria are in such close contact with the ovary at the time of ovulation, secretory and ciliated cells can be easily uh, exfoliated. Eming it tells me in the laboratory when they want to get some of these cells for culture, they instill saline at one end, they shake the tube, and they collect the cells at the other end. So they're very loosely cohesive. So we think that they may be easily dislodged, implant on this rupture site, and then invaginate and form a cortical inclusion cyst, which is lined by secretory and ciliated cells, the cells we see identically uh, that we see from the, in the fallopian tube. On the other hand, there are other types of inclusions that you see here in which the epithelium lining the inclusion is virtually identical. It's flattened. You don't see the ciliated or secretory cells. And we think, yes, those develop by um, invagination of the ovarian surface epithelium, which has been over the years proposed as the source of the inclusions not coming from the fallopian tube. 
Well, to pursue this issue of two different types of cysts with possibly two different origins, uh, uh, we began exploring this with markers, immunohistochemical markers. Pax-8 is a Mullerian marker and calretinin is a mesothelial marker. And if you look at ovarian cancer, you can see it expresses Pax-8 very, very strongly and diffusely. On the other hand, calretinin in the tumor is not. You see positive cells in the stroma, which is another uh, important issue, but which I won't have time to get into today. Uh, and then com let's compare the, uh, the immunoprofile of this high-grade serous carcinoma to fallopian tube epithelium. And here you can see Pax8 Express, but not calretinin, which is totally the opposite of the ovarian surface epithelium, where Pax8 is not expressed, but calretinin is. Well, um, this is an interesting study that was reported uh, recently coming from Lee and colleagues in which they did what I just showed you, very similar, but they analyzed a large number of cases looking at calretinin and Pax8 in both cortical inclusion cysts and fallopian tubes. So what they found was that uh, when they looked at the ovarian surface epithelium, on rare occasion, they could find some tubal epithelium there, which would show that the, the immunoprofile that I just demonstrated to you. But on the other hand, most of what they saw was mesothelium, these flat, uh, very nondescript looking cells, which are like I just showed you, calretinin positive and Pax8 um, uh, negative, and that's in 96% the, in of their cases. Then they, they looked at the fallopian tube, and they found that the secretory cells, again, as I showed you, Pax8 positive, calretinin negative. The ciliated cells were negative for both markers. Uh, cortical inclusion cysts that they then looked at fell into these two different groups. Uh, they're the ones that were aligned by tubal type epithelium, showing that same tubal type uh, immunoprofile, and there were those that were aligned by flattened epithelium, the mesothelial type, if you will, showing the immunoprofile of the normal ovarian surface epithelium. So they concluded, as I just showed you too, that there are two different types of cortical in inclusion cysts. Now, just to uh, illustrate that a little bit uh, further, here you're looking at ovarian surface epithelium stained for calretinin, strongly positive. Uh, this invaginating, what we think is fallopian tube epithelium, and the cortical inclusion cysts that are negative. On the other hand, Pax8 negative in the OSC and strongly positive both in the tube and in the cortical inclusion cyst. Well, let's now really go down at higher power and look, exa examine very closely the actual epithelium that surrounds some of these cortical in inclusion cysts and compare it to the fallopian tube epithelium. So as I've been leading up to it, they're, they're virtually identical. You see the secretory cells, you see the ciliated cells, and in addition, you see these cells, and this, is, this never ceases to amaze me, something, you know, you look at, I've been looking at tubes my entire career and never really paid much attention to those, and then suddenly as we began looking at sticks, and we began much more closely looking at these cells, and we wondered what they were. So I went to the older literature, my predecessor Don Woodruff at Hopkins reported them thinking they were precursors of, uh, uh, they were stem cells for the development of secretory and ciliated cells. And then uh, I talked about this with Yi Ming and he said, well, you know, they look a lot like lymphocytes, don't they? So um, uh, he did some immunohistochemistry and uh, CD45 turned out to be that they're strongly positive. So with that as a, a starting point, we said, well, let's look at these more carefully. And we started looking at them with various markers for different subsets of immune cells. And here you can see that um, these, uh, the, what we found, again, both in cortical inclusion cysts and the fallopian tube, there are CD, uh, T, uh, CD8 positive uh, T lymphocytes, um, and we also see macrophages that can be identified in them. Here you see another uh, normal fallopian tube uh, with uh, the cell double staining uh, preparation in which the pink cells are CD3 cells, and the brown cells, which are quite a, a number of them here, are a subpopulation of NK cells. So uh, these immune cells in the, in the uh, tube, normal tube, which you see in every fallopian tube, the fallopian tube appears to contain a large number and variety of these cells. Most of them are cytotoxic CD8 uh, cells, as I showed you, some macrophages, other, others populations as well. We know that the NK cells, this population, can secrete IL-2, a cytokine that's involved in mucosal protection. So 
what the thinking is, as in the gut, uh, these uh, cells are there for providing some kind of mucosal protection. But possibly inflammation may lead to the development of uh, neoplasia. And just to show you that uh, you see the very same cells in the atypical proliferative serous tumors, again, both the CD68 and the CD8 cells. So comparing then cortical inclusion cysts and fallopian tubes, the co cellular composition of these of the tubal-lined cortical inclusion cysts and tubal epithelium are virtually identical. OSE really doesn't contain lymphocytes. Uh, so the, our thinking is, as I've been saying, is that the cortical inclusion cysts lined by flattened epithelium are due to invaginations of the surface epithelium, whereas the ones lined by columnar epithelium are of tubal origin. Now, cortical inclusion cysts, we theorize, can expand and develop into cyst adenomas. So, um, a number of years ago, uh, in, uh, coming out of, uh, again, a nice study coming out of Eming's laboratory, they first looked at serous adenomas, and this was at a time when we already knew that KRAS and BRAF mutations were the most common mutations in low-grade serous carcinomas and in atypical proliferative serous tumors. So they looked for those proliferations in cystadenomas, and they didn't find any. Then they looked at cystadenomas in which there was a small focus of, a, of an atypical proliferative or borderline tumor, and then they micro, microdissected the epithelium from that tumor and the cystadenoma and uh, sequenced the uh, genes of BRAF and KRAS and found that you could find the identical, in this case a BRAF mutation, in the epithelium of the cystadenoma adjacent to the uh, borderline tumor as th and the same mutation in the actual borderline tumor, suggesting that they were clonally related and that perhaps what was happening is in cystadenomas where you get a KRAS B or BRAF mutation, that then develops into a, um, a serous borderline tumors. Tumor. Endosalpingiosis. Uh, we see that all the time, not only in patients with borderline tumors, but certainly in patients with those tumors, there's an increased frequency compared to controls. And there, there was a report a number of years ago, actually, uh, again, identifying the identical KRAS mutation in the lymph node of a patient, I think with two patients, with endosalpingiosis, and the same uh, mutation in a, their primary and their associated serous borderline tumor. And they didn't commit. They said that, well, this could either be an independent, separate uh, origin or perhaps spread from the uh, fallopian, uh, from the uh, borderline tumor. I think uh, my thinking at this point, based again on data that we're currently analyzing from that study in Denmark, is that these, uh, these lesions, and we haven't really specifically looked at endosalpingiosis yet, but certainly the implants seem, again, have the identical mutation suggesting that they're implanting from the ovarian tumor. There's also been, uh, again, we, we see it in this Denmark study, something I've seen in my own practice, but this was a study coming out of uh, MD Anderson showing that in patients that did not have a borderline tumor of the ovary but had in their lymph nodes a combination of endosalpingiosis and low-grade serous carcinoma suggesting that endosalpingiosis over time can progress to a low-grade serous carcinoma. So the relationship of fallopian tube epithelium to low-grade serous carcinoma, this is back to that study by Lee uh, and colleagues. And what they did, there were a couple of nice things. The first they did was a ratio of secretory to ciliated cells. And because cilia sometime, are sometimes difficult to see, they used tubulin stain, which identifies uh, cilia. And they compared fallopian tube, so cortical inclusion cysts, the tubal type, serous cystadenomas, uh, atypical proliferous serous tumors, and low-grade serous carcinoma. And when they looked at that ratio, you can see that as you go from fallopian tube epithelium to low-grade serous carcinoma, that ratio increases. So you're getting an outgrowth of secretory cells. And this mechanism has also been proposed by Chris Crum and colleagues uh, and Dr. Drapkin, who you'll hear later, uh, as the same origin for the high-grade serous carcinoma this is an outgrowth of secretory cells uh, derived ultimately from the uh, fallopian tube. They also looked at the chi, uh, the chi 67 uh, uh, proliferation index, uh, comparing again fallopian tube, and as you can see, it, there's a, a pretty much of a steady increase. So it suggested to them, that based on this ratio, the increase in KI67, that low-grade serous carcinoma develops in a very uh, stepwise progression uh, from secretory 
epithelium. Well, this tries to put it all together. Uh, a massive slide uh, looking at a model for a low-grade and high-grade serous carcinoma, but as I said, I'm not going to discuss the high grade, but suffice it to say that um, we think uh, the, the culprit ultimately is the fallopian tube epithelium. So just looking at the, uh, the low-grade uh, tumors, beginning with papillary tubal hyperplasia, which can implant on the ovary uh, or on the peritoneum, uh, lead to the development of an atypical proliferative serous tumor, go on to a low-grade serous carcinoma. Peritoneum, endosalpingiosis, non-invasive implant can go either way or perhaps fallopian tube epithelium without going through this hyperplasia, and this is what we, again, speculating, it's a, it's, a, it's a hypothesis, can implant on the ovary or the peritoneum, and again, form a cortical inclusion cyst and adenoma and so forth, and the same thing for peritoneum going on to endosalpingiosis and, and so forth. So in terms of the pathogenesis then of these low-grade serous proliferations, this model, I think, can es explain the development not only of the ovarian tumors, but also these lesions that we see developing that we think primarily in the peritoneum in the absence of an ovarian tumor. And uh, in, in our practice, in our consultation practice, we see, well, on a couple, few cases a year where the pathologist is just totally puzzled. He says, or she says, look, we see these, they look like non-invasive implants in the peritoneum. They're all over the place, but there's no ovarian tumor. We section the entire ovary. Well, we think it's possibly because they're, they don't need that ovarian tumor to start with. They can come directly from fallopian tube. So uh, in conclusion then, uh, in our opinion at this point, all ser pelvic serous proliferations, benign and malignant, develop from fallopian tube epithelium. Thank you very much. We're a little short on time, so why don't you go on and wrap up here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bob, for that great talk. Um, quick word of introduction for myself. I'm uh, Rob Soslow. I'm the director of gynecologic uh, pathology here. It's my bar mitzvah year at Memorial. I've been here 13 years. I can't believe it. And uh, with that out of the way, I'd like to move on to um, introducing Ronnie Drapkin. It's a great pleasure of mine to have him here today. I, of course, have been familiar with his name uh, for a number of years, but it was really only today that I actually was able to put together the face with his name. And he has a very complicated uh, list of titles here, which I'm going to summarize for you. He's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology at Harvard Medical School. He's an associate uh, pathologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and he runs his own lab. He's a principal investigator of the Drapkin Lab in the Division of Medical Oncology at the Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Institute. Ronnie's, most of Ronnie's work focuses on ovarian cancer with the goal of translating some basic information into clinically useful diagnostic and therapeutic tests. So um, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Ronnie Drapkin. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Doug, for the invitation. I, uh, I'm glad you stuck with me this year. For those of you who are familiar, last year I was invited. I couldn't come because I had a wee bit of a little biking accident that uh, knocked me out for a few months. But I'm glad to be back this year to share with you some of the things that are going on in our lab. And I thank Bob for that great introduction because it segues directly into the discussion of high-grade serous carcinomas. So ovarian cancer, as most of you know, is a heterogeneous disease. There's not a single type of ovarian cancer. And what this uh, figure tries to illustrate is, let me just see if this is working perfect, is the, uh, the four major subtypes of ovarian cancer that uh, were all until some time ago considered to be emerging from the ovarian surface epithelium, as I heard about from Dr. Kerman, that envelops the ovary. And even though all these look different under the microscope, they also have their own unique natural clinical history. And it was with that distinction and, and the heterogeneity and c confusion that that caused in the field that uh, Kerman and she really thought about trying to come up with some classification system that probably about 10 years ago now, I think, Bob, where we could start thinking about how do we classify these tumors in a manner that would make them amenable to molecular diagnoses. So they came up with this two-tier system for classifying ovarian tumors. You have the type 1 tumors that encompassed all the histological subtypes, including the low-grade serous carcinomas, which we just heard about. These tumors tend to be 
Low grade, they're slow growing. They have mutations in some of our favorite cancer genes that are listed here, including KRAS, BRAF, and RB2. And the list continues to grow, as we've seen in the last few years, mutations in ARD1A uh, formed in remodeling complex. Some of them are associated with precursors in the ovary. We just heard about precursors in the fallopian tube. And they are quite different than the type 2 tumors, which are high-grade, aggressive tumors, usually well uh, beyond the confines of the ovary at the time of diagnosis. Type 2 tumors, by and large, are composed of high-grade serous carcinomas. There are also high-grade endometrial tumors and carcinosarcomas, which can be clumped into this group. They oftentimes have mutations in the tumor suppressor P53 gene, but until recently had no known precursor lesions that we could identify. Mutation in the BRCA1 gene, which is the tumor suppressor that governs genomic integrity in, uh, in all cells, uh, was, has been shown to be a predisposing event for women and predisposed them to getting ovarian and breast cancers. And it was really the study of the BRCA1 gene in this population of women that sort of opened up the opportunity to look at these earlier high-grade serous carcinomas and ask the question, where do they come from? So as many of you know, most women who have the BRCA1 mutation, BRCA1 or 2, are offered the opportunity for tubal and, uh, and uh, ovary removal after childbearing years. And this offers the, uh, the opportunity for pathologists to look at these samples and ask the question, where are these lesions? What do they look like? How can we characterize them? The, the graph here simply illustrates that the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations really cover about almost a half of all genomic alterations that are found in hereditary cancers. There are other genes, many of them involved in DNA repair, that contribute to the rest of that pie chart. And what this table, by all means, is not um, completely inclusive, but what this table really illustrates is over the period of the last five to ten years, some of the findings of these uh, investigators when looking at these salpingophorectomy specimens. And what they find was surprising, which is that in most cases, when there was a tumor, the tumor tended to be confined to the fallopian tube. Forty-two to one hundred percent of these cases had early cancers in the tube, not the ovary. And in some cases, we could find early in situ carcinomas, what Bob referred to as sticks, serous tubal intraepithelial carcinomas confined to the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube. So there was already evidence that perhaps the er origins of these cancers were not the ovary itself. And Chris Crum and colleagues tried to sort of pull this together uh, in around 2006, 2007 by developing a very systematic way of examining the fallopian tube from these salpingophorectomy specimens. They call this the CFIM protocol. It stands for sectioning and extensively examining the fallopian tube fimbria. And what essentially it involves is amputation of the fimbria at the end of the fallopian tube and sectioning it in a manner that exposes as much surface area as possible so that we can actually see under the microscope whether there are any lesions that can be identified. So what did they find? So for those of you who are not pathologists, the fallopian tube, as you heard, has ciliated and secretory cells. If we stain normal fallopian tube for expression of the P53 tumor suppressor, we often see no expression at all, and we're looking for brown staining here in the nuclei. If we look for DNA damage, as measured by a specialized histone called H2AX that gets phosphorylated at sites of double strand breaks, we rarely see any in normal fallopian tube. And if we look at MIB-1 or Key 67 a proliferation marker, again, we see very little proliferation in normal fallopian tubes. But what we see in, a th in up to a third of all women, regardless of risk, is what we call the P53 signature, which is an expansion of secretory cells that look normal under the microscope but strongly express the P53 protein, show evidence of DNA damage, but do not <coughs> proliferate. And in the women who had the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, where we find that occult cancer in 3 to 12 percent of the time, we see what's called the tubal intraepithelial carcinoma, or the stick lesion, that has all the morphologic features and criteria of an in situ carcinoma. It retains expression of P53. You see nice nu intranuclear foci of DNA damage, but now have acquired a proliferative capacity, and these are shared with the bulky ovarian cancer that gets diagnosed at the time of clinical management. And this illustration here just tries to depict the evolution of normal fallopian tube epithelial cells into these P53 precursors, in situ carcinomas, and then the dissemination of the invasive cancer to the surface of the ovary or the peritoneum. Now, I think it's important to point out here before I go forward that while this looks very nice and neat, uh, I'm sure Bob and Yi can tell you that the inter-observer variability that we see with in situ carcinoma or stick lesions is relatively high. The use of 
biomarkers, uh, for immunohistochemistry is very important and likely is going to raise the interobserver variability, so it's important to keep that in mind. Those of you who are in the community and looking at this, that the, the proteins, PP3, laminin 1C, stathmin, P16, these are all proteins that have been used to credential stick lesions uh, in tissue when you're not sure whether it fulfills all these criteria. And so this emergence of the fallopian tube as a site of origin for high-grade serous carcinomas sort of tries to put together now this integrated model of variant cancer pathogenesis where high-grade lesions might emerge from the fallopian tube and secondarily see the ovarian surface of the perineum. And the low-grade lesions may either come from uh, endocell pingiosis, as you just heard of, metaplasia perhaps of the varying surface epithelium, the evidence for that it seems to be decreasing, not increasing, and perhaps other uh, sources, uh, those who are familiar with uh, Louis de Beau suggest that extra uterine malarian epithelium that may be present in the forms of endocelpingiosis or endocervicosis or endometriosis may also be the site of origin for some of these other lesions. So now we have sort of a dual model of ovarian cancer pathogenesis that we have to take into consideration. And the important part is that as this was happening, I think it's, it, it's kind of neat that at the, at the time that we were starting to get this convergence of understanding at the pathological level, the Cancer Genome Atlas was underway. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Cancer Genome Atlas, the TCGA is an NIH-funded national effort to try to develop a comprehensive public catalog of all the significant alterations present in major carcinoma subtypes. The pilot phase of this study included brain tumors, ovarian cancers, and lung cancers because we are really bad at detecting these, ca these cancers and we have very ineffective therapies for them. In order to create this comprehensive public database, we needed to detect events as rare as 3 percent of the time, hence we needed about 500 samples. How do we classify, how do we characterize these tumors? Well, we used just about every genomic platform that existed at the time, and not only at the time, but also over time. These approaches and these platforms are deployed in real time to look at and characterize these tumors, to try to get a real sense for what's underlying at the molecular level. And so what you're looking at here is some of the early work, and this is a slide I borrowed from my colleague Matt Meyerson at the Broad Institute, where you look at what did we find in GBMs and brain tumors and lung cancers and breast cancers and in ovarian cancers. And what we find is that in just about every tumor type, you see a nice spectrum of mutations in all your favorite cancer genes. P3, NF1, P10, you see the very similar spectrum of mutations in most of these tumors, including breast cancer. And ovarian cancer was very distinct. We saw mutations in P53 in nearly 100 percent of the cases, but hardly any other mutations that really registered high on the scale. So that was very shocking. I remember being at the first Broad uh, conference where they uh, unveiled the, the data, and everyone was really disappointed because what are we really good at these days? We're good at developing therapeutics to mutant forms of cancer genes. Right? And now we, it turns out we all got is P53, and we knew that. So what is ovarian cancer characterized by? It's really characterized by significant copy number alterations throughout the entire genome. So what you're looking at here is a gistic plot from chromosome 1 to 22, looking at all the amplifications throughout the entire genome that are present in these ovarian tumors. Here you're looking at the list of the most commonly amplified genes that we see. And it's interesting, some of the same genes that are mutated in other cancers aren't mutated in ovarian cancer, but they're amplified. Similarly, if you look at deletions, we see that there's deletions throughout the entire genome. And again, some of the same genes that are mutated in the other tumors, NF1, P10, for instance, aren't mutated here. They're just simply gone. So what's happened over the last five to seven years is that our understanding of the molecular pathogenesis of ovarian cancer and the genomic understanding have really converged to tell us that high-grade serous tumors really do start likely from the fallopian tube. They undergo this process of P53 mutations, which we'll talk about later about how that happens that is retained in the intraepithelial carcinoma in the invasive cancer. There are no known other significant mutations uh, that we know of at this time, but that somewhere along the line, and I think we're going to hear about this from Yiming Shi in the next talk, copy number alterations and other molecular events un are, are undergoing so that by the time you get to the clinically manifested disease, we see the, the, the tumor that I just described to you, which is massive copy number alterations with very few other somatic recurrent mutations. So what are the take-home messages? Well, we have precursors to high-grade serous carcinomas existing in the fallopian tube. The CFIM protocol is an important clinical tool for assessing these risk-reducing salpingophorectomies. 
High-grade serous carcinoma is a disease that's characterized by early p53 mutations in almost all cases and widespread copy number alterations. And that's interesting, that's great, but there's a lot of nagging questions. Do all high-grade serous carcinomas come from fallopian tube? How do we treat stick lesions? Should we treat stick lesions? What are the implications for early detection? What are the implications for prophylactic surgery and how do we develop, develop novel therapeutics with so few mutations in these tumor types? And I'm not going to stand here and tell them I'm going to answer all those questions here today, but what I want to tell you is that our approach to trying to answer some of those questions is to take the stand that in order to do so, we need to develop the right model systems to address these questions. And that's really been the focus of the, my lab for the last five, six years, is to develop fallopian tube-based model systems, experimental model systems, that will give us a traction to try to answer some of those questions. And so what this busy slide is illustrating are some of the model systems that we've developed, and I'm going to go through them very quickly and then really focus mostly on one to give you an example of the type of things we're doing. So one of the model systems we developed a couple of years ago is what we call the ex vivo fallopian tube bioanalytical platform. And this is simply our ability to grow normal fallopian tube epithelial cells that are dissociated from fimbria of, of uh, surgical specimens. And they grow on these transville filters that are semi-porous and form a polarized epithelium that enables us to use normal epithelial cells and ask questions, what makes them susceptible to transformations? What are the factors that might make the secretory cell likely to transform? Another model is the isolation of the secretory cell itself and development of cell lines where we can ask what are the contributions of any given genetic alterations towards transformation of these secretory cells, both in vitro and then in vivo. The third is a genetically engineered mouse model, which is where we specifically target the secretory cell in the fallopian tube of the mouse. And finally, our, uh, our living tissue bank or avatar platform, my, Paul, my friend Paul Haluska at the Mayo Clinic described the term as avatar. I think that's something we can all relate to. You take a patient's tumor and you propagate it serially in a mouse. We've been able to show that they retain the genomic uh, fidelity to the original patient sample and hence might be better model systems and cell lines for thinking about drug development and drug discovery. So let me tell you about uh, the model that we haven't published yet. Um, my friend Matt likes to say it's, in, it's not in rejection yet and we're hoping it will be out of that soon. So you heard about PAX-8. So PAX-8 is a fascinating transcription factor. It's involved in the development of female reproductive system. If you knock out PAX-8 in a mouse, you don't develop a uterus, fallopian tubes, but the ovaries are fine. So it's critical for the development of the mullerian system. Its, ex its expression is retained in the adult secretory cell, but not in the ciliated cells. And we've shown that up to 99% of all high-grade serous carcinomas retain expression of PAX-8. So there's something about PAX-8 that not only defines the cell as secretory, but is important for the identity of these cells, and it's maintained throughout the transformation process. Now, fortunately for us, the antibody that we use to look at the human samples works in the mouse. So you can see here a cross-section of the mouse fallopian tube next to the surface uh, epithelium of the ovary, and you see expression in the fallopian tube and not in the OSC. And this, you see the same mosaic pattern that you heard from uh, Dr. Kerman, where the secretory cells express PAX-8 and the ciliate cells do not. So with that background, my postdoc at the time, Ruth Parrott, decided maybe we should make a mouse model where we target PAX-8 expressing cells in the mouse ovary. And in order to do that, she took a PAX-8 RTTA mouse and crossed it to Ted O'Cree to make it essentially an animal that where you can induce expression of Cree only in PAX-8 expressing cells. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with Cree technology, here's a simple tutorial. Take your favorite gene, YFG, if you want to delete it in any, in any uh, animal model, you flank it with what we call LOXP sites, which don't alter the coding sequence of the gene, so it's sort of a silent introduction of these LOXP sites. You turn on the Cree recombinase that recognizes those LOXP sites and loops out the intervening sequences, your gene. And hence, your gene is gone and you've deleted your favorite gene. So that's what Ruth wanted to do. She wanted to delete relevant genes in PAX-8 expressing <laughs> cells. So she did that. We then crossed that mouse to a reporter animal where we could stain all tissues that were expressing PAX-8 Cree by beta-gal staining. So in the absence of presence of doxycycline, which turns on the Cree gene, we could see that the fallopian tube lights up pretty strongly in these animals. You see some expression in the uterus, and we'll get back to that. Here's a higher power, absence of presence of doxycycline. You see very strong expression in the fallopian tube. So that's great. So we had a, a PAX-8 Cree expressing cell. We knew that it was expressed in the right tissues, but I'm not a mouse modeler. 
So I had to team up with someone who actually knew what they were doing, and that was Danielle Danielescu, who came out of Tyler Jax's lab and had reported the first model of endometrioid type ovarian cancer about five, six years ago. And so with Daniela, we generated a mouse where we crossed BRCA1 or 2, P53 mutant or um, deleted, and plus or minus P10. So we had a triple allele uh, mouse, and we crossed it to our Pax8 uh, Cree mouse to ask what happens if you turn on Cree with this genotype in the fallopian tube, do you get tumors? And so what she found was, in fact, you do. Uh, we actually made these models bioluminescent, so she started tracing bioluminescence in these animals living in real time and started to notice that uh, early as about three months, she noted bilateral signals coming from the animal. We opened up one animal on one side and we saw cystic lesion. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with mouse anatomy, the mouse anatomy is very different than human anatomy. There are bicornuate uterus and the fallopian tube and ovary are encased in a bursa that doesn't exist in humans as well. And so this bursa was expanded and when we looked under the microscope, we found that it was full of what looked like tubal intraepithelial carcinoma. It looked like a stick lesion that hadn't been invaded, invasive yet. It just looked like uh, heaped up cytologically, a, a consistent stick lesion in the fallopian tube. Here's normal fallopian tube at low power. Here's normal fallopian tube at high power and in contrast with the stick lesion that we found in these animals. So then she said, okay, let's close up that animal and see what happens, and three weeks later, she found the mouse was distended abdomen, had tumor all over the peritoneum. You can see the remnants of the uterine horn here and the fallopian tube and ovary on this side here. And all this is tumor. When you looked in the microscope, this looked like high-grade carcinoma, high-grade serous carcinoma. And so you see low and high power here of that. And so we think that we've been able to um, model normal fallopian tube transitioning to a stick lesion and then to invasive carcinoma in this mouse model by specifically targeting the Pax8 expressing cell. Now back to the uterus. I told you that Pax8 is important for the development of the female reproductive system. It's expressed in the uterus. You knock out Pax8 in the mouse, you don't get a uterus. So what do we find in the uterus? In the uterus, we find hyperplasias. Pretty consistently, we found hyperplasias in all these animals. But we did not find invasive carcinomas, certainly not enough to account for what I'm going to show you in a moment. So we wanted to validate some of these mouse stick lesions. Uh, with uh, the experimental design that we had developed. So we knew, for instance, that they should express P53 because we introduced a P53 mutant into these animals, and so the cells expressed P53, and they expressed Pax8 as they should because we were driving this off a of Pax8 promoter, and they had increased proliferative capacity. This is what you see in the invasive component of the abdomen, and all this looked very much like what we see in the human uh, stick lesions. P53 positivity, more Mullerian lineage, uh, preserved an increased proliferation rate. These, these tumors also retain expression as you would expect of an epithelial marker. So this is looking at pan-keratin, where you see all the stick lesions in the fallopian tube and invasive tumor retaining expression of the epithelial markers. And when we looked at lesions that seem to be involving the ovary secondarily, we found expression of all the same markers, Pax8 positivity, WT1 positivity. So even when these tumors arise from the fallopian tube, they secondarily involve the ovary and the peritoneum and retain expression of these Mullerian markers. So then we started to ask the question, well, what happens? How can we prove this a little bit further? So we did uh, some uh, survival surgeries where we moved the uterus. So these asterisks uh, are an indication of the result, the remaining fat pad when we take out the bicornuate uterus in the mouse. And we looked and found that even when you take out the uterus in the mouse, you still saw tumor development. We still saw tumors emerging in the fallopian tube that it secondarily involved the ovary and the peritoneum. And you're looking at this on the microscope here, so ovarian involvement, retention of epithelial markers, Mullerian <coughs> markers, the same in the peritoneum. So even if you take out the uterus, if you do a hysterectomy, you still get tumors. More importantly, you look at the top uh, panel A here, if you do salpingectomy, so if you take out the fallopian tube now, and this is demonstrated here with the asterisks here, the intervening section was removed, we find no development of stick lesions, no transformation of the fallopian tube, and no ovarian involvement. So removing the salpings, removing the fallopian tube, the tissue that we're targeting, does not lead to carcinomas. And importantly, um, in all those cases where there was uterine hyperplasia, we did not see uh, invasive uterine carcinomas emerging in that setting as well. There was no peritoneal involvement. 
So we really think that these tumors are coming from the ovarian surface, uh, from the fallopian tube epithelium, and secondarily involving the ovary and the peritoneum. So, now, as I told you, this paper is still not in rejection, which means it's been under a few rounds of revision. And every time we go through revision, someone's asking us for something else. We thought it would be useful to, uh, to demonstrate that the tumor was behaving like the human tumor. And so we developed a, a serum, CA125, uh, ELISA, to, look, to work in the mouse. Uh, we tried the, all the human kits. None of them really cross-react. We had to develop our own mouse C125 serum assay, and we could show the tumor-bearing mice had higher levels of C125 in the periphery than control animals. And then one of the other reviewers asked us, well, how do you know it's really coming from the tumor? So we had to take tumor, make uh, short-term cultures of the tumors themselves, the tumor cells themselves, and show that they secrete into the condition media C125 compared to a non-transformed fallopian tube. So these tumors are not only looking like high-grade serous carcinomas of humans, but also expressed and elaborate C125. The other thing that we wanted to demonstrate was that were we able to recapitulate the genomic instability that is really the hallmark of this, of this disease. We know that copy number alterations are really what are driving development of this cancer, not recurrent somatic mutations. So initially we looked at the same uh, samples from the tumor transformed cells versus normal and we could show that there was DNA damage by measuring uh, the uh, appearance of phospho-H2AX, which you'll remember is that histone gets phosphorylated at sites of double-strand break. So it was definitely DNA damage occurring in these cells by simply altering two or three genes. We went and then looked at copy number alteration in a number of these tumors, and we're surprised to find that even with alterations of just one or two or three genes, we could show that there were gains and losses across the entire genome going from chromosome 1 to 22 where there were amplifications of C, MYC, and KRAS, which had been reported in the TCGA, which we did not manipulate, and deletion of other genes that had also been reported in the TCGA, including P16 and IMPP4B, et cetera. So with alterations at the specific cell, we could recapitulate the complexity at the copy number level that we see in human disease as well. So what's the summary for this is that the fallopian tube can be targeted in vivo. The targeting this, this cell with relevant genetic alterations in the murine, uh, murine um, fallopian tube results in pre-invasive stick lesions that then progress to invasive carcinomas. These tumors uh, not only look like high-grade serous tumors that we see in humans, but also retain expression of tumor markers like CA125. Um, they showed tremendous degree of genomic instability, and this model is now s further supported by a recent model that, uh, proposed by Marty Matsuk, Matsuk's group where he knocked out Dicer and P10 and got a fallopian tube phenotype as well. So I think together there's a, a mounting uh, evolution of model systems that would enable us to really look at the genetic contribution of the various elements described in the TCGA uh, in terms of how, how do they contribute to transformation, how can we use those to think about novel therapeutic opportunities. And that's all great, but it still doesn't tell us why this happens in the first place. So to do that, and we're going to hear a lot more about this from Malcolm Pike, I'm sure, but we took a, a simple observation. <coughs> we knew that the risk factors for ovarian cancer and protective factors for ovarian cancer are balanced, right? Long reproductive life is one that is described by early menarche and late menopause, so a long reproductive life cycle, and as you heard already, ovulation has been associated with a risk to developing these tumors, but why that is has never really been totally clear to us. And so I had a grad student in the lab who wanted to ask the question, is there a biochemical equivalent or impact of ovulation that we could address that might give us an insight as to why these lesions occur in the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube? Because if you think about it, it's at the interface of the ovary and the site of ovulation. That's where the fimbri is. We don't see these lesions in the rest of the fallopian tube. So why is that? So one of my colleagues who works in the in vitro fertilization clinic got these great pictures where you have the ovary here and the maturing follicle as it's rupturing. So he was able to catch these photos of a rupturing follicle where the egg gets extruded out uh, through the follicle and releases all this follicular fluid. So I thought, hey, first of all, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Second of all, you can collect this follicular fluid and she wondered whether the follicular fluid that bathes the oocyte might be genotoxic, because obviously it's required for the rupture through the surface of the ovary. Maybe there are things in the follicular fluid that are not so good. And so she, to address this question, she went back to one of our model systems, the ex vivo fallopian tube platform, and asked, well, if we expose normal fallopian tube cells to follicular fluid, do we see any evidence of DNA damage? 
And that's what she did. Again, here you're looking at H2X, which I already mentioned, just to give you a, a bit of a, a flavor for what, where H2X is located. It's a histone protein that's uh, obviously coding the DNA and chromatin. In the absence of ionizing radiation, sort of a sledgehammer form of DNA damage, or in the presence of ionizing radiation, you can see intranuclear foci of H2AX when there's DNA damage. And so she used follicular fluid and H2AX as a measure to see whether follicular fluid causes DNA damage. And she used our ex vivo culture system and found that by and large, different follicular fluids from different patients could cause varying degrees of DNA damage. So she was able to quantify this. So looking at 10 different follicular fluids in our ex vivo systems, you saw evolution of DNA damage to varying degrees. We thought maybe this would be a, a protein, so we heat inactivated the fluid and thought uh, we'd see loss of activity. I'd send her into the cold room for about a year to find out what that protein was. That would be cool too, but it didn't really work out that way because when we heat inactivate the follicular fluid, we didn't really see much of a change in the ability of the fluid to cause DNA damage. So then we wondered whether it might be reactive oxygen species, and so in order to address that question, we asked whether scavengers to ROS would have a, an impact on the DNA damage seen by these follicular fluids. And so N-acetylcysteine, which is a known scavenger, was used. And in the presence of N-acetylcysteine, we saw a reproducible decrease in DNA damage in these ex vivo culture systems. This was probably most uh, best <coughs> recapitulated here, where if you t treat these um, model systems, either a cell line or an ex vivo model system with FBS, you see very little DNA damage. You give them hydrogen peroxide, you see quite a bit of damage that can be quenched by <laughs> N-acetylcysteine or BHA, which is another scavenger. The combination is about the same. And then if you take one of the follicular fluids, you see comparable levels of DNA damage, again, quenched by the scavengers. So that would make you think, great, so ROS is delivering damage to these cells. And I think Bob asked me a few years ago in Miami, you know, is it ROS? And at the time, we, we weren't sure because ROS is very short-lived in the order of milliseconds. These are samples we got from the IVF clinic that had been frozen for years. And so it seemed unlikely that it would be ROS directly in the follicular fluid causing this damage. In fact, we got a, a machine to measure ROS. Uh, paid $8,000 for this machine. And my student tried to measure ROS in all the samples we got and got nothing. And we spent a few weeks trying to figure out if it was her that got nothing or there really was nothing in the, in the follicular fluid. In the end, there was very little ROS we could identify in the follicular fluid and suggests that something in the follicular fluid, which we still don't know what it is, is causing the cells to react in a manner that generates ROS because we're able to scavenge the effect. What that is, we're still in the process of trying to elucidate, and it's exciting work. Um, we know, for instance, that uh, a recent paper that was published out of a group in Israel showed that reactive oxygen species are indispensable for ovulation. So clearly ROS is there initially in the follicular fluid, but we don't think that it survives in the experiments that we're looking at to explain why we're seeing DNA damage in this setting. And so the ex vivo culture system maintains fidelity uh, to the fallopian tube epithelium in vivo, and so we use that system to study follicular fluid, which can deliver genotoxic stress to these cells. Reactive oxygen species are contributing but I think as you'll hear in a, in a little while from Malcolm Pike, uh, chemokines, cytokines, and hormones, which are probably playing a, a, an important role as well, are likely involved in this process, and it is yet to be determined how they are uh, doing so. So I think I will stop with that. I hope that the illustration of the model system we use in the lab give you a sense for where we're heading in terms of taking the knowledge we've gained, not only from the TCGA, but from all the pathogenesis work over the last five to 10 years, and trying to deploy them in a way that enables us to really get a better sense of how this disease evolves, but more importantly, how can we impact better patient care with, through early detection and novel therapeutics. And I'll just end by thanking the folks in my lab that do all this work. Um, this is a pathologist trick, Bob. I think you might appreciate it. Um, and the folks at the Dana-Farber that I collaborate with, as well as the Brigham, obviously Chris Crump, a uh, huge role in helping uh, develop all this and helping my, my own group uh, gain access to tissues and is just a great person to uh, bounce ideas off of. Danielle Danilescu, who was an invaluable collaborator in the mouse model, and a number of other investigators at other institutions that we've collaborated with over the years. Thank you. Ronnie, thanks so much for that beautiful talk. I really enjoyed it, and I'm, I'm sure all of you did too. Uh, we're running just slightly behind schedule. 
Um, but we do have a break coming up in approximately one half hour. Uh, so if you can please hold your questions until then, I think it would um, enable us to stay on time. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Yiming Shi. And uh, I've known Yiming for a while, but I just found out today that he is not only a professor of pathology, but also a professor of gynecology and obstetrics and oncology at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he runs his own lab as well, entitled the Molecular Genetics of Female Reproductive Cancer Lab. Um, for, at least for the pathologists in the audience, um, Yi Ming Shi is a household name. He's been uh, responsible either independently or in collaboration with Bob Kerman and the other uh, bright pathologists at Johns Hopkins for many of our recent, uh, many of the recent advances in our understanding of how different types of ovarian cancer develop. And so please give Yi Ming a very warm welcome. Yi Ming. So first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Levine and Dr. Soslov uh, for their kind invitation. It's my great pleasure to be here and uh, update you where we are in studying molecular alterations in sticks, the, pre the presumable precursor of high-grade serous carcinoma. I have nothing to disclose. And um, um, I think that most of the discussion I'm going to present to you is related to the project one of our ovarian cancer consortium program. And uh, for the project one, the overarching objective is very deceptively simple. We try to identify and characterize the precursor lesions of ovarian high-grade serous carcinoma. And the most specifically, we try to determine if the STIX is the real precursor lesion in most of the high-grade serous carcinoma. And uh, actually, as you expect, it turned out to be highly complicated. And, uh, but the result from this study will have a major impact and uh, translational implication in prevention, early diagnosis, and treatment of high-grade serous carcinoma. So this is my, uh, it, uh, the outline of my talk. So I will introduce the tubal origin of high-grade serous carcinoma, but I will thank Ronnie to give a, already a very good introduction of this part. So I will not reiterate this part anymore. Then I will show you the supporting evidence and uh, the challenges and the uh, possible solutions. So this is uh, the origin of ovarian high-grade serous carcinoma. And uh, so in the past, we think, OK, ovarian cancer must be coming from ovary. But when you look at the ovary most uh, detail, in detail fraction, you will find there's only one epithelial layers that can constitute so-called epithelial uh, component of ovary, which is OSC, ovarian surface epithelium, which is a very brand nondescript uh, uh, mesothelial cells, to be honest. And uh, we don't have really a good evidence to show that this OSC has any displeasure or any precursor lesion that we can relate uh, those lesions to high-grade serous carcinoma. So it's really tantalizing hypothesis that OSC is the precursor of ovarian cancer. So uh, back to many, many years ago that, well, actually it's about 14 years ago, that Dr. Peak in the Netherlands, he proposed that the t uh, fallopian tube is probably the precursor of this uh, high-grade serous carcinoma. So this is like a wake-up call for us to really revisit the fallopian tube uh, whether it's a precursor of the high-grade serous carcinoma. So I think Dr. Drapkin has already uh, discussed this part, and I will skip those. So the main question about the stick hypothesis is I just outlined here the four points. Number one, I think this is the most important and most intriguing for us. Whether stick is a precursor of metastasis, as Dr. Kerman just deliberated in the very beginning. And uh, this is not an easy task, and I will tell you why. The second thing is, if the stick is really precursor of high-grade serous carcinoma in most of them, then what's the molecular changes in the human stick? And what's the microenvironment predisposed to stick? It's just like Ronnie just uh, it, uh, deliberate in mouse model, and what how about in human? And uh, what's the clinical sig significance of sticks? For example, in the absence of the carcinoma, in the, those high-risk patients, you find sticks. What does that mean? So the project one basically focused on these two topics, the first two. 
the stick is a precursor of metastasis and the molecular changes. So I will take this opportunity to report to you uh, the recent progress uh, in our laboratory for these parts. So I think the first thing we want to make sure uh, is whether there's a clonal relationship between the stick and the associated high-grade serous carcinoma. So what we did is we select 29 pairs of high-grade serous carcinoma patients with very discrete sticks and uh, adjacent high-grade serous carcinoma. So we micro-dissect those tumor cells and uh, we perform the PV3 mutation sequence analysis. And what we found is 27 out of 29 pairs, they sh share the same identical P53 mutation, meaning that they are clonally related, but we still don't know whether sticks really represent the precursor of high-grade serious ca carcinomas. So in our study, we also find very interesting thing, but this is what everybody expects, which is intratumor heterogeneity in high-grade serious carcinoma and among the sticks. So for example, this is the fluorophane tube. We follow the C-frame uh, protocol that Dr. Crum has uh, introduced to us. So you can see this is the fimbriated end, and you can see the blue area is the high-grade serous carcinoma. It's blue because there's a lot of tumor cells, a lot of DNA, and stand the hematoxylin. So then um, on the, uh, in addition to the high-grade serous carcinoma, we can also detect several sticks around these uh, fimbriety ends. So we perform the immunohistochemistry using the P53, KIC7, and P16 to see what's their uh, relationship. So in this case, you can find that, for example, I just want to uh, draw your focus to this uh, square boxes. So for example, this is a sticks, you can see here. This is a fim fimbria end, and uh, this is a KI, which is uh, a lot of cell being positive, and P16, which is another marker for high-grade serious carcinoma, is also positive. But P53 is completely negative, meaning there is a uh, is a uh, deletion or nonsense mutation. And we might call dicetic stick show up it to be a uh, uh, common exome, exome seven is a heterozygous deletion. So when you move to uh, this area, look at this area. So we have the sticks on the top and we have the high grade serous carcinoma underneath. And uh, it's very interesting the, to notice that the stick here is still the same, it's uh, negative for PV3, but the high-grade serious, serious carcinoma is positive. But when you move to the other side of the fimbria, and you can find that the stick is negative, and uh, the high-grade serious carcinoma is negative. And we sequence that to show that there is a missense mutation of this high-grade serious carcinoma. But this high-grade serious carcinoma has a deletion. So this highlights intratumor heterogeneity. And uh, in these 29 pairs, we also find some of the cases harbor multiple sticks, and they have a different mutation type in terms of period three mutation pattern. And now we'll come back to this uh, later because this will uh, impact our interpretation of our results. And uh, the next question we want to address is, okay, we now know there's several high-grade serious carcinoma associated biomarkers, and how about those markers uh, in those sticks. So what we did is we identified those markers either from SAGE, digital karyotyping, RNA-seq, et cetera, to compare normal fallopian tube and high-grade serious carcinoma. Then we select those overexpression, those markers with overexpression in high-grade serious carcinoma. Then apply immunohistochemistry on the sticks because we basically we cannot do too much on those small sticks in RNA sequencing or other protein chemistry. So we have uh, several markers out outlined here. The topoisomerase 2, we find 100% high-grade serious, serious carcinoma and also 100% sticks. The same is true for the laminin C1, which is a very important gene in terms of to, uh, facilitating cell motility and the migration and the invasion. Second E1, rs one PV3, uh, fatty acid synthesis, missing for P16, and et cetera. And then we further to uh, address one question. If this is a biomarkers, whether they can also press a causal role in tumor formation. So we combine PV3 mutation, cycling E1 and rs one 
we can create non-transforming non epithelial cell become highly tumorigenic in new mice, as you can see here. But only one of them and PP3 cannot do the job. But if you combine the three genetic events together, RSF1, second E1, and the PP3 mutation, you can create a, a tumor. So this is another example of laminin C1 I just mentioned. So this just show you the laminin antibody specificity, which is very good uh, in our experience. And you can see this uh, one st stick. And uh, this is normal filing tube here. And uh, this is a PV3, which demarcate uh, very well where is the stick and where is normal filing tube. And the same is true for the KIC7. The sticks are just highly labeled with these uh, proliferated markers, but not in the normal filing tube. And look at laminin C1. It just very faithfully highlight where are the sticks. And uh, it not only can um, detect the PV3 positive sticks, which is no problem because routinely in the histopathology, we apply PV3 staining in uh, questionable cases. But what happened here is the laminin C1 can also highlight PV3 negative sticks, which can be easily recognized uh, if we apply the immunohistochemistry. So we think laminin C1 may be one of the best markers known so far for the stick in human. So for the second E1, we know this is a very important uh, amplified gene in a variety of cancer, in including high-grade serous carcinoma. So we applied uh, immunohistochemistry, also the uh, second E fish in, in sticks and high-grade serous carcinoma. And this we found, even in a stick, if they are really precursor lesion, then second E1 amplification uh, must be a very early event because we found that about 20% uh, of sticks has this uh, gain of the second E1 um, uh, locus. And um, so recently, there is a pa very nice paper across the street that reporting the LDH1 and cancer stem cells in this higher region of the uh, mouse ovary. And they argue that this is the precursor of high grade cell carcinoma in mouse. So LDH1, as you know, is one of the stem cell markers and uh, has been widely used in a variety of human cancer researches. So we, we purchased the same antibody as they use, and uh, with this uh, LDH1 isoform 1, and we apply to the stick and high grade serous carcinoma. And we expect that, okay, if a stick is a precursor lesion, you should be able to see more of this uh, stem cell-like cells in the sticks. But to our surprise, we find scattered or more diffuse LDH1 immune reactivity in normal human fallopian tube, but not in a stick. For example, this stick is completely negative. And as uh, I show you here, there's nothing that is being positive. So this is quite intriguing, and uh, there's many explanations to that. Maybe the LDH1 isoform 1 may not be important in human. Number two, maybe LDH1 is not a uh, stem cell marker in human. Number three, is human and mouse ovary are totally different. So if you are interested in this topic, we have, uh, we bring a poster and uh, we can discuss over there uh, in this afternoon or any breaks. So now I just present to you that the sticks and high grade serious carcinoma, they are very similar to each other in terms of coronality and uh, the markers expression. So how can we provide at least some of the evidence to show that stick is a really precursor. It's very difficult. And uh, there's uh, many evidence to that. One is uh, the histopathology evidence. And I show you one example. This is a 47 years old female. And this is one of my case I, I diagnosed. And uh, the patient has a, has a lyomyoma in the uterus and removed THBSO. And uh, there's no cancer associated with this patient. So you can look at the left tube of the, this patient and right tube. And uh, I just routinely, if there's nothing show up, I just uh, order PV3. And uh, to my surprise, you can see there's a PV3 positive cells, and uh, they are also uh, KI positive. And this is the right tube, do the same thing. So this is just a sticks arising from apparently no cancer uh, uh, scenario. So if we argue that stick is a metastasis of high grade serous carcinoma. It's hard to, uh, to explain this phenomenon. There's no cancer at all. 
So an another uh, case I have is this is a uh, cross section from the luminal portion of the fallopian tube. It's far away from the frame free ATN. We know frame, frame free ATN is enriched for the sticks and uh, where is the origin of high grade serous carcinoma. And uh, this patient has a stage 3C high grade serous carcinoma. But in the luminal portion, which is distant from the high grade serous carcinoma, you can see the very extensive stick here. And this is a PV3 staining. And this is a K, I'm sorry, this is a KI67 staining. So it's, it's hard to imagine how this high grade serous carcinoma can repopulate the normal fallopian tube in a distant site. And uh, the other evidence is uh, for this. You can focus on this uh, ana another uh, case I have. This a luminal portion of the fallopian tube. And you can see there's something more thickened in this uh, part of fallopian tube. So I want to draw your attention to this part. So this is the same parallel section, PV3 staining, P16, and KSD7. So this, they are all PV3 positive, but P16 is negative in that region. And the morphologically, they are very similar to those parts in P16 positive area. But KI is much lower. So we compare to the other portion and uh, the far right end. They, they show you different, um, like a mo uh, molecular tumor progression uh, pattern, meaning they're coming from, the, they are PV3 positive first, then they try to pick up P uh, proliferated activity and uh, they pick up P16 abnormality. So if this is coming from the high-grade serous carcinoma as a metastatic event, it's hard to uh, reason that why this part of high-grade serous carcinoma, which met metastasized to this fallopian tube, is negative and P16 negative. And there's another one showing we call it steel. So I think there's a, we, um, so there's a many nomenclatures involved in this uh, steak business. And we, and Dr. Crum and other group has created this uh, term called serious tubal epithelial lesions. It's a steel. It's not quite yet like stick because they did not pick up the proliferative activity. So for example, this is very abnormal. Even you are not pathologist, you can tell this compared to normal fallopian tube, they are so distinct. And they are PV3 positive. But look at KI, they are very, very low low KI, meaning they are not, uh, they are very quiescent and they are not proliferated at all. So if they are really metastasis, it's, how to, it's difficult to explain that this is part of high grade serous carcinoma. And uh, even we push further, we have the so-called PV3 signature that Crystal Crumb has nicely uh, coined this term. It's meaning morphologically normal, you cannot tell by, by eye from the pathologist, but they are PV3 positive, as you can see here, and uh, they're morphologically so blunt, and uh, they are KI totally negative. So, so it seems to us that there's uh, uh, different stages of tumor progression before the sticks. So this uh, make us wonder whether the sticks is really precursor, because we can find the pre-precursor of the stick before they become high-grade serious carcinoma. Okay, so then we are intrigued by this and what's the best evidence we have, the most easy way that we can do in a short period of time. So we have uh, two approaches. We do the telomere length fish. So we can measure the telomere length directly on the tissue. So we compare the sticks and the associated high-grade serous carcinoma. And you can see in this uh, uh, chart here, this is a normal fallopian tube and uh, this stick and the uh, high-grade serous carcinoma from the same patients. So you can follow this line. Most of the uh, sticks has a shorter telomere length as compared to normal fallopian tube. Then when they become high-grade serous carcinoma, they can go to different directions. They can become the same or even longer or shorter. And they just reflect the intratumor heterogeneity again. So what's the significance of the shorter telomere? So there are many reports showing that telomere length shortening actually is occur very frequently in uh, precursor lesion in a variety of human uh, near pressure. For example, you, in the bladder cancer, esophageal cancer, uterine service cancer, etc. In the precursor, usually most of them has a shorter telomere length as compared to their normal and uh, uh, the cancer counterparts. So this result, indicates that um, some of the sticks 
may likely represent the precursor of high-grade serious carcinoma. The other approach is we measure the central zone. Central zone, as you know, is uh, one of the marker for the genomic instability. So you have a more central zone amplification, meaning when you do the mitosis, they become triangular or tetraploid. So it creates underlying uh, uh, genomic instability. So this is a normal um, cell here. In the interface, you have only one uh, central zone, which is highlighted by gamma tubulin. And when cell divide, you have a two. So we measure the uh, gamma tubulin uh, and the alpha tubulin in, in the sticks, and we try to measure the, um, how many dots we can find per cells. And um, so this is what we found. So this is a normal fallopian tube epithelium, which we, we don't have this uh, so-called defined central zone amplification, meaning it's above certain level in the fallopian tube. So in a stick, you can see many of the uh, cases you start to see, observe this increased uh, central zone amplification, and uh, no surprise in high-grade serious carcinoma. So we try to correlate from the same patients, their fallopian tube, normal fallopian tube sticks and high-grade serious carcinoma. You can see there's a trend that compared to fallopian tube, there's more central zone amplification in the sticks. And uh, this uh, amplification I is even greater in uh, many of the high-grade serious carcinoma, meaning sticks represent like intermediate step during the tumor progression from the normal fallopian tube to high-grade serious carcinomas. And uh, this is the bar chart to show that there's a really increase in the central cell amplification in the sticks, but it's uh, even more greater to a greater extent in high-grade serious carcinoma. But for the each high-grade serious carcinoma and stick, there's a very good correlation be because they are from the same uh, patients. Now I just present to you that this look like that uh, sticks may represent the precursor of high-grade serious carcinoma, but are we there yet? Definitely, probably not. Uh, this is uh, because we still cannot solve this uh, conundrum. The stick is a precursor high or is a metastasis. For example, this is sticks in human fibrillatory end here, and this is invasive carcinoma. Actually, it's a stage three C. The cancer is everywhere. I just show uh, show you this uh, transition. So you never know this coming to become high grade serious carcinoma or high grade serious carcinoma just landed or. Um, imprint onto the surface of our pin tube and displace the normal for our pin tube and just try to mimic the in situ lesion. So why it is so challenging to identify pre precursor lesion in high grade serious carcinoma? I think it's the issues of time and space. Let me deliberate this for you. So we know that uh, colorectal adenomatous polyp is the precursor of colorectal cancer like a high-grade CIN is a precursor of, of a cervical cancer. Nobody will argue against that. But why we are so in a very muddy situation in the ovarian cancer field? And uh, this is because that when in the colorectal cancer, in the DCIS, in breast cancer, in high-grade C, in cervical cancer, we have a temporal fashion, we have a sequential biopsy and a clinical observation, how this poly become cancer, how this CIN become cervical cancer. But for high-grade serious carcinoma, we have only cross-section of the time. And uh, most of them is a, high, uh, is a stage 3C. So this is the time. How about space? So look at this uh, adenomatous poly from the colon. So if you have a cancer here, and you will assume that, of course, this uh, cancer coming from this background of this uh, polyp, there's no problem, right? But this is unfortunately not the case in high-grade serious carcinoma. So the previous example in breast cancer, cervical cancer, colorectal cancer, and many others, it, we have a precursor. Then we have a small lesion of the invasive carcinoma. That's all. So it's much easier for us to accept that this is a precursor of the invasive carcinoma. But look at the high-grade serious carcinoma. Most of the patients are stage 3, C, and 4. And uh, it's also complicated by the intratumor heterogeneity. So how can we know this is a precursor of this? There's no way to do this. So at the time of we detect the high-grade serious carcinoma, the tumor volume is maybe a billion times more than the precursor, like a stick, for example. And uh, again, this is uh, compounded by intratumor heterogeneity. So we. If we find it's the same, you cannot say they are the same. 
If it differs, you cannot say that it's not a precursor because it's an intratumor heterogeneity. We, did not, we are not able to sample every part of this uh, uh, huge um, debarked uh, high-grade serous carcinoma. So if the stick is a precursor of high-grade serous carcinoma, how can a stage 3C high-grade serous carcinoma coexist with a stick that developed from the distant past? So in the terms of molecular clock, so Bur, Dr. Vogelstein come out with this molecular clock based on the how many mutations you can find. So you can calculate how many, uh, how old is the tumor. So when you compare to the stick, if the stick is really precursor, as compared to this big high, uh, advanced stage uh, high-grade serous carcinoma, maybe there's millions of years they already passed in terms of molecular clock. How can they coexist to each other? So look at this. This is a time square, and uh, probably notice this guy, right? So this may be the precursor of human beings about two million years ago. How can they appear in the time square in the modern uh, society? So maybe you can say, well, this maybe is during the Halloween period, and this is just <laughs> maybe just a <laughs> it's a it's the dress, and this is still the uh, Homo sapiens. It's just human, so it's not really pre human precursor. You may argue that, okay, so this may be really human precursor. It lived in a, in a cave somewhere in Africa, uh, small islands. Somehow they got to New York City, maybe by taxi, and they just get there. But it's hard to believe this is true, <laughs> okay. And why, if this is true, why this uh, precursor is not captivated or do autopsy or study by modern uh, human beings? Okay. So the possible explanation is um, sticks, or many of the sticks associated with high-grade serous carcinoma are truly metastatic. They are not precursor. Number two, sticks is a precursor, and it remains evolutionarily dormant, and is not a destroyed meaning later extension by its invasive derivative high-grade serous carcinoma. So sticks and high-grade serous carcinoma coexist in the, in the uh, surgical specimens. Number three, there are multiple sticks theories. As we found, we reported in the past, the one gives rise to high-grade serous carcinoma may have been replaced by high-grade serous carcinoma. The coexisting sticks, as I show you in the examples, actually occur metachronously, and they may not be related to the high-grade serous carcinoma. So there are three possibilities. I don't know which one you prefer. Probably uh, all of them play uh, some role in, in this stick and high-grade serious carcinoma business. So how can we solve these questions? And uh, I think there's a great opportunity for this DOD consortium that allows to do uh, this uh, great uh, consortium effort, then we can pull the specimen together to look at more details in to answer these very important questions. So one of the approaches, one of the approaches I can imagine is to do the genome-wide analysis of high-grade serous carcinoma and the associated sticks using exome sequencing and somatic DNA copy number alterations. Actually, this is one of the aims of the project one. So, so how this concept is very straightforward. Actually, it's from the Vogel gram. It's like uh, in the colorectal cancer uh, tumor progression models. So if we find ADENY, the genetic alterations, here in the sticks, but in the high-grade serous carcinoma, we can find A, D, E, N, Y. In addition to that, we can find additional more uh, molecular genetic alterations, either it's a mutation or DNA copy number changes. Then we can more comfortable say that the stick is probably is a precursor of high-grade serous carcinoma. The second approach is it's very important to compare the genomic landscape of sticks associated with high-grade serous carcinoma and those without high-grade serous carcinoma in the prophylactic of retomine cases as in the Project 5. So if, for, um, okay, so in the prophylactic of retomine, you can find the sticks without cancer. So we still cannot say that those sticks are the precursor of high-grade serous carcinoma because the invasive carcinoma has not happened yet. You never know, know those sticks will really progress to invasive carcinoma but it's very important for them to be our reference to compare to those with high-grade serous carcinoma. And uh, if they show the similar things, 
we can more comfortable say that, okay, to support this idea that the stick is the precursor of high-grade serous carcinoma. The third approach is the multiple sticks um, theory. So currently, extant sticks represent a large number of genetically heterogeneous individuals with that variation providing the platform for further evolution, meaning high-grade serous carcinoma. So there's many dif different, different types of sticks. Maybe only one of them has the propensity and uh, can only progress to high-grade serous carcinoma. The rest are just evolutionarily dead ends. They cannot, do, cannot become invasive carcinoma, but they still show the sticks uh, features similar to those will de develop into high-grade serous carcinoma. So when it develops high-grade serous carcinoma, it destroys the ovary and the most of our pin tube, it still has some sticks associated with this high-grade serous carcinoma. So it's very important us to do the 3D mapping of this fallopian tube, especially in those uh, prophylactic operatomy without cancer, to see whether stick is um, what, what's the distribution. So what we can do is we can serialization only a few represented cases and we can reconstitute uh, where this uh, sticks distribution in the fibrillating end. I think this is a very basic, very um, time demanding, but I think this is the one of the solutions that we can look into this uh, problems, whether there's multiple sticks exist, and what, where are they, and what are they. So in the end, I just uh, reiterate uh, the, the purpose of project one is to determine the clonal relationship or tumor progression pathway from stick to high-grade serous carcinoma. And uh, we also want to evaluate the early molecular changes associated with uh, stick. <coughs> so this is a summary of the progress. So we present, I present to you the identical P53 mutation in both sticks and high-grade serous carcinoma in great majority of patients. And sticks express high-grade serous carcinoma uh, associated markers. And uh, in combination of P53, second E1, and RSF1 is tumorigenic. Then LDH1, which is very interesting, but we need to re revisit this. And as compared to current high-grade serous carcinoma, stick contain relatively shorter telomere and um, less frequent chromosome amplification, which is a soft support that stick is the precursor of high-grade serous carcinoma. So finally, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge persons who are involved in this project. Dr. Kuhn and uh, Ashley is the the key person involved in this project in, uh, in my labs. And uh, we have uh, collaborators from Dr. Kerman, Dr. Wang, uh, Kala, Dr. Meeker, and uh, we have the memorial collaborators, Rob Soslo and uh, Doug Levin. And uh, we also collaborate with uh, Vilita Prakash from Yale and uh, from Toronto, Patrick Shaw and Herman Chu, and uh, also other collaborators from the other countries. Thank you very much for your attention. Dear Ming, thanks so much for that lovely talk. Um, we're going to take a break now. Uh, let's reconvene at 11.15 for Dr. Pike's lecture. Um, I hope that the uh, lecturers who gave talks this morning will be available for questions outside. Thanks so much for your attention. See you at 11.15.
Probably yeah. be the connector. Mm -hmm. So this is the top right there. No, it's, it's my notes. That's my notes. Uh, so that's the talk. Yeah, oh, so tomorrow right. we can switch it over. I'll, I'll yeah. run up and I'll, um, yeah. okay. I'll just switch right there. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll just plug, uh, plug it in. It's going to be up. Okay. This is a. Uh, you can plug it in right here. Hey, Ed. Can you see that? it over, it'll come back to that screen and you can start. And then we'll come down and we'll undo everything. So I should close this? Um, nah, you can leave it open. Is if, if it goes to sleep, does it lock up? Uh, or you have to yeah.
Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that short break. Um, we'll be breaking for lunch in not too long, so if you're still hungry, uh, I think you'll be well taken care of. I have the pleasure of introducing you next to Dr. Malcolm Pike. He um, arrived at Memorial Sloan Kettering not too long ago, and uh, despite the fact that he's been here a relatively short time, he's already made a rather important impact on our understanding of the epidemiology of ovarian cancer. Uh, Malcolm is an attending epidemiologist, um, I believe originally from uh, Australia, uh, no, South Africa, right? Port Elizabeth, South, Af South Africa, if I'm not mistaken. He was educated in Scotland, and a lot of his work has in the past focused on the uh, risk modification of the use of oral contraceptives in the development of ovarian cancer. And so I now introduce Dr. Pike to you. Please give him a warm welcome. Well, he almost got it right. It's East London. It's at least 100 miles away from where he said. So that's pretty, same state. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, you'll notice I'm not an MD, I'm not a biologist, I'm a statistician, I'm a mathematical statistician who was told when I began to uh, do epidemiology with uh, Richard Dole, I said, but I don't know anything. He said, you can learn everything before lunch because it's all just common sense. <laughs> so all I'm going to talk about today is common sense. And you'll see that we know a lot about prevention of this disease, and there's some extraordinarily interesting possibilities that could now come about. Okay, so the first thing you've got to understand is uh, that I'm going to put my graphs up in a strange way. This is actually cancer of the colon, and the obvious thing is don't get old, right? Because <laughs> this is how much cancer you get per year, and if you're down here, you're safe. Well, <coughs> this, you can't really see what's going on here. Oh, yes, you can. You've just got to express this on a log scale. And then you can see you get this extraordinary straight line. And this is actually what occurs in all cancers, effectively, which are not hormone-dependent. So. I'm going to put all my figures up on this log-log scale because then I can see what's happening much, much easier. Ha! So this is the most important thing we know about cancer of the ovary is that, in fact, it goes up like crazy and then at menopause, that's menopause, it just bends over. So the difference is huge and anybody who has any common sense would know then that if you have menopause early, you'll be protected. If you have menopause late, it will be bad. You'll get much more cancer of the ovary, and that's exactly true, right? So just use your common sense on all these figures, and you'll get the answer right in 99% of the time. Okay, so next, what was the next thing we discovered? This was having babies, having babies is fabulous, well, for lots of reasons, <laughs> but for getting rid of cancer of the ovary, it's fantastic. If you have 15 babies, <laughs> you know, right. well, you don't want to have 15 babies, that's not a good idea. But if you even have two, the reduction in risk is 20% and it lasts forever. So you have these babies when you're t in your 20s, and you'll still be getting this protection when you're 75. It has nothing to do with precursor lesions, unless you think the precursor lesions were there for 50 years. It has to do with the normal biology of whatever gives rise to cancer of the ovary. So why am I putting these ridiculous figures up? Well, because I'm gonna show you that you can do this by technology without the woman even noticing it. Okay. So the person who really started the whole business of the epidemiology was Fatala when he was at WHO. And he wrote this letter to the Lancet, incessant ovulation, a factor in ovarian neoplasia. 
Now, you probably wouldn't be able to use words like this anymore because they're not quite politically correct. But in the same letter, he talks to the low risk of cancer the ovary in yellow people. This is 1971. Shows you how much politically correct we are better off now. And it's right. And yeah, it's an amazing letter. You ought to read it. Anyhow, his idea was that he noticed that, in fact, nuns got more cancer ovary and that there was some data in the literature from Ernie Winder and others that having babies was protective. So he didn't notice that, in fact, the curve bent over because no one drew the curves of the incidence at that time. But he also knew that there was a large amount of proliferation of the ovarian surface every time you ovulated to repair the surface. And at that stage, as you would have learned this morning or knew already, everybody thought that the ovarian surface gave rise to all ovarian cancers. I've read the literature on that, and that's completely amazing. If anybody had used their common sense, they would never have believed that. <laughs> right, okay. Now, what doesn't this hypothesis explain? Well, it doesn't explain why this curve doesn't stop. It's still going up at a much lower rate. Right? So something else must be going on. Not only that, if you looked at the rates of cancer ovary around the world, you found that, in fact, there was an 80% less cancer ovary in Japan in the 1960s and 70s. Now, remember, when you're doing these studies, you have to be very careful about studying the United States where we do hysterectomies and oophorectomies all the time, so actually working up what the rates are is actually quite difficult. Right. So that curve that I put up there, of course, was not a United States curve. That was a curve from Birmingham region in Britain, where there was virtually no hysterectomies in the 50s and 60s. So you could actually get the correct curve. But the Japanese rate couldn't be explained. Now, they had two years later. Their menarche was two years later. They had longer menstrual cycles, which mean they didn't ovulate quite as often every time in the year. And in fact, they had a half a baby. That's not as bad as this 10 and 15, but anyhow, half a baby more than we did. And that predicts, based on what we knew, that their rate should have been 40% lower. So something else is going on. And then, you know, you heard this morning and people keep on telling you the oral contraceptives prevent and therefore this is actually really evidence in favor of ovulation being the problem. Ha! It's evidence against ovulation being the problem, which I'll now show you. Here, what, did we, what happens if you use OCs for two years? You get an 11% reduction. What happened if you had two babies? Double this amount. And yet the proportion, the number of ovulations you've stopped is the same. So that in fact, the pill is not like having a baby. In fact, in many ways, it's not like having a baby. <laughs> right. Now, I want to point some other things out to you about the pill. The prevention, right, the predict, the protective effect lasts for at least 30 years after you stop. So it's something that you did in your 20s is still affecting things when you're 60, right? Now these reductions are much greater in younger women. And you'll see why that is in a minute. Okay, so this is all you need to explain everything. That's the same curve we had before. And here's a woman who takes the pill from age 30 to 35. The pill actually goes at that rate. You've stopped everything happening. And then it starts up again. But you never catch up. Now, if you were a mouse or a rat, you would catch up. Because mice and rats have menopause when they've had too much estrogen. Whereas humans just have menopause around 50, whatever the hell they're doing. 
twice. Now that's the comparison we're talking about, right? Twice as much effect of having a baby as having used the pill. And what was the next thing that really came up? Well, the next thing that came up was studying estrogen replacement therapy, menopausal estrogen therapy. And all the literature shows that in fact, that increases the risk of cancer of the ovary. Every single study ever done finds this. this is, none of these women are ovulating. This actually shows you that there's a direct effect of estrogen alone on whatever's giving rise to cancer of the ovary, right? Now there's the curve, let's just look at this curve. You know, if, if you extend, if you push this line out, the line doesn't look so steep and so on. So let's turn it into numbers. Here's the numbers. At age 40, this person who had menarche, she's an oliparous woman, she had menarche at 13, she's been ovulating for 27 years to absolutely no purpose, right? Five years later, she's ovulated for 32 years. So you would think that her rate of cancer would somehow be 32 divided by 27 or something like that. Well, it's not because that's a log-log curve and you're getting an enormous influence of time. And the time incidence is actually this number up here, four. So it's the fourth power of time. So in fact, what's really happening is you've got 32 there divided by the 27 raised to the power four, which is almost two, which says that in the five years from age 40 to 45, her risk of cancer ovary has doubled. So whenever you read anything saying that blocking ovulation can't possibly have these big effects. Oh, yes, it does. It has these big effects because of this power relationship with time. And this is true for cancer of the breast, cancer of the endometrium. This is a universal thing for cancer, that there are power relationships between the incidence and age. This means that if you could stop time for five years, you'd reduce your risk by 50%. And that's what pregnancy does. It stops time because that's what we observe for five births. It's the same thing. So let's try to understand what was going on. You could, like Fatala, say, well, they didn't ovulate. But I'm going to point out that other things could happen. First of all, what is happening so many, many years before? Well, you're stopping cell proliferation. So if we can identify the cell that matters, this will answer the trick. And this is all written up by Bruce Ames and other people, you know, 22 years ago, right? There were a whole series of papers, and we all believe this for cancer endometrium, where we know if you give a woman postmenopausal woman estrogen, she gets an enormous increase because she gets the endometrium suffers from enormous proliferation from the estrogen replacement therapy, and that you can completely block it with a progestin. Okay. So we've had lots of discussions of the cell of origin of ovarian cancer. I believe that it comes from the fallopian tube, and I'm not going to discuss it any further. I'm going to show you that actually we know a lot. I was totally surprised this morning. Nobody put this slide up. This is a, this is a fabulous pathologist. I, have no, I don't know him. His name is Donez, and he's in uh, Belgium. And he actually looked at cell proliferation in the fimbria by counting it per 10. He, could, he couldn't. There was no KI-67. He actually had to look for mitotic figures. He must have gone crazy, right? <laughs> but this is what he found was that this is three per 10,000 cells. <laughs> right? 
And this is the first week of the menstrual cycle. This is the second week. This is the third week. This is the fourth week. Oh my God, and look how many he counted. Like almost a hundred. I can't believe this study. Right. So Kay Park and Noah and I here just repeated this. We now have a lot of these samples here. And this is just the first set we pulled up. He has the proliferation in the fallopian tube fimbria in the follicular phase of the cycle, and he has the luteal phase. It's exactly what Donnez Don showed. So now we know why the pill works. Because the pill is the luteal phase of the cycle, instead of for two weeks a month, it's three. So the cells will proliferate only on the week of the pill when you're not taking it, right? Remember, the pill is 21 days out of 28. So for seven days, you're not on the pill. Now, you would think the ovary will take a long time to come back. Ha <laughs> ha. When you're on the pill, the ovary is actually quite busy. It just doesn't ovulate. There's lots of estrogen around. And you, what you've done is cut the amount of estrogen a woman is getting. You cut it in half from two weeks out of four to one week out of four. Okay. So here we have normal cycling, 14 days per 28 of no progesterone, and you have proliferation. When you're pregnant, there's no proliferation at all. You're pregnant, you have progesterone all the time. OCUs, seven days instead of the 14. That's about half as much proliferation as during a normal cycle and a lot more than when you're pregnant. And it also explains why the Japanese got so low cancer of the ovary. No, no, it might explain. It depends on whether the estradiol level determines the proliferation rate in the fallopian tube. Japanese had 25% lower estradiol during the follicular phase of the cycle. This is in the 70s. Does that matter? I don't know. Right. So let's see what this would mean. Here's the protective effect of hormonal contraception, right? You get this 28% reduction for five years and 50% reduction for 10 years. Now, I don't know about your daughters, but I have lots of daughters. They don't tell me about their sexual practices, thank God. And they all had menarche when they were 12 or 13, and the first one who had a baby was 32. So they had 20 years of ovulation, which some of which will have been blocked by the pill. I would guess 10 years is totally reasonable. Their risk of cancer ovary has been cut in half, right? Now, what if you take one of the new pills? A lot of people don't know this, but the pills you're going to be able to buy, that you can buy now, and that you certainly will be the only pills available soon, will not have 21 active pills and seven dummies they'll have 24 active pills and four dummies. Why is this? Because this is a much more effective pill at preventing pregnancy. Because if you forget a pill, it's somehow this is much better if you just keep on going a bit longer. This will change this number, I'll just state here, from 50% to 64% reduction in risk. And this re risk reduction will last forever, right? Now, this is another pill that is already on the market. It's the same pill as this, only you take it for 12 weeks out of 13 instead of three weeks out of four. That will reduce your risk by 70%. This is an enormous reduction in risk. And we showed in a paper a long time ago, Henderson and Ross and I, that in fact, this is exactly what is happening in American women, by the way. Now, here's something that's very interesting. Here's a Mirena. This is an IUD that has progestin in it inside the uterus. It's there all the time. 
So it's like this one, only even better. So you can already, ah, but as that can, is that, do we know that this prevents cancer the ovary? No. But we do know that the, that the concentration of norethisterone, which is the progestin in Mirena, is the same in the fallopian tube on a Mirena as it is if you take the pill. So it's quite likely to be working. And of course, the level of progestin in the uterus is enormous, a hundred times more than it ought to be. Right. Okay. So just to remind you, this is where we're aiming, right? We want to become hunter-gatherers, right? Hunter-gatherers ovulated maybe 160 times in their whole life. We ovulate 430 or so. And if you just put the stuff up, you look at the epidemiology now, we've now got 60 times as much cancer of the ovary that they did, right? This is a totally preventable disease. All you have to do is have menarche when you're 16 and have babies all the time and breastfeed them all the time. <laughs> This is sort of like when they say epidemiology never finds anything out, but they really mean they never find anything out that's useful. <laughs> right? Okay. Now, here's the problems. Why isn't the estrogen replacement therapy effect bigger? What's the level of estrogen if you're taking Premarin? Well, it turns out it's the same as the early follicular phase estrogen. It ought to be awful but it's not quite awful enough. Now, I don't know why that is. Right? Of course, this could be partly because you get a much greater, you get a great increase in sex hormone binding globulin, but I don't quite buy that. That's something we need to understand. But it's also part of the business is that, in fact, obese women do not get a lot of cancer of the ovary. Right? They get an increased risk, but it's not very big. And so, their levels of estrogen are not very high, despite the fact tell you that they have higher estrogen levels. It's not all that high. We need to know, and as part of the studies we're currently doing here at Memorial, we're looking at what the effect is on cell proliferation in the fallopian tube of obese postmenopausal women. Right. Now, this is a much more important question, is what progestin dose is required to block the effect of the estrogen? This is an enormously important problem. Why is that? Well, because progestins aren't good for the breast. And you want to have very, very low progestin for the breast without losing the protection against cancer of the ovary and endometrium. This is a hugely important problem. Okay. Okay. Same effects will be seen with endometrium, only they're much bigger. Right. That's because this bend over is associated with the fact that cell proliferation in the endometrium is well known to only be a, for unopposed estrogen. Right. And you can see here yeah, the effects are even bigger with the pill as it now is. Okay. Now here are the people I'm working with here, right, and what we're doing in studies. We're looking at premenopausal. Uh, BSOs, we're getting endometrial dating from, uh, we're getting dating on where they are in the menstrual cycle from the endometrium. We're looking at postmenopausal, the same thing for obesity effects. And we're also looking at these cortical inclusion cysts because they do proliferate. The paper that was referred to by Dr. Kerman from Lee is an extremely interesting paper. It's a bit muddled because th those authors didn't realize that there's a big difference between pre- and post-menopausal women. Everybody's in the same group together. But this is something that we just ought to know. It's fundamental biology. Now, when Dr. Draper put up a picture showing you low cell proliferation, huh? it's not low compared to what? There are millions and millions of cells, tens of millions. So even if 1% of them is proliferating, that's a lot of activity. And in fact, the activity in the fallopian tube is just like the activity in the breast. It's no difference. It's about 1 or 2%. Right? Now, 
I'm also doing work at USC where I used to work and the University of British Columbia. This is with David Huntsman and Jessica McAlpine at British Columbia, my colleagues Lee Pierce, Linda Roman and Deborah Haas at USC, where we're actually putting women on the pill for a week before they have their BSO to see whether this theory about what's really happening is actually true. Do you actually switch everything off when you're on the pill? And you, we, we saw from the results of Donaire's and our original results here, you only really have to put women on for about a week, it should switch everything off. And that study is now funded by NCI, and uh, we should have some answers pretty soon about that. Now, we've, we've all heard all about uh, Dr. Lee from Dr. Kerman this morning, so I won't spend it. So what's the real problem? We know how to prevent it. Just take the pill all the time. Ha, huh. there's a huge problem. And that's the problem. Right? Breast cancer is the problem. Instead of like proliferation when you've got unopposed estrogen here, you have most proliferation when progestin's around. You know, God in his ignorance didn't keep these things in sync, right? So now, the pill doesn't prevent this disease. In fact, it increases it a little bit. So what's gonna happen when, in fact, instead of giving you 21 active pills out of 28, you're giving me 84 pills out of 91? I have no idea. I tell my daughters, don't take the new pills, we don't know what they do. Now we're actually working at the University of Buffalo with Massa Welch up there, in fact in the mouse, to see what happens if you just keep on giving the pill, does everything get downregulated? Right, so I'm gonna quickly show you some of the problems and why this is, if you wanna prevent cancer ovary, you have to be interested in the breast, right? Okay. So this was my first attempt to sort this out. I said, just get me an oral contraceptive. That's the best out there. So I found an oral contraceptive that had 35 micrograms of ethanol estradiol, totally standard dose, but had either one milligram of norethisterone, which is the progesterone, or a 60% reduction. It must be better. It was worse. I, I, I thought, oh no, no, we've, this is a randomized trial. We've put the wrong pills in the wrong envelopes, right? This can't possibly be true, but it is true. What happens is as you reduce the progestin dose, you increase all the receptors. Now, should have we known that? Nobody knew it. Should have we known it? Absolutely, we should have known it. Because in the second half of the menstrual cycle, the receptor levels in the breast go down. We should have known this, right? But this is depressing, but I finally got over my depression and said, well, maybe if we keep the progestin dose the same but lower the estrogen dose, we'll fix it. And we have a trial going on at the moment which we'll know the answers in three months about that. But I told you at the beginning, I'm a statistician. For God's sake, where are the molecular biologists helping us? The pill really works. The effects could be huge. They will only be real, in my opinion, if in fact we solve the breast problem. So I'd like the people here who are the world's great experts on the ovary to spend some of their time trying to understand what's going on in the breast so they can try to think how we might actually fix this, which is the real problem about fix. You want to prevent cancer of the ovary? You have to work out how not to cause a problem in the breast. Thank you. Thanks so much, Malcolm. Uh, Entertaining for sure, full of information, even more so. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing you to yet another Malcolm. 
Uh, our next speaker is Malcolm Moore. And M Malcolm's interest, as far as I know, <coughs> in the past was focused uh, more specifically on hem hematologic malignancies uh, rather than solid tumors. And he's actually done a lot of work on identifying stem cells in uh, these liquid tumors. And he's just recently, within the past several years, begun to become interested in uh, stem cells in solid tumors, including ovarian cancer. And I'm sure he'll have a very interesting story to tell. Please welcome Dr. Malcolm Moore. Well, thank you. And uh, um, as I said, it's, uh, I was I was, it, as I was introduced, I um, came into ovarian cancer uh, from the back door, um, from the stem cell working my way up and uh, trying to uh, educate myself. So I apologize uh, if I display uh, uh, ignorance. Um, but sometimes when you approach a new field with no preconceived ideas, you can sometimes it's easier to, uh, to rethink. So. Uh, uh, I didn't have any problem accepting the idea that it was a fallopian tube cancer rather than an ovarian in origin. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, what I um, am going to tell you about is a very interesting um, situation which we came into by pure serendipity. And this is a, a, a new type of um, ovarian cancer stem cell. Um, before I, 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 when I say new type, um, Many people have been trying to identify ovarian cancer stem cells by uh, phenotypic sorting, for example, with CD44 and uh, MYD88, or even uh, other markers like CD133. And there's been a lot of debate about how reproducible this was and uh, how, um, um, uh, you know, how reliable they were, these uh, markers were. So um, we stumbled into this quite, um, uh, after giving up on trying to sort stem cells using the conventional markers, and we found a, a system presented itself that actually maintains ovarian cancer stem cells as stem cells, not differentiating cells, but every time the cell divided, it gave ovarian cancer stem cells. And it was rather like embryonic stem cell cultures in that uh, they were fairly homogeneous. We could make them differentiate uh, under other conditions, but the point we took advantage of the, uh, of the stemness state to really investigate in detail what it took to be an ovarian cancer stem cell. Now, um, in uh, the, um, for um, the disclosure purposes, um, this work uh, was done uh, by a graduate student, Serva Ertem, initially a graduate student in my lab, and later a postdoctoral fellow. He has now gone on to found uh, a company called Arion, Arion Pharmaceuticals based on the intellectual property uh, that uh, we obtained from the cancer stem cell study, and I'm chairman of that board. I don't get personal remuneration. I donate it to the Hope Funds, which is a a charitable foundation that supports postdoctoral fellows uh, studying um, uh, cancers uh, uh, with uh, uh, frequencies that are on the uh, you know less uh, less um, uh, perhaps um, supported cancers than breast and prostate, to choose two examples. And ovarian is a major area of support in that organisation. So the discovery uh, was uh, came. Uh, uh, as I said, serendipitously, uh, in a series of studies where we were trying to target telomerase as a, uh, 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 as a valuable therapeutic target. And we had uh, worked with Geron on their um, uh, telomerase inhibitor, which was called GRN163, and their lipidated version at that point. And uh, we had a mismatch control. And um, as you can see here, tumor ovarian uh, cancer cell lines, human, uh, were implanted intraperitoneally in uh, non-skid mice. And uh, by luciferase imaging, we could demonstrate here the tumor growing rapidly intraperitoneally and forming a bloody ascites. Um, and here we see the treatment with the inhibitor, slowing the tumor dramatically and reducing uh, the formation of bloody ascites. 
And in that sense, uh, um, certain uh, effic uh, efficacy, um, but the fellow, uh, the graduate student, um, had sampled the society's fluid and uh, asked me, he said, what are these um, sort of chains of cells here that seem to have a little halo around separating them from the leukocytes and red cells? And I said, well, uh, you know, one doesn't, I don't really know. Um, they, uh, the big cells are probably dividing, but um, we called them initially chains. And um, we could propagate them, and they seem to keep growing as chains. So we, uh, that's the beginning of these studies. The more typical aggregates, uh, which you're probably familiar with, are the uh, spheroid-like structures, which one uh, also finds in these societies as well. And um, here we see um, from the cell line of CAR3, um, a procedure that we developed for um, subcloning these and selecting suspension cells, cells that floated and did not adhere. And by taking spheroids and dissociating them, you could see that we ended up with these floating populations of chains of cells. And um, they, uh, different cell lines uh, produce them, uh, slightly different gross morphology and length, but uh, we, most of the ovarian cancer lines that we investigate have produced them. And we also found in the ascites of patients that um, these spheroids, when dissociated, would also uh, form chains of cells before reforming uh, their spheroid-like structures in vitro. And um, the, uh, we do a, a look at a time lapse here. Uh, these actually was, um, these are single cells that were initially put into culture, and this is a time lapse picking them up after they've uh, uh, undergone uh, three or four divisions, and it shows you how the chains elongate. Uh, just about every cell in the chain has the potential to divide, and they don't interact with each other. They seem to be repelled from other chains, but they can break up and release secondary uh, cells that will form chains as well. So um, with this, um, we investigated some features of these chains, these catena chains, and the first thing we showed was that they lacked the adherence junctions. Uh, E-cadherin was negative, but they strongly expressed tight junction, the ZO1 uh, tight junctions. So they were um, connected by, um, by the tight junctions, and. Um, uh, they also um, lack, uh, they also express vermentin, and um, the this is uh, a giantin is a Golgi marker here. So they had undergone a partial EMT. I'll come back to that point in a few moments. And under an electron microscope here, scanning EM, you can see uh, this chain here. These are individual cells, and they have these uh, microvilli which cross-connect, and they help to stabilize these structures. Um, and um, uh, there's a lot of interactions uh, with integrins. There's also surface blebbing, and um, there's also the release of exosomes from these cells. And there's a lot of work that we've done, I won't present today, on exosomes derived from ovarian cancer stem cells that we can detect in, for example, urine, um, serum, and so forth, that uh, we can identify by uh, various uh, markers. Uh, that may be very useful as a, um, a, a diagnostic and as an early, uh, po possibly an early diagnostic marker in uh, ovarian cancer. So um, morphologically, these chains of cells uh, are very undifferentiated, but the formal proof of what they were uh, required, um, first of all, recloning assays in vitro. So this shows that at least 60 to 70% of the cells in the chain could be serially recloned multiple times. This just shows out to three times. And the other um, crucial assay was transplanting them into immunodeficient mice, both NODSCID and NODSCID IL-2R gamma. And here we see uh, the uh, monolayers, um, when the cells were grown as monolayers, uh, it would require 20,000 cells to transplant rapidly and efficiently. Um, but um, with these uh, catena, as we call them, uh, with these dissociated catena single cells, 
we could actually transplant down to um, approximately three out of four cells. So these animals had subcutaneously four cells, individual cells planted, one, two, three, four. Three grew, and here we have one cell implanted IP forming the tumor. So basically our conclusion is these catena chains are composed of uh, ovarian cancer stem cells. Um, now, of course, uh, having shown that they, uh, they are stem-like, they can self-renew, which is the definition of a stem cell, basically, uh, we also had to formally show that they would reform the tumor when transplanted in, uh, in the mice. And this is the morphology uh, of the tumor of this particular cell line. And we have the somoma bodies, and we have the papillary um, uh, serous uh, um, uh, ovarian tumor morphology that uh, our pathologists uh, um, here, Dr. Soslow and others, uh, uh, said did indeed um, um, uh, represent what you would see clinically in a late stage serous ovarian uh, carcinoma. So um, when a stem cell divides, um, it can undergo uh, a symmetri a asymmetric division. Most of somatic stem cells undergo asymmetric uh, division in the adults. Uh, the symmetric division is required for expansion of the stem cell pool, and, and this is what we start seeing in malignant uh, stem cell expansion. They undergo at least some degree of symmetric stem cell division, this purple being the stem cell, blue being the more differentiated. But in recent years, the recognition that there is de-differentiation of uh, um, differentiated uh, cells uh, has really become um, a very important concept. Yamanaka, of course, uh, really revolutionized the field by showing that the introduction of three or four genes uh, could take a mature uh, skin cell and turn it into something very closely resembling an embryonic stem cell in its potential. Uh, so the um, question was, does this process occur naturally, and does it lead to a, uh, at least to some degree, to a partial reprogramming? And that's the underlying concept uh, that Bob Weinberg um, uh, also um, introduced when he believed that the process of epithelial mesenchymal transition was also a process that generated stem cells. And, and so um, here we see um, a stem cell in a stationary, we call it a stationary stem cell, in an epithelial tumor that has both adherence and tight junctions. It undergoes an EMT. These junctions break up, and basically two things happen. The cells can migrate as single cells now, and there is also an increase in stem cells as a result of that EMT process. And then they reach their metastatic site, and they undergo a reversal, a, a, a mesenchymal to epithelial transition, and the morphology in the metastatic site now is uh, something that would be uh, the more differentiated epithelial, but we still have stem cells in that, which have presumably become stationary at that point, and this can go backwards and forwards. Uh, why the uh, metastatic process has to reverse itself in the, or has to, the EMT has to reverse itself in the metastatic site is a point of conjecture. One view is that this uh, is a, a, a structure that um, has a, a greater ability to adapt to and survive in a, a, a more hostile environment of where it metastasizes to. Um, now, partial EMT is uh, becoming um, a, a concept that is in increasingly uh, being recognized as being crucial to the generation of more stem cells, and that a complete EMT, certainly in ovarian cancer, can lead to loss of stem cell features. Paclitaxel, for example, can induce a full EMT in ovarian cancer cells, and the cells adopt a mesenchymal morphology, but completely lose their tumorigenic, tumorigenic capacity when transplanted back into mice. And the most uh, 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 cancer producing were cells that had undergo, undergone a partial EMT and had lost e adherin, but had re retained their tight junctions. What I want to describe is this chain-like structure of stem cells that is also a partial EMT, 
but has moved from requiring attachment to the, um, an extracellular matrix and is now free-floating and repels attachment and has surrounding it a, uh, a, an extracellular glycocalyx. Now, um, many of the pathologists say to me, well, you know, we never see these uh, chain-like things in, in our normal pathology, and I just wanted to show you from uh, pathology journals uh, pictures of these chains in effusions of different types of cancer, uh, ranging from small cell carcinoma, ovarian cancer, lung carcinoma, hepatoblastoma. So these chain-like structures have been reported <coughs> but their significance has not been recognized, at least not in any literature that I've identified. And I should point out that these are all from effusions. This is not the Indian file uh, uh, breast cancer uh, morphology where the cells are Indian file embedded in extracellular matrix. These are floating, free-floating inocytes. Um, and one would not expect them to be uh, very frequent because the incidence of cancer stem cells in ovarian cancer is somewhere around 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 50,000. And that has been shown by transplantation at limiting dilution in mice. And one study that was done at Sloan Kettering in the 60s where autologous uh, ovarian cancer cells were limiting diluted transplanted back into the patient. Not something I think would be approved by your local IRB today, but um, the, the data suggested that it took somewhere up to uh, 100,000 cells to reproducibly produce tumor in a syngeneic human transplant in, uh, environment. So a cancer stem cell is a rare uh, is a rare beast in almost all cancers, um, melanoma perhaps being uh, the uh, outstanding example of where it is not a rare beast. So the other structure is the spheroid, the oncosphere, and here we see uh, from uh, the uh, studies that we've done, these uh, oncospheres were derived from single cells from catena. We dissociated the single cells from catena and under conditions where they were allowed to aggregate or proliferate even as single cells, they formed these large spheroids. And what happens is that the chains begin to, well, we've turned this roll up, but what happens is more that they transit from a division in this axis to a division uh, at an angle to this axis. In other words, symmetric division is replaced by asymmetric, and one of the asymmetric products is a differentiating cell which proliferates and then essentially forms the uh, spheroid structure which encloses the few remaining stem cells. So these are stem cell enriched but nowhere near as enriched as these fairly homogeneous stem cell chains. And um, by time lapse you can see another feature that over time these mature spheroids begin to extrude um, chains, new chains. Here. And this is from primary tumors from patients. Uh, this is from uh, cell line, uh, ovarian cancer cell lines. So um, this is um, a process that we can monitor here. For example, in vitro, again, from single cell, we start forming uh, these uh, spheroids that are initially, they're attached, and they reach a certain point, and they detach, and they also begin to release uh, chains of cells. And um, we can identify this um, also. And um, I can show you uh, some additional time lapse here. If you look closely at these uh, two spheroids, uh, both generated from single cells, GFP luciferase labeled. And you'll notice that in the centers here, the acinar empty spaces, there's actually the appearance of chains of cells transiently. And then they seem to move to the surface of the sphere and, and get released. Um, I, I don't know if this convinces you, but um, I have many other examples that show this is what's going on. So um, the, uh, the story is therefore that um, uh, we have a very dynamic relationship between these chains, these catena chains, and these spheroids. Um, and um, so um, 
Now I'd like to discuss a little further about our molecular characterization of these uh, uh, ovarian stem cells. The first thing is that they seem to lack the all, all of the markers that have been used diagnostically and therapeutically. Uh, that EPCAM, they show reduction in EPCAM, so these are the, uh, as we go through normal ovary, low malignant, uh, epithelial morphology, ovarian cancer, mesenchymal morphology, through to the uh, two different examples of Katina. So they lose uh, EPCAM. MUX16, CA125, they also lose. Uh, the mesothelin they lose, and WT1 they lose. And all four of these uh, have been used or are, in, are being used as uh, immunotherapeutic, uh, in er immunotherapeutic strategies in ovarian cancer, and of course diagnostic strategies in the case of MUX16. So we are faced with a situation where the ovarian cancer stem cell can exist in a form that does not express any of the conventional markers that we are using, and therefore would be uh, would escape from uh, uh, from targeting by uh, by these strategies. And whilst you may argue that this data is based on cell lines uh, mostly and uh, not on primary tumor, I could say that um, um, we have actually interrogated the uh, uh, the cancer genome atlas database uh, using a gene signature. We have identified characterizing these cancer stem cells as shown here. And we can identify about a third of those patients that have this gene signature expressed to some degree. So I think that this is definitely um, uh, uh, an observation that has application to a significant number of ovarian cancer patients right now. And the other thing is, is a more pragmatic point, that none of the markers that we have used or that have been used clinically are necessary to be a stem cell. So that point being that we can get stem cells, these Katina stem cells, that don't have these markers. And therefore, unless you come up with a marker that is a stemness marker that is required to be a stem cell, then that marker really need not have any relevance. It can be very uh, easily lost without impairing stem cell features. So um, that's just a, a, a point that I think needs to be emphasized. Now, um, in the... Um, when we uh, looked at um, the gene profile, the most highly expressed gene uh, was a gene called HAS2, hyaluronin synthase 2, responsible for the synthesis of hyaluronin, one of the three hyaluronin synthase genes. And we also observed highly expressed uh, the uh, PDGF um, uh, receptor, and also, not shown here, the PDGF itself. So there was an autocrine loop between expression of the receptor and the ligand in the case of PDGF, which drives, was able to drive proliferation of these stem cells. And also there's this uh, gene here, which is a hyaluronin proteoglycan link protein, responsible for um, uh, making a more extensive configuration, a more complex configuration of the extracellular hyaluronin matrix by involving linkage to other proteoglycans, and to collagens. Um, the HAS2 um, actually has a variant form. That there's an isoform of HAS2 that we've identified which lacks the first exon. This is the, um, uh, the normal HAS2, and it is a transmembrane structure, and uh, there are two regions where it is exposed on the surface and potentially targetable by antibodies. And here we see the loss in this, uh, what we've termed the Greenwich variant. So this variant form is now much more as a unique marker of ovarian cancer. If we identify the variant, and we've done this in hundreds and hundreds of uh, primary tumor samples, uh, this is a, 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 a marker uh, for ovarian cancer, and it may well be prove possible to develop this as a early detection assay using either um, a, an antibody detection of this region um, in the absence of this region or uh, a QRT-PCR strategy that could be applied uh, to various fluids um, uh, such as, for example, um, resulting from a pap smear. So HAS2 
is involved in the formation of an extracellular matrix. And here we see a very striking extracellular matrix surrounding these chains of cells. This is called a red cell exclusion assay. We just use packed red cells to outline the glycocalyx here. And we treat with hyaluronidase, and it will completely remove uh, the coating. And this is a um, um, scanning EM to show the coating on the chains, very extensive. And then after treatment with the enzyme, as you can see, it is removed, and red cells and everything else can come in close contact with the chain. Um, when we remove the coat, uh, the cells undergo a differentiation. They become mesenchymal and then epithelial. So uh, that's in the presence of serum. In the absence of serum, they clump up and die. So the coat is critical for maintaining them as stem cells. So therapeutically, intraperitoneal hy hyaluronidase would be a very effective treatment, but intraperitoneal administration of this enzyme uh, may have um, um, uh, problems, um, uh, other problems, because hyaluronin is a very important component of a protective covering of many different <coughs> normal tissues. Um, this is another view of the coat uh, at higher magnification, and you can see what a tight mesh it is. Um, and this mesh actually provides a relatively impenetrable barrier not just to cells, but also to molecules, to certain therapeutic agents, uh, and to antibodies. The cell uh, in the chain uh, can seek out beyond its glycocalyx by extending rapidly and transiently these extensive pseudopodia, which can loop back in. I think they're used to sense the outside environment. And they can also connect by these tunneling nanotubes, which allow the interchange of of protein and RNA species between, between the cells. So um, to put this together as a model, and um, uh, this is now uh, showing my bias that we start in the fallopian tube and that the process in the fallopian tube of sloughing off the, uh, the, the cells that are undergoing um, uh, malignant transformation onto the surface of the ovary and then the formation of the, uh, of the cysts showing the features of uh, the mullerian of the uh, 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 both secretory and ciliated cells as distinct from the ovarian surface epithelial cysts, we've already heard that this morning, uh, which I don't personally feel are playing much of a role in the subsequent uh, malignant transformation. And my um, adaptation or my, my evolution from what you've heard in the sessions earlier is that the process of rupture and release of malignant cells into the peritoneum involves the release of these uh, catena stem cells as single cells which will rapidly proliferate as stem cell chains or the extrusion of whole chains as we've already seen uh, from individual spheroids that they roll up and form spheroids that then extrude new uh, uh, chains of cells. And this whole process uh, uh, leads to the ascites and an extensive expansion of both differentiated and floating stem cell populations. And then these can attach to the peritoneal lining and form uh, a mental cake structures. So um, finally, I'd just uh, like to discuss uh, how we can um, utilize this uh, stem cell system to uh, identify uh, not just biomarkers, but monoclonal antibodies and therapeutics that might be of value in treatment. And here, one has to recognize that these uh, catena are essentially protected entities, that uh, they don't necessarily have an intrinsic uh, drug resistance. They have a resistance due to their uh, relatively impenetrable glycocalyx. So this is the typical um, uh, dose for uh, uh, killing in micromolars, a very effective killing dose for paclitaxel, terpotecan, topicide, fluorouracil here. And this is uh, the uh, dose for uh, killing catena. So we're talking about uh, ranges from 30 to 10,000 fold resistance. And since paclitaxel is the uh, is one of the main drugs used in treatment in ovarian cancer. This is a, uh, a very obvious uh, reason why there could be significant uh, resistance to 
2 therapy, or why resistance develops, because of the protective uh, uh, capacity of these floating stem cells. So we've, we've done two studies. One is that we remove the coat partially simply by collagenase treatment. If we remove the collagen, it turns out that the hyaluronin itself does not provide the pen impenetrable barrier, uh, but it's the collagen cross-linking that stiffens it. And, and as a result, if we treat with collagenase, we shrink down the uh, catena, uh, the uh, glycocalyx, as can be seen here, uh, and it is now um, uh, potentially much more uh, penetrable by uh, conventional chemotherapeutic agents. But if we do that and then wait a few days to let the coat reform, to let collagen resynthesize, then we treat with drug. So we can now compare the impact of collagen components on drug sensitivity. And um, this is um, uh, very striking, as you can see. This is uh, basically the, uh, the sensitivity to the drug on day one after they've been treated with uh, uh, collagenase. And this is on day six after they have uh, reformed their coat. And this is a range of, of, of various um, drugs and uh, targets of uh, various, uh, I won't go through them in, in detail, but as you can see, in many, many cases, there's a huge resistance uh, that the coat collagen provides that can be removed by treatment with collagenase. Finally, um, we have um, established um, a, by high throughput screening, um, the, um, the use of uh, uh, large compound libraries to screen four drugs that have two properties. One is ability to penetrate the coat, and secondly, to, when doing so, to then kill the stem cell, the cancer stem cell. And as a control, we use normal hematopoietic stem cells um, as, as a way of looking at least for, non, uh, for hemato lack of hematopoietic toxicity. And we have been successful in generating at least two lead compounds. And uh, these compounds, uh, this is uh, using the Alamar blue assay, and this is, where, this is how we do the titration of the compounds, and blue means killing, and purple means everybody's happy in terms of proliferating cells. And see, these were some of the compounds, and as you can see, for example, uh, this compound 11 here uh, is very toxic to hematopoietic cells. Compound 15 is very toxic to hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, other compounds are not at all toxic, whereas they have toxicity against catena. And uh, so these were selected, and uh, we then treated uh, the um, catena cells in vitro and transplanted them singly to mice and looked for how effectively they eliminated the tumor stem cell growth. And we found uh, that there were uh, uh, some compounds that were active in doing this down to one micromolar, 100% kill of tumor. And we were able then to take this into, uh, into the drug, uh, into the treatment of mice. This is now in vivo in mice with established tumor from ovarian cancer stem cells. This is using uh, the uh, leak compound, and this is paclitaxel in the same group of mice with the same tumor, which is not effective in eliminating uh, the tumor. So um, this, is, um, this is where we stand with our lead compound. Um, the other strategy is developing monoclonal antibodies, and we have done that initially with a collaboration of Dr. Old when he was alive and uh, the Ludwig Institute Laboratories here at Sloan Kettering. And um, we have um, identified a, a, a number of, um, uh, of uh, lead monoclonal antibodies, and three of them here, um, they are either effective uh, in targeting these catena, they'll mediate complement mediated killing, um, and they are active, two of them are active against more differentiated tumor as well as the, uh, as the catena, and one of them appears to be catena specific. So these antibodies we are going to explore now uh, for their uh, therapeutic efficacy um, in a complement mediated killing mode or ability to mediate uh, antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. 
And we're also looking at them, particularly the one that's Katina specific even, for uh, early diagnostic that could be applied in situations to serum uh, or to uh, uh, pap smears to see if we can identify uh, this Katina signature uh, and with a sensitivity that would provide, again, uh, a very early diagnosis. So, as I mentioned, this is, uh, this is work that uh, was done mostly uh, by, initiated by Server Ertem in my lab, and all of these uh, uh, fellows of my lab, the ones highlighted in red, participated uh, to varying degrees over the last three or four years in this work. Uh, we, of course, um, uh, must thank uh, our uh, colleagues uh, in at Sloan Kettering, um, uh, particularly Doug Levine and, uh, uh, and the others in the service who were so helpful in providing us with both primary tumor sample and fallopian uh, epithelial samples. And uh, um, I would also uh, thank the Hope Funds, uh, Star Foundation, the Guy Reichman Fund, Technical Development Fund of MSK, and as I mentioned, Arian Pharmaceuticals, which is now providing uh, support for developing these into at a stage when we can get into uh, clinical trials. Thank you very much. Really fascinating stuff. Um, Dr. Moore, I have a quick question for you. Um, I believe that one of Pat Shaw's uh, colleagues from UHN Toronto has done some work showing that patients who have um, high numbers of uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, particularly in BRCA associated ovarian cancers, have much lower levels or, or, or much smaller volume ascites than do patients who have intact BRCA1. So, have you looked at associations between BRCA status and the ability to form these catena? And have you looked at interactions between um, host immune cells and the ability to form catena? Um, those are very good points. We have certainly looked um, at, um, uh, um, we are looking at BRCA status. We, we have a, a large, um, thank you, thanks to everybody's collaboration, we have a large cryopreserved uh, bank of, of viable ovarian uh, um, ascites cells, and uh, uh, we have the clinical information that would allow us to uh, uh, discriminate who has BRCA and who has not. So we're working through those and addressing questions of tumor initiation, ability, and uh, uh, ascites, and the uh, formation of these structures. And that's a work in progress, but uh, anticipate within the next few months we should have an answer to it. Um, there was a second part of your host question. Immunity. Oh, yes, the host immunity, very, very important. Um, when we first did this, we transplanted into regular nod skid mice, and then we used the nod skid IL-2 R gamma, and we found about a 200-fold better engraftment in, in the nod skid IL-2 R gamma, indicating that there was a role for NK cell killing um, in, uh, in, these, uh, in these stem cells. But what is not clear is that the immune barrier presented by the glycocalyx does not provide an immune barrier once the cells attach to the, uh, to the uh, walls of the, or the mesothelial lining uh, of the peritoneum. And once they're there and vascularized, they would be uh, no longer protected by that kind of glycocalyx. So I think the, the, uh, the issue is, uh, is really seeing how um, a pure population of, of catena acutely would be resistant, but once they would start proliferating with some attachment, then that would definitely, that some of them would become sensitive, and that's, I think, what is happening. Thank you very, very much. So th that brings us to the end of this morning's session. And before you leave, I just have a few announcements for you. I would encourage all of you to please check in with the CME desk, which, which you found when you entered uh, the building this morning. They will provide the following information for you. Number one, you'll receive a map that will help you to find the lecture hall that we'll be using tomorrow. Number two, you'll be able to set up um, your ability to get CME credit for attending the course. 
And number three, they will provide you with information regarding how to access the lecture notes and PowerPoint presentations, in some cases, from today's lectures. Have a great lunch, and let's uh, reconvene at um, 1.30. Enjoy.
We're going to go ahead, go ahead and get started with the afternoon uh, session. Um, just a few announcements and reminders. If you didn't get your CME certificate or map for tomorrow, stop by the front desk. Um, tomorrow, um, the, I've been told that the preferred entrance for tomorrow is on the south side of 69th Street, which should be on your maps. Um, and again, if you want to see our facilities, some of our fellows will meet you outside uh, when this session is over. Um, and our next uh, speaker uh, is Noah Koff, who directs the Ovarian Cancer Screening and Prevention Program here and has participated in some of the seminal studies demonstrating that uh, risk-reducing cell pingo is actually uh, effective in saving lives and deaths from uh, breast and ovarian cancer. And today he's going to talk about inherited ovarian cancer. Thanks, Noah. Well, I want to uh, thank um, Doug and the other organizers for inviting me to give this session. Uh, as he mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about inherited ovarian cancer and current risk assessment and management uh, for this. Uh, quick disclosure, I have consulted and provide expert testimony for Pfizer. Why should we think about inherited ovarian cancer? Um, and I would argue the, they're fourfold. One is mutations are common in individuals with ovarian and fallopian tube cancer. Two, knowledge of mutation status clearly has impact for the family. Three, knowledge of mutation status may have impact for the patient. And lastly, study of, ovar uh, of inherited ovarian and fallopian tube cancer has been a window into understanding pelvic serous cancer in general. Um, of the 22,000 uh, cases of ovarian cancer that will be diagnosed in the United States this year, approximately 10% of those are going to be inherited. Of the inherited cancers, the vast majority are going to be caused by mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2. Small fraction will be caused by mismatch repair genes. And there are probably about 5% will be caused by um, other uh, single gene predispositions, many of which are in the homologous uh, recombination repair pathway. However, when we actually think about high-grade serous ovarian cancer, which is only about 70% of ovarian cancer diagnosis but accounts for 90% of the deaths, that 10% number is actually an underestimate. These are the three largest population-based series to date that have looked at the prevalence of BRCA mutations in, in women unselected for family history. And if you look across all of them, 16 to 17% of patients with high-grade serous ovarian cancer will actually segregate a detectable BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. And importantly, um, this is even true in the, the, both the PAL and the ALSUP series, even when they looked at individuals who had no first or second degree relative with either ovarian cancer or early onset breast cancer, almost 10% of women had a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. So I would argue it is something that we should consider in any patient with high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Um, and in fact, beginning in 2008, we actually began doing just that. And in, uh, starting in July 2008, with support from both the uh, gynecologic oncology service and the G1 medical oncology service, we began offering but not requiring clinical genetic assessment to any woman diagnosed with a new diagnosis of, uh, of high-grade epithelial ovarian cancer at Memorial. Um, this is data that we presented at ASCO two years ago, um, reviewing the first two, little over two years of the program. In that two years, we actually saw 292 patients with new diagnosis of serous ovarian cancer. And these were either patients which we did the primary surgery or after the primary surgery presented for um, their initial chemotherapy treatment with us. Of that, genetic counseling was mentioned in almost 60% of the records. And at the time of this presentation, of the 137 patients who had completed uh, genetic counseling appointments, 95% elected to, have, to undergo BRCA1 uh, and BRCA2 mutation sequencing. So it's that if patients get to genetics, they will actually take advantage of it. When we then looked at of the 130 patients who had tested for BRCA mutations, as I said, this was all comers um, and account, account for almost half of patients seen at Memorial during the time period, 30% had a deleterious BRCA mutation identified. Now granted, some of this was selected for a variety of different reasons. Some patients got to us because they had a family history and we are in New York City and have a high population of Eastern European Jews. So we did stratify the mutation, but the cohort by Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, and when we did that, 
39% of women who had a, at least a single Ashkenazi Jewish grandparent had a mutation, but importantly, 23% of patients with no Eastern European Jewish heritage had a mutation. Further, as you would expect, if there was a family history of breast or ovarian cancer, almost half of the patients we saw had a detectable mutation. But even in the patients who had no first or second degree relative with either ovarian cancer or breast cancer di diagnosed prior to age 50 in the family, 24% um, of patients with Eastern European Jewish heritage and 15% of patients without Eastern European Jewish heritage segregated a mutation. Again, arguing that I, you could make a strong argument that um, there's a substantial yield of genetic testing even in the absence of family history and high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Is this something which you can do? Um, is this something which payers or, or professional societies will support offering testing for individuals with high-grade serous ovarian cancer irrespective of family history? Until 2009, it wasn't clear. 2009, I was privileged to be part of the writing group of the American College of Obsessions and Gynecology Practice Bulletin on, on Inherited Breast and Ovarian Cancer, and in that, this was the first major professional society that indicated it was reasonable, if you look at the, f the bottom thing, to offer genetic testing to anyone with ovarian fallopian tube or primary peritoneal cancer of high-grade serous histology at any age. This was actually picked up the following uh, spring by the NCCN, who also mirrored the recommendations. And then in June of 2011, U.S. Medicare picked up this criteria, such that if you have a patient who has Medicare um, and has high-grade serous ovarian cancer, BRCA1 and BRCA2 sequencing is covered. Um, and so it is something which we actually can offer really to anyone with high-grade serous ovarian cancer in the U.S. Um, why is this important? Well, the first thing I'll argue is impact for family members, and this is where we have the most evidence of benefit. A woman born in 1961, so 52 today, and about the average age of a BRCA1-associated ovarian cancer has an average of 1.8 female siblings and an average of 1.1 female children. So you have almost three women who are first-degree relatives and have a 50% chance of, of sharing a predisposition if one is present. And people will say, well, my daughter's already doing mammography and she's not going to take out her ovaries. What should, will she do differently? Well, this is actually one of the first changes it is. Mammography for women with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations is not adequate. Um, this is actually two of the largest, uh, two of the earlier studies that looked at the sensitivity of mammographic screening. This was one that w um, the JCO report in 2002 was one that came from our group uh, about a decade ago, and we looked at women who presented with um, with known BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations and who were having regular mammography. And in our series, seven out of the 12 cancers presented as palpable masses in the interval between scheduled mammography. Similarly, in a study that came out of the Dutch group, um, there was four out of the, their nine cancers presented as palpable masses, suggesting that this was not adequate. This is actually a perfectly normal uh, breast uh, mammogram from a 41-year-old BRCA1 mutation carrier. This is the simultaneous breast MRI that shows her stage 1 breast cancer. These are the three largest studies to date that have looked at concomitant breast, uh, uh, would have looked at concomitant mammography and breast MRI. And the first thing I want to point out is across the board of these three largest studies, mammogram was only showed 36 to 40 percent sensitivity of cancers that were um, apparent at the time of this study. However, if you look at breast MRI, 70 to 80 percent sensitivity. Importantly, mammography and MRI are complementary technologies. Um, there are cancers which mammogram will pick up, which MR will not, and vice versa. Um, and the current recommendation of both the National Comprehensive Cancer Network and the American Cancer Society as of uh, 2009 and per continuing to the present, is that women with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations have both annual mammography and annual breast MRI starting no later than 30. Um, importantly, the combination of mammography and ultrasound is not equivalent to the combination of mammography and MRI. So this is one area which I would actually argue it will make a difference uh, for your patients. Does this result in a survival advantage? We don't actually have data on that as of yet. 
but before and for any screening test to result in a survival advantage, it must be associated with a stage shift, where we actually detect the cancers where they're earlier, hopefully more treatable, mo more likely to be curable. This is a study of 445 women who were followed by MRI and 830 women in a comparison group that were followed on one of uh, three studies um, being run <laughs> in Canada. Um, all documented BRCA mutations. These women were followed for a mean of 3.2 years. And in the women who had, were getting annual um, MRIs, 13.8% had, during the course of their follow-up, had DCIS or stage one breast cancers diagnosed versus only 7.2% of the mammography group. Now, if it was just that we were detecting preclinical disease earlier, but we would still be picking up at a mammography when it was DCS or stage one, we're not providing any benefit. So the question is, did we downstage from the higher stage breast cancers? When you looked at stage two to four disease, 6.6% of the women in this cohort had stage two to four versus only 1.9% in the MRI group. And if you look at the hazard ratio, there was a 70% reduction in the risk of being diagnosed with advanced stage breast cancer in the women undergoing MR, really suggesting a strong benefit. Um, what about from uh, ovarian and fallopian tube cancer risk reduction? Our group was actually published the first prospective study looking at the impact of risk-reducing salpingophorectomy on subsequent breast and gynecologic cancer risk in women with documented BRCA mutations. Uh, we followed 170 women, 98 who elected risk-reducing surgery, 72 which elected surveillance. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve, which is a proportion which were cancer-free. At five years, 94% of the women in the risk-reducing surgery group were cancer-free versus 69% of women in the surveillance group. This was a highly statistically significant reduction and was actually published in the lead article of the New England Journal of Medicine in May of 2002. Since that time, there have been a number of studies that have actually confirmed this result and have shown that we see reductions for the risk of gynecologic <coughs> cancer of anywhere from 70 to 96%, reductions of risk of breast cancer anywhere from 50 to 70 percent uh, for risk-reducing salpingophorectomy, uh, arguing that this is a highly protective procedure uh, for at least family members of individuals who have inherited ovarian cancer. Now, given this, we've made an argument that these are common, that we can do something to reduce the two major risk of the two major cancers, and if we didn't need to, just that it was the right thing to do, We'll also say that it's a thing that there is a fair body of liter literature that it is the medical legal thing to do. There's a fair body of literature that there is medical legal obligation to, re um, to warn uh, individuals um, that there may be a familial risk for their cancer. And in fact, there is case law on this, and these are two cases, both of which ruled that in the setting of an inherited predisposition, it, there is actually an obligation for the physician to notify at least the patient that their family members may be at risk for inherited cancer syndrome. Um, the initial um, result of the, the PAC decision, which was one that actually came out of Memorial, and actually uh, PAC was a colorectal surgeon here who was deceased when this case was brought. It was actually brought by the estate of a, it was brought by the daughter of a patient of his he had operated on for familial adenomatous polyposis. And the state, the Supreme Court of New Jersey ruled that the physician's estate had an obligation to inform the daughter that she may be at risk for familial adenomatous polyposis. How actually the fact that PAC did not actually have, the estate did not actually have to pay any damages is the daughter who was actually bringing suit actually had a colonoscopy at age 13. And so apparently someone did tell her and then the screening stopped such that there was evidence in the record that she actually was aware of the risk or her parents were aware of the risk and then the screening didn't continue. But given this, and if you're taking care of patients with an inherited cancer, there is actually an obligation to inform relatives. The American Society of Clinical Oncology has come out with a position statement which says that that duty should be satisfied by notifying the indiv your individual patient. You don't have to go out and notify their daughters, their siblings, their aunts and uncles. You have to notify the patient that, that these individuals could be at risk, and the, but the responsibility then transfers to them. 
Up until this point, I've been talking about BRCA1 and BRCA2 in the same breath. However, they are distinct, but related but distinct cancer susceptibility syndromes. Um, there are actually marked differences in the cancer phenotypes, particularly of the breast cancers, where only about 10 to 25 percent of BRCA1-associated breast cancers are estrogen receptor positive versus the vast majority of BRCA2-associated breast cancers. Similarly, there are substantial differences in the age penetrance of uh, the ovarian cancers, with them occurring about 10 years earlier. Um, in women with BRCA1 mutations, their average age in the early 50s. Importantly, BRCA2, there is no early, it is not an early onset disease. The average age of BRCA2 associated ovarian cancer is in the early 60s, which is likely no different than sporadic ovarian cancer. And so it's, it's one of these cancers that you don't use early age of onset as a, as a sentinel uh, criteria. When you actually look at gene expression profiles, both BRCA1 and BRCA2 have markedly different genetic expression profiles. Given this, are there different, should we be thinking about these differently for risk reduction? In order to try and do this back in 2008, our group put together our updated prospective data with um, a, the PROS consortium, which is a consortium that is centered out of University of Pennsylvania and uh, headed up by Tim Rebick. We were able to um, ascertain 881 BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation carriers who had ovaries in situ at the time that they um, received genetic test results, and we had prospective follow-up data on them. We actually looked at was there a difference in the risk reduction conferred by risk-reducing salpingophorectomy depending upon whether or not the mutation was in BRCA1 or BRCA2. When we looked at gynecologic cancer risk, you can see that gynecologic cancer risk appeared to be profoundly protective for both BRCA1 mutation carriers, and in this particular cohort, uh, it was completely protective against BRCA2-associated gynecologic cancers, although we clearly do know that people can actually get peritoneal cancer in the setting of a BRCA2 mutation, but it appeared to confer similar and profound risk reduction for gynecologic cancer. Where things became a little bit more interesting was as it related to breast cancer. Um, in this study, th we actually, w w this was the first study to date which was able to show specific, a specific risk reduction for BRCA2 mutation carriers, and risk reducing salpingophorectomy conferred a 72 percent reduction in the risk of BRCA2 associated breast cancer. However, despite this being the largest study to date, there was a suggestion, but it did not reach statistical significance of a reduction of BRCA1-associated breast cancer risk, but it only appeared to be about a 40 percent reduction and, as I said, did not reach statistical significance. In order to try and explore why that difference might, might be, we thought that this might have to do with the different phenotypes of the breast cancers. Um, no other hormonal intervention, which is pre the presumptive mechanism of uh, the, imp the mechanism of action of risk-reduced septicophorectomy for preventing breast cancer risk, has actually ever impacted the risk of ER-negative breast cancer. And that is true of tamoxifen, aromatase in inhibition, uh, ovarian ablation up to this point. So we were a little bit surprised that um, it that BRCA1 mutation carriers got such a benefit from risk-reducing surgery. Um, given that the majority of their cancers are ER negative. We were able to do an analysis, an exploratory analysis, where we were able to get the actual estrogen receptor status of 31 of the 34 invasive breast cancers that um, developed during follow-up. And when we looked at the women with ER positive disease, profound protection, almost 80 percent risk reduction against ER positive disease. But despite the hope that risk-reducing salpingophorectomy might protect against some of the ER-negative breast cancers and seen in BRCA1 mutation carriers, there was no suggestion of benefit against ER-negative disease, really suggesting that we have to come up with alternate methods for risk reduction for the ER-negative breast cancers that BRCA1 mutation carriers are predominantly at risk for. Now what about impact for the patient herself? Why, why would this be testing even if they didn't have relatives? There are now multiple studies, this is a, uh, about five, but there are now is close to a dozen studies in the literature that have shown that both BRCA1 and BRCA2 associated ovarian cancer has markedly improved survival compared to sporadic ovarian cancer. Um, and in fact, in the most recent study, which was the Chetrit study, 
for women with stage 3, 4 disease who were diagnosed at time of enrollment in the Chetrick study, which was the late 90s, their median survival approached seven and a half to eight years. Um, given that, and given that these women have an annual risk of breast cancer of anywhere from one and a half 1.8 to 3 percent. Over that eight years, they may have a 24 percent risk of breast cancer. I would argue you likely would need to do breast cancer screening for these women um, because they actually will have a prolonged uh, disease-free survival from their ovarian cancer. The other obvious reason is targeted treatment uh, of BRCA associated ovarian cancer. And in fact, this is my only slide on targeted treatment because there are three other talks in this conference that are actually going to address targeted treatment. But um, I encourage you to stay for some of those lectures because uh, I've heard some of them before and they're uh, astounding. Um, but moving on to what can inherited uh, cancers teach us about serous ovarian and fallopian tube cancer in general. Um, as I mentioned, multiple studies have said that uh, BRCA-associated ovarian cancer um, is associated with improved outcome compared to wild type. This was a study that we did about three years ago that was trying to get at a little bit of the etiology. We looked at all women who had stage three or four non-mucinous uh, high-grade ovarian cancer presented for initial therapy over a 10-year period memorial. Um, and these were patients who were in a convenient set. They happened to be had testing on one of two IRB-approved prospective follow-up studies. This is before we made a, a concerted effort to try and offer testing to everyone. Of the 808 pa patients diagnosed during the study period, 110 underwent testing. About one-third were BRCA positive. Whoops. And you can see the groups, for the most part, are well matched, with the possible exception that there was a higher proportion of stage four disease in the BRCA-associated ovarian cancers. Um, otherwise, actually quite well matched across um, outcomes. Confirming other prior reports, you saw markedly improved survival in the BRCA-associated cohort. Um, and in fact, despite um, Having some patients followed out as long as 10 years, our median survival for the BRCA positive was not reached at the time of the study publication. On univariate analysis, there were three particular findings that were associated with improved survival. One was having a BRCA mutation. Second was having a CA125 nadir of less than 20. Um, and the third was if you had platinum sensitive disease. One of the uh, putative mechanisms of improved survival of BRCA associated ovarian cancers, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are necessary for um, double strand DNA break via homologous recombination. Patients who have inherited ovarian cancer, fundamentally every cell in their tumor does not have an intact BRCA1 or BRCA2 and is therefore unable to repair double strand breaks uh, using this high fidelity pathway. How platinum-based chemotherapy works is by causing double-stranded DNA breaks. So it's actually causing a damage which the tumor cannot repair. So without knowing it, we've been giving a targeted therapy for the last 30 years for serous ovarian cancer that is inherited. However, when we looked at this, it turned out patients, when we did multivariate analysis, patients who had platinum-sensitive disease were associated with improved survival. But interestingly, BRCA mutation was, independ was an independent predictor of survival, of improved survival, independent of platinum sensitivity, suggests there may be differences in the underlying biology, which are also contributing to some of this improved outcome. Does the etiology of defects in homologous recombination matter? Well, this is actually courtesy of Doug Levine. This is data from the TCGA, which has actually looked at potential driver events in high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And actually, everything through here, which is almost half of high-grade serous ovarian cancer, has a driver event in which homologous rec the homologous recombination pathway is disrupted. Do those individuals necessary? will they all respond equally to platinum? Will they all potentially respond equally to targeted therapies? Um, and this is something which is not at all clear. Interestingly, about anywhere from 10 to 25 percent of high-grade serous ovarian cancer has methylation and silencing of the BRCA1 promoter. But from data from the TCGA, if you looked at the patients who had inherited ovarian cancer, improved survival. The patients with methylated BRCA1, no different from wild type. So perhaps the etiology does actually matter. 
Similarly, does it matter if you're dealing with BRCA1 or BRCA2? This is work that one of our fellows did a couple of years ago, and what we actually did was now looked at 190 women who had undergone BRCA mutation testing in the setting of high-grade serous ovarian cancer, which was uh, seen for initial therapy at Memorial. This particular cohort was limited to women with high-grade serous ovarian cancer as opposed to any subtype, which was the prior study was, and importantly, they had to have genetic testing done within two years of diagnosis. The reason for that is we wanted to exclude out patients who actually were tested because of long survival. And when we did this, interestingly, curves broke out in three. This is the BRCA wild type, BRCA1, BRCA2, each with their own distinct survival curve. Similar analysis was done in the TCGA cohort, again showing the same phenomenon, really suggesting that there may be differences in biology even between BRCA1 mutated ovarian cancers and BRCA2 associated ovarian cancers. Lastly, very quickly, what is the management of women with BRCA mutation taught, taught us about risk reduction options? Can we do better than risk reducing salpingophorectomy? As, P as a number of the speakers have alluded to before, we've known prior to 2002 in the advent of risk-reducing surgery, we knew risk factors which caused increasing uh, number of ovulatory cycles. Protective factors were things which could decrease the number of ovulatory cycles or estrogen exposure. And we had the, S the incessant ovulation hypothesis which suggested that um, more ovulations, more risk of ovarian cancer, and perhaps with, with more estrogen, unopposed estrogen exposure. With the advent of risk-reducing surgeries and an exponential increase in it um, following the, the publication in 2002 of ours and Tim Rebick's reports, we began seeing um, invasive serous carcinomas of the fallopian tubes as well as uh, serous tubal intraepithelial carcinomas. And of patients who have risk-reducing <coughs> surgery, um, anywhere from 2 to 5 percent of women who have risk-reducing surgery will actually have an occult in occult cancer diagnosed at time of risk-reducing surgery. But interestingly, as many as 60% of those lesions will be in the fallopian tube only. Given that, it's uh, led to the seminal research that was done by Pieck, Crum, and others that has been described today that has really suggested that there is, um, that the fallopian tube may, is a site of origin for at least a substantial fraction, if not all, high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Now, given that, um, and you've seen these two graphs before, if the fallopian tube is the site of origin for high-grade serous ovarian cancer, is it reasonable to consider, let's just remove the fallopian tube? And I think there are a couple of caveats which we have to have before we do that. Importantly, we don't know what is the latency time from the initial neoplastic event in the fallopian tube epithelium, even if it's responsible for all high-grade serous ovarian cancer, until the um, development of invasive cancer. And then we also don't know where all of that pathogenesis occurs. Some of that may occur in the fallopian tube, some may occur in the ovaries. We've always assumed the transition from normal cell to invasive, ne to invasive cancer cell was a very rapid transition because we've never been able to find a precursor lesion in the ovaries. However, as has been discussed by, uh, by a number of speakers this morning, if in fact ovarian cancer I or f is, in f is fallopian tube cancer, we may not have found the precursor just because we've been looking in the wrong place. And if that's the case, is it possible fallopian tube cancer behaves like every other epithelial malignancy, including breast, lung, colon, skin, cervical, in which the malignant transformation doesn't occur over months, but rather years to decades? And if that's the case, the horse may actually already be out of the barn um, by the time we take out the fallopian tubes. Additionally, we may not even be able to identify it because some of this is even happening at a molecular level. For example, the, the P53 signature it doesn't have a histologic, uh, it's not something you can identify on H and E. It's only something which you can look if you use immunohistochemistry. So you have to look as a window into what's going on molecularly. Um, and so we, since we don't know the latency, I think we have to be cautious. Secondly, as uh, Dr. Kerman and others have said this morning, we don't know what proportions of pelvic cancers are explained by the fallopian tube hypothesis. 
And lastly and importantly, deferring oophorectomy will, will negate the benefit conferred by risk-reducing septic oophorectomy against breast cancer. Still the primary driver of mortality in women with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations is their risk of breast cancer. And if we actually do salpingectomy um, without actually addressing the, the breast cancer risk, we may be doing the patients a disservice. Given this, I think that until we study this more, probably salpingectomy doesn't have a role in women with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations outside of a research context. That being said, Doug Levine is actually the PI of a proposal that is actually being, uh, that is going through the gynecologic oncology group right now, specifically designed to look at a number of these important issues in risk reducing salpingectomy. Uh, and I think it's something we should strongly support uh, participation in this and other similar protocols. Where do we go from here? Can we better identify individuals with inherited ovarian or fallopian tube cancer who may benefit from treatment with, spe with specific traditional or targeted therapies? That's going to be something which I think some of the other uh, speakers today will touch on. Can we identify patients with somatic BRCA dysfunction who may benefit from therapies useful in inherited pelvic serous cancer? And lastly, we'll advance in our basic understanding of the molecular pathogenesis and progression of hereditary ovarian fallopian tube cancer allow us to eliminate the burden of serous cancer entirely. I want to thank you for your attention. I'd like to acknowledge some of the funders of my work, um, and I look forward to your questions. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kala Visvanathan, who's Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Oncology at Johns Hopkins, Director of the Clinical Cancer Genetics and Prevention Services at the uh, Sidney Kimmel Cancer Center. And Kala will be talking uh, about a, lot, a little bit about, and maybe more about, Project 5, which I had mentioned in my overview, looking at the epidemiologic risk factors and possible biomarkers that correlate with the presence of uh, uh, serous tubal intraepithelial carcinomas. Carla? So I'd like to thank Doug and Wab and uh, just for being here today. I, I apologize. I think on the program, I was going to talk to you about non cancer outcomes in prophylactic oophorectomy, which would be a nice follow from uh, Noah's talk, but um, which I'm very interested in and do have a lot of data on, but I think more appropriate to the, the total picture today is to actually focus on our DOD project, and it's, um, as Bob said, it's uh, project five of the consortium. I will say up front that um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is really giving context to the project and giving you an idea of how we've gone and probably posing or identifying a lot of the challenges we have trying to translate a lot of this great work that you've heard about today uh, into the clinic and into the population, and probably not as many answers, but hopefully in a year's time, we'll come back with some very strong answers regarding this. Okay. So the three aims of Project 5, particularly the uh, first two, as I think Bob um, alluded to earlier this morning, but just to remind you because it's been a long day was we're interested in determining the prevalence, molecular factors, genetic factors, as well as an exposure profile of putative per precursor lesions in the fallopian tubes and the ovaries from women at high risk for ovarian cancer. We chose the high risk population to look at this first because given that they're at high risk for high grade serous ovarian cancer, we thought that if we couldn't define it in this population, it would be an even greater task to look at this in the general population. And then we were interested in looking to see what biomarkers were associated with these precursor lesions. And I think most importantly, a lot of uh, Dr. Pike's talk was, are they, are, these le are they modifiable by preventive factors like the oral contraceptive pills or anti-inflammatory agents or other medications that are now being looked at uh, with regard to ovarian cancer prevention like metformin? And then lastly, uh, perhaps more exploratory to, to look and see how these biomarkers are associated with longer term outcomes. And I'll explain why that's more exploratory. So I'm not going to go back to this. You've heard this through the day, but it, it was consistent with the, the 
the entire consortium theme about how we saw the development of uh, potential development of high-grade serous carcinoma and therefore understanding what happens in terms of associations between lifestyle factors and these pre potential precursor lesions as well as these molecular markers were very important. So let me, um, I thought it was worth to take a step back and see what we do know and, and where this project fits in. And I think the first thing to say, there actually is very limited data both in the high risk population and the general population. And I think that in itself speaks to the challenges in trying to obtain this data. I think a lot of work, we've done some work as part of the consortium and as at Hopkins and then a lot of work has come out of Harvard and, and uh, Dr. Crum's lab and collaborators like uh, Dr. Drapkin. And as well, and the third group that has been very active has been uh, Patricia Shaw's lab in, and Steve Narod at, uh, in Toronto. But basically there's two large studies, one that was done in 2010 that really looked at sticks and P53 signatures in cancer-free high-risk women. This was a huge study, 173 women, and they, quote, they noted a prevalence of about 25%. Um, a study prior to that, uh, Fokens et al. found P53 signatures in about 35%, and there's been this range of about between 24 and 38% in cancer-free high-risk women. And then a more recent study, which I will describe a little more about, talked about um, Mayor et al. coming out of uh, Harvard, talked about P53 signatures in about 71%. And my understanding at a recent pathology meeting, um, they talked uh, about sticks in that same population being a lot lower. So the first thing to say is that there's been many different terminologies used to describe different sometimes the same precursor lesions and sometimes different ones. So sticks, there's, which is quite different to P53 signatures, and then stills or tilts, which we think is somewhere in between. Then there's also the CICs, the cortical inclusion cysts, which Dr. Kerman spoke a lot about today, um, and estimates of those in cancer-free high-risk women is anywhere between 39 and 70 percent. I think more is being done on on the cortical inclusion cysts in the epidemiological literature over a long time in terms of exposures and, and so on, but not as much at the molecular or genetic level. And then lastly, there have been a variety of studies that have looked at occult carcinomas, and the ranges there have been anywhere between 5 and 17 percent. There's also the ovarian surface epithelium, and I mentioned stills. So as you can see, there's, there's huge ranges of of what are, if these are precursor lesions, and at what is the prevalence of them. So that was the first sort of challenge that we encountered. And then the second part was, before we could embark on a large study like this to, to define these characteristics in, in the uh, epidemiological or the, in the, in the populate, at a population level, we really needed to, to identify or define a reproducible criteria. I know, uh, I think the first person to publish on this is Dr. Crum. They did a study where they actually showed the, the challenges of trying to get a reproducible criteria. So we embarked on this as a group in the consortium as a whole, and we really used an iterative approach to get to sort of this, to the stage that we're at now. And this involved both uh, incorporating morphology as well as IHC together and really defining, better defining um, each of the different IHC markers. And I, I didn't put it all up here because it's already been published, but we really went through three to four rounds of the pathologist getting slides and being blinded and repeating things. And, and uh, to the surprise of all of us, I think, our initial rounds, the agreement between pathologists and between the same pathologists was poor. And this isn't to say that these pathologists are not experts they were in their fields, but it's just to show you the challenge of trying to define and develop reproducible criteria that could then be used on a large set of samples. And I think the reason I highlight that is that when you go back and look at the literature, you need to bear that in mind when you look at the prevalence of these lesions as well. So uh, this is a, a complicated diagram, and you can, it's definitely been published and looked at, but it, just to show you, in the, at the end of this, we came up with a, uh, a flow chart that really incorporated both morphology, but in a, probably in, in a slightly more simplistic way, and 
um, IHC markers, particularly P53 and KI67, to develop what we thought was a, a reasonably ro robust criteria to begin with, with the idea that as part of the consortium, we would then supplement this with additional markers. Um, and uh, just to highlight, at the time, we, we started off with somewhere of a, a degree of an agreement of about 0.4, uh, if people are familiar with a kappa, uh, one is sort of where you'd love to be, but we then brought this up to about 0.73. So it's reasonably reproducible. Um, but what we noticed as we were going through is that for different aspects of the reproducibility criteria, we saw different levels of reproducibility. For example, when, when the, we looked at the P53 signature, it was not that reproducible. And again, when you looked at just morphology alone, um, and it was really this combination of morphology and these signatures. And I can tell you in the iterative process, this involved um, pathologists from Hopkins, from uh, Toronto, Yale, and Sloan Kettering, it was really a case initially of sitting down and working through definitions that we thought were reasonable, then revisiting them after each round to fine tune how we might actually come up with a criteria. And this was only for sticks itself. We really didn't move further onto stills and, on, and so on. We thought that would be part of the consortium itself. I think the promising news was that after that was done, that criteria was then put on a website and it was then validated by testing it in three independent faculty not involved in this group and three fellows. Um, they, they took a training set and then they re uh, looked at a set of slides and they also got a reasonable degree of agreement. So at least we had a baseline where to start in terms of uh, going forward to develop a reproducible criteria. The second challenge that we face is tissue sampling. If you think about it, in most cases um, when we deal with tissue in the clinical setting, the entire tissues are not sampled. And we already heard today about uh, Dr. Crum initiating the CFIM protocol. But then the second part of that is how much of the tissue needs to be sampled to get a reasonable estimate. Of, uh, of prevalence, or, or, or and what is the sticks, and what are the other early lesions. And I think, um, you know, it, we, we, there's a lot of interest now in the etiological heterogeneity of tumor specimens, but I would like to say that we have the same issues even when we're thinking about preventive cases. And I know I come from doing a fair bit of work in, in the breast cancer field, and when we think about precursor lesions there, like atypical hyperplasia or GCIS, uh, we generally get the slide that we can. We don't really think about getting many slides because it's usually a biopsy and there's not much available. And so we have the same issues here when we think about how to identify the sticks, how to identify the location of the sticks, um, and, and how best to sample the entire section. Although there's a lot of blocks and a lot of tissues, we still don't know the best way. And I'd like to point out a, a study that was done by Mera et al, where they did do three level sampling, and I think this is the first published study that I've seen like this. Most of the other studies that the, the um, estimates that I quoted to you were done by sampling a block, but sampling the top slides of a block, so not the entire block. And they really went down and did three level sampling at, so at three points of the block, so it need, they then of course had to use up a lot of the block, um, but they did it in a small number of BRCA positives and controls, and they found about 71% of BRCA positives had P53 signatures. Now, I'm not suggesting P53 signatures are the, are the same as stick, but they had previously reported a prevalence of about 38% of the P53 signature, and so now they were seeing more. So this just suggests to me that clearly there are things that happen between the blocks that are important. And they also commented that um, in 49% of the cases, they did not see anything at the top of the block, it was seen in the middle of the block. So again, they were only doing three levels, which was still extensive compared to whatever else has been done, but not through it. Um, and they also commented on the fact that they saw these signatures, more than one signature was in a block. Um, and the reason I bring this up is not that I think that we can sample every block for every patient, but we do need to become clever or thoughtful about how we do this sampling, and we need to be able to get a handle on, on what the true prevalence of all these different lesions that we are 
writing about and looking at so that we can get so that we can determine the clinical importance of them and particularly as we think about going into salpingectomies or going into even using the pill we, we really need to understand um, more about the lesions in the clinical setting this is uh, from a paper by Dr. Crum just and I think other people have already talked about it, but just the fact that I think we've gone one step by doing the CFIM protocol, which is now more widespread. But again, it's not in every hospital that does this protocol. So I think it's in all the major academic centers and some of the smaller hospitals. But I know from my own experience, it is not widespread. But the next step is how to sample from that adequately. So then the third part of this is the how to how to look at exposures and sticks and what do we know. And again, there's incredibly limited data. Um, um, P53 signatures have been associated with lower parity in one study with 75 cases. Age, elevated BMI associated with an increased prevalence of stick and P53 in another study. And there may be a protective trend with OCPs. All these are good, but there's more to look at. And again, this what it involves is really pooling epidemiological data, clinical data, pathology data, working out how to best sample it all together, and then looking at these things. And then it's requiring so this multi-center approach because no one center really has the number to look at this or the power to look at this. And then there's markers, and I think um, everyone has talked about markers, and, and Dr. Shi particularly, um, but I wanted to bring up sort of just a different angle of that. So again, we have a base that we're starting from in terms of sticks and, and sort of the, the KI67 P53, but we want to build on that. So as you heard today, and I'll show you a little more, there's numerous markers, which are great, that may be different in sticks, might be upregulated versus not, but how do we choose the markers we should look at now in larger numbers? Like what is, the, what is our thought process? Do we look at the ones that are, that are always present, or is it, is it more important to look at the ones that are unusual? Um, and this becomes really important in, in Project 5 because we actually can't look at all these markers because we just don't have the samples or the feasibility to keep looking at markers. So how do we select out the markers that might be important? Um, this, I think, uh, Yiming has already talked about, so I will move through, but I, I'm going to use this uh, example, which is from Eming's lab of KI67, to say, so one aspect is most of the studies so far done with markers have been in the context of having a high-grade serous carcinoma and an adjacent stick. Okay? These have been very important studies because they at least give us some idea of whether the marker is present in the stick. But um, now when we go forward, we're talking about these markers in the context of cancer-free women, and we are basically selecting out the markers now where they are very low levels in normal epithelium and high levels in sticks and HCG. So, is that, so that is one of the ways we're doing that, but as you saw today, there are many markers like that, and I think one of the challenges we have is to work out which markers might be fit, and I think something like proliferation, KI67, telomeres, because it relates to DNA damage, again, showing these comparisons between sticks and normal epithelium and high grade, we clearly don't want them high in the normal epithelium is important. Um, and I'm going to show one. And I think, I know Yiming already spent a lot of time in this, so I will not, but I think one thing I wanted to highlight with laminin one is that one of the reasons this is very exciting is because it doesn't, it may not overlap always with P53, so we may be able to use these markers in complement. So these are the sort of things that we're working through with all the other projects to work out how do we prioritize and think about the markers we should use in trying to look at stick in this and early lesions in these high risk populations. We're very fortunate to have many, but at the same time, um, it is hard to know which ones to select out, and I think a challenging thing. So now coming down to how, just sort of how Project 5 is working and, and the progress. So Project 5 itself is really targeting high-risk women. We're looking at women greater than 30 years of age at the time of bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. They are at high risk for ovarian cancer. Either they are, have a known mutation 
in BRCA1 or 2, or they have a very strong family history that puts them at high risk of having a mutation based either on their family history or BRCA pro. So for those who don't know, it's, it is a, a software that calculates the probability of having a mutation, and that would be greater than 20 percent. They have to have undergone a bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, and the key here is the tissue has to be processed by the CFIM protocol, or there has to be at least 80 percent of the tissue available. And this is actually a, an important limiting factor, because the CFIM protocol was not introduced till the 2000s in a lot of places. And then women with no prior history of ovarian cancer, except skin cancers, and um, we, di we are including those with a breast cancer within 10 years. So the whole project is, it has all four sites are involved, and it really has two phases. One is really, if you like, dipping into existing samples from each, um, each site, and the other is combining existing samples with prospective samples. And the reason for that is in the, in, we, were, we had the chance to incorporate some additional questions, particularly on medication intake and stuff, in the prospective aspects of this. So we were fortunate that a, all these sites are collecting samples in, in different ways, and some of them have ongoing high-risk cohorts that we were able to tap. Um, and others have just have a large volume and are able to go back to the, to the records. But what it meant is that we have pooled the questionnaires from all these four sites and then created a master template of the types of questions we think can be answered across the sites um, in terms of both epidemiological and clinical data as well as outcomes. And at the same time, we've had to link that data to the pathology databases at these sites to see which uh, people do, do, the, do they actually have tissue on. And so, believe it or not, it's been, it's been a, a fairly major venture to actually get everybody to be interacting with each other and working out who are the eligible patients. And I, I'm happy to say that um, across the sites, we really have been synergizing, and right now we're looking at already 500 potential eligible cases between Toronto, Sloan Kettering, and then we have another 100, hopefully, at, at Hopkins, and then Yale. So we're really sort of requiring both the identification of tissue, the epi data, and now what's happening is these things are being, uh, first of all, the initial pathology reports and clinical data are being uploaded as well as the epi data, and then the next phase is looking at how to sample, best way to sample these and go forward. But um, our idea here totally is to have, you know, somewhere around, I don't, I don't want to say yet, but we were, we were at least uh, thinking around projecting at least 500 cases across. So it'll enable us to look then at these exposures, and then in a subset of these, these nested uh, case controls, we'll be able to look at specific markers and associations with stick versus not stick. Um, but I think this will also help us be able to comment on the other early lesions, both in the tube as well as the ovaries, and enable us to um, look at the location, because the studies have suggested that there's between 50 and 70 percent are in the fimbria, but not, not necessarily all of them. So whether some, there's, there's some in the ovaries or further distal down in the tubes. Okay, and this just gives you an idea of some of the types of uh, data we're collecting, so over a hundred variables at least from all the sites. We're doing, we have created a template, they're pooling this data, then we QA the data, and then we will eventually merge all the data together. So in terms of ongoing work, we're talking about we've designed the templates, we've, desi we've designed prospective questionnaires that are moving forward. That at each of the sites, the epidemiological data is being put in, um, pathology reports are being uploaded, and we're really talking among all the um, pathologists and clinicians about sampling strategies and the best and feasible but uh, robust way to sample the tissue so we, that we can get uh, some good estimates. And then the other thing we had to do is to, to standardize the way we do things across the site so that we have uh, the same thing happening everywhere so that when we pool the data, we can then um, be confident that our estimates are good. Next steps, um, we move forward. 
And that's what I said in a year. We should have some data, hopefully, to share with you on an, in a number of levels. Um, we will have prioritized some of these markers and uh, move forward. So lastly, I just wanted to acknowledge people. I, I think I should acknowledge someone who I have not on the slide, and it's Sophia George at Toronto. She's done a large job in putting a lot of the reports there. Um, some of the group at Hopkins, and so I'm Kettering and Yale. And I know there's other people that are working with this, all these groups um, that I don't have on here. But you know, it, it's a it's a, a massive task to move from discovery to translating this now to the population. And it requires, what I've found is that it requires an effort of everyone talking to everyone and everyone understanding the limitations, feasibilities of each of the different areas to pull this together. But I'm happy to say that I think we are really, are progressing and um, I'm hopeful that within the next 12 months we'll have a lot to report. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure uh, now to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Simon Powell, who uh, grew up in Manchester, England, and attended uh, University of Oxford. Um, but he always wanted to be a scientist, just like his siblings. His brother is a physicist, and his uh, sister is a science teacher. And so he went to, uh, after going to Oxford, he uh, got an MD and a PhD from University of London in the United Kingdom, and then did a residency at Hammersmith uh, Hospital and uh, Whittington Hospital, and then a fellowship at the Royal Marsden in the UK. And just at a very similar conference like this one, he was giving a teaching lecture, and he ran into the chairman of radiation oncology, who was working at Harvard, who heard his lecture and said, that was a great lecture, why don't you come work for me in Boston? And so that's how he ended up coming over the pond, working initially at Harvard, going to Wash U, where he was a chairman for a number of years before joining us, I believe a few years ago, where he currently is the chairman of the radiation oncology department, and also runs a extremely enviable uh, laboratory that's well funded by the, the NCI with, with very, um, very uh, high quality uh, papers in high impact journals and excellent uh, peer review grant funding uh, where he studies uh, how DNA repair processes are disrupted in human cancers and how they can be exploited, exploited uh, therapeutically. And we're very um, happy that he's agreed to give our keynote lecture today, uh, talking about BRCA protein interactions and novel approaches to synthetic lethality or something along those lines. Please welcome Simon Powell. Well, thank you very much, Doug. I, I have to watch what I say in those interviews that you can use uh, for the introduction, but it was all true. And I apologize to uh, the change in order, but since I agreed to give this talk, uh, the NCI decided to fund uh, to, to have our site visit tomorrow, which, uh, and Craig Thompson needs all the support he can get for the site visit tomorrow. So for those of you, I know it's the last talk of the day, and I already heard it was a busy day. I hope this isn't information overload, but I'm going to try and give an outline of this very interesting DNA repair pathway controlled by the BRCA1 and 2 proteins. And I'll be successful if at the end of the day you realize just how many layers there really are to this pathway. So here's an intact DNA molecule uh, which is protected by lots of DNA repair pathways. Ones I'm not going to talk about, but, but lots of housekeeping genes largely acting on a single strand that help maintain the genome. Uh, other repair pathways that are primarily important for replication fidelity, uh, the translesion synthesis polymerases, which are the backup <coughs> polymerases, which I will refer to briefly, as well as the mismatch repair pathway, which is familiar uh, in the gynecological oncology territory in association with uterine cancer, um, and again, all, uh, helping to maintain the fidelity of the genome in patient. But it's these double-strand damage pathways that engages this homologous recombination machinery. And from the moment I walked into the room, uh, uh, halfway through Dr. Camp's talk, sorry about that, um, uh, I heard the uh, homologous recombination liberally mentioned. and. Uh, the idea of hearing this, even the repair pathway re mentioned 10 years ago was really unheard of. So the world has come a long way in, re in relation to DNA double-strand break repair. 
And there is a, another pathway, a, another major pathway of double strand break repair called non-homolog Zen joining, which I'm not going to talk about today, but again is, a, is certainly an important uh, uh, player in fixing double strand breaks. So again, I hope uh, this isn't too complicated because here is the major player, the, the double strand break represented by the pink and red lines. And the non-homologous end joining pathway that I'm not going to talk about is simply where you stitch them back together again, usually with the loss of some DNA sequence. On the left, on the right hand side, there is another interesting pathway whose role is not fully understood called single-stranded annealing. F remember that because I am going to come back to single-stranded annealing. Usually where there's annealing of homologous sequence uh, by flipping back the different aspects of the DNA strands, but just bear that one in mind. But center stage is this complicated pathway of homologous recombination whose where there are multiple steps, and I'm going to simplify it into the strand break and the processing, usually that leads to this resection. I'll come back to resection. Once you've had resection, you can start to make these complex structures where the damaged strand starts to invade the non-damaged strand and then can undergo a whole series of events um, that I'm not going to go into the huge detail of, about how they can be engaged, but I wanted to point, use this slide to point out the diverse role of where BRCA1 works. It not only works in controlling this resection step, it plays an important role in single-stranded annealing. It plays a, a, an initiating role in this so-called strand invasion or D-loop formation. Whereas BRCA2, the other player in this pathway, really has its role very clearly defined. Its role is to mediate this RAD51 driven D-loop formation. That's all it does. Now it's pretty important, but that is all it does. Um, and I'll come back to that. Now there are other roles of potentially in BRCA1 even in end joining, but these are a little bit more controversial. That's a subject for another day. And um, there are a whole host of accessory proteins that help in each of these stages of this BRCA1-2 pathway. So if that's, I hope that hasn't given you indigestion. Um, the summarizing of defective homologous recombination is important. And these are characteristics that you're probably familiar with. It gives you sensitivity to DNA cross-linking agents and the PARP inhibitors um, uh, which act through a different mechanism, or the mechanism is still hotly debated, but one of the mechanisms is to act through a, a backup pathway. It produces chromosomal aberrations, which is not characteristic of some of the other DNA repair pathways in cancer. And in, in particular, it produces chromatid-type aberrations. And again, the reason it produces chromatid-type aberrations hopefully will be obvious by the end of the talk because it produces gaps in DNA after replication, hence their post-replication G2, and as a result, they produce chromatid aberrations, breaks and exchanges. The chromatid exchange, of course, is the classic uh, triradial, quadriradial type of structures that we're familiar in seeing in BRCA division cancers. Now, the lack of any of these homologous recombination proteins produces uh, a significant reduction in the ability of cells to proliferate, particularly if they're knocked out acutely, and particularly in any stem cell pool population. And as a result, if you knock out almost any member, any member of the homologous recombination machinery, and there's about at least 30 of them on that tar chart I showed you, they're all lethal, except for RAD54. But they're pretty much all lethal. In other words, you need this pathway to get through normal proliferation, normal replication. And of course, we wouldn't be here if they didn't predispose to cancer. So again, here is the, those steps of homologous recombination in a little uh, simpler detail. Resection of the five prime end to expose a three prime tail. 
invasion of the three prime tail into the non-damaged duplex, extension of the D loop um, in this direction that produces what's called second end capture. So this, this non-damaged displaced duplex starts to anneal with the other end of the break. And then you get this double holiday junction, this double crossing over that allows you to close the gap um, on the damaged strand, hence the old phrase of DNA gap repair. And we tend to focus on this part of the pathway because this is where BRCA1 is working, this is where BRCA2 is working, but I want to impress on you that there are a whole series of events that are critically important to complete the homologous recombination step, uh, which are these extensions, this second end capture, um, this what, what's called um, essentially the tract length or the gene conversion tract length or the stability of this complex. And then, of course, you've got to get rid of these crossovers, and that's another enzymatic step called resolvases. And more re they're, all, they're all an important key player. We just haven't highlighted genes that are highly relevant in this phase of the, of, of the, of the, rea of the pathway. And again, just to take those first three steps in, 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 in a little bit more detail, when you resect this double-strand break, you create single-stranded tails. Um, once you have single-stranded DNA, it's rapidly bound by the single-stranded DNA binding protein, RPA. Once you have RPA, it appears to be a, a, this is a good substrate for recruitment of BRCA2, as has been shown biochemically by a number of groups, uh, including uh, Nikola Pavlitich here, when he helped solve some of the crystal structures of BRCA2. And then, there's a, there's a lot of huffing and puffing and, and massive use of effort by the cell to convert this into this, which is the RAD51 filament. I've simplified this to the key players, but there are uh, about 12 or 13 proteins involved in just making sure that this transition works appropriately. So the cell really takes a lot of care to make sure this happens well. So where does the BRCA1 and 2 pathway fit in? Well, again, along the left-hand side, I've got this same idea of double-strand break, resection, strand invasion, which hopefully you've, we're all uh, on board with. And then DNA repair, like any other signaling pathway, is a series of sensing uh, mediator and effector steps. And the layers... Um, that you can see in the DNA damage response are, are complex. You've got responses to DNA damage that are the, if you like, the chromatin modifications that occur where numerous proteins uh, bind and surround this area. And this is certainly the primary pathway that leads to the recruitment of BRCA1, which initially is recruited, if you like, in the vicinity of the break. It's not recruited initially directly to the break. The protein that's recruited directly to the break is this interesting uh, uh, protein complex called the MRE11 complex, um, which is responsible for both binding to the break and helping to mediate this resection in concert with the, with the, the initiator of resection, another protein here called CTIP. Now, BRCA1 starts to get involved in this part of the reaction where there's this interesting switch off between being recruited to the site of the break and then helping to initiate this resection step. So this in of itself is an awful lot of activity just to get BRCA1 to the scene of the action. Now there's a number of other players at the scene of the action. These, these DNA damage responsive kinases, the ATM and the ATR protein that are um, is, are important players in any aspect of the DNA damage response. And they signal through CHECK2, and there's an interaction between CHECK2 and BRCA1 that we think is very important. And only when all of this has happened, and again, this is a simplification, 
Only when all of this has happened can you then start to recruit these downstream players. PALB2, which is a, another interesting new protein that was discovered relatively recently as a partner and a localizer of BRCA2 that, a, that is an important part of this bridge to allow the recruitment and, and functioning of RAD51. So a while ago, we highlighted that this phosphorylation of uh, BRCA1 by CHECK2 was an important functional connection. And this was shown by creating a mutation in the BRCA1 protein at a specific serine site that when you created it, it made the protein highly dysfunctional in homologous recombination. So here we're looking at homologous recombination on the y-axis, and then we're looking at wild type and various other mutations. This is an, a mutation in the site phosphorylated by the ataxia telangiectasia protein, which actually functions quite well. But this single amino acid alteration is highly defective, suggesting that this was an important uh, modifier modification of the BRCA1 protein to trigger this pathway of homologous recombination. And here's just a, an empty vector in this background cell that's BRCA1, this cell that probably many of you are familiar with, a BRCA1 defective tumor cell derived from a BRCA1 mutation carrier. Now the other thing that made this mutation interesting is that it's a dissociation of function mutant because other aspects of BRCA1 signaling are actually completely intact. And here's just one example where this, this defective protein in repair actually functions quite well in its ability to inhibit DNA synthesis at S phase checkpoint function of the BRCA1 protein. So it's a very specific defect. And so we were very interested to follow this further and I hope this projects, but here is the BRCA1 protein in wild type, and you can see that after you damage the DNA, and here it's done using ionizing radiation as much for convenience that I'm a radiation oncologist, but it's a good way to damage cells, as we all know. Here is showing that the BRCA1 protein gets recruited to sites of DNA damage, which the host cell does not. The, there is detectable protein there, but it can't localize to damage sites because it lacks the BRCT domain. And here you can see is that this 988 mutant does also get to DNA damage sites. So it's that first step in the reaction is intact, but it's the later part of the reaction that, that, is, that is not present. So because here in the wild type BRCA1, you can see the RAD51 gets localized to the sites of DNA damage quite nicely, whereas this defective mutant does not. So there's this clear separation between this initial step in the BRCA1 pathway and this later step, the link to RAD51. And so we really wanted to look at that in more detail, and we looked at this by saying, well, is it really due to CHECK2? Because CHECK2 has been an interesting protein, certainly in familial breast cancer, um, and I, I forget how much it's prevalent in ovarian. It's also a minor player in ovarian, isn't it? So we, 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 we thought this made some sense in relation to uh, this, the pathway concept and the fact that you get mutations in one or other members of the pathway, but not in multiple players. And so we wanted to know whether this effect was really due to CHECK2, so we depleted CHECK2 by siRNA, show that BRCA1 got recruited just like wild type, but BRCA2 and RAD51 did not. So there was this separation between the upstream and the downstream. Here again, looking at the effects of damage-induced recruitment of proteins to sites of DNA damage. And, it, and in case we were still skeptical, we also used a knockout uh, rather than a depletion to find additional confirmation in the, the Bert Vogelstein uh, system. I know a lot of you are here from Hopkins, so you'll be familiar with that. Uh, this is the CHECK2 knockout made in the Vogelstein lab, where again, BRCA1 gets recruited, BRCA2 struggles to get there, and RAD51 doesn't get there at all. So you can see that there is this, this CHECK2 phosphorylation site is actually very important. And we were interested to know what was actually going on at a biochemical level, 
Um, this is again taking the wild type check two and the check two knockout. The observant of you may have noticed that there was also a reduction in the level of BRCA2 protein. This is real, and we've, I'm not going to go into the details of it. But what we did in this experiment was to complement the BRCA2 protein by overexpressing it to make sure that we had the same levels of BRCA2. That helped stabilize the RAD51 protein levels, so we now are comparing like with like. So this isn't just a protein defect, because now if you look over here, and we now look at the ability of RAD51 to get into the chromatin by, by fractionating the chromatin-bound fraction of the cell, you can see that the RAD51 only gets there if CHECK2 is wild type. If CHECK2 is gone, or even if you complement back the BRCA2 protein that gets the protein levels back to where they should be, the RAD51 can't get there. So it really is, the protein just doesn't work very well. And this goes to, sh the, you may ask, and I frequently am asked, so when does BRCA1 ever talk to BRCA2? And the answer is, not very often. In fact, the only time you can ever see BRCA1 in, uh, um, in, in a complex with BRCA2 is in the DNA, in the chromatin, after DNA damage. And what you can see here is that if you immunoprecipitate uh, using a tag form of BRCA1, you can pull down BRCA1, but it's and only whether you ha when you have wild-type BRCA1 do you see the BRCA2 in concert with it, whereas in the 988 mutant, this check 2 site mutant, it fails to make contact. So there's this disconnect in that step of the reaction. And again, this is just an, a final experiment in this series showing that Again, if, going back to the original observation I showed you, if you complement wild-type BRCA2 to get the BRCA2 levels up to the same as the wild-type, you can see that the BRCA2 levels are there, but the RAD51 doesn't work. Here it gets to the damage sites nicely, and here it fails to get to them. So we think there's, this is uh, to focus on one aspect of the upstream pathway of BRCA1 and BRCA2, that CHECK2 plays an important manipulation of BRCA1, and it helps to enable one of the connections to the downstream part of the pathway in recruiting BRCA2. So BRCA1 can localize the sites of damage without CHECK2, but it doesn't engage the rest of the pathway. And so now I'd like to focus on a second uh, story that um, again, gets at this, this, this fundamental uh, mechanism as we get from the resected uh, double-strand break in, into this, this ability to make D loops. And what I've suggested, here's this blown up, is that BRCA1 uh, is recruited to damage sites, the role for this PALB2 protein, and then BRCA2 is the major mediator to get RAD51 where it needs to be. Um, I want to highlight now the role of the RAD52 protein, which we've become very interested in. RAD52, for anybody who knows the DNA double-strand break repair literature well, is the only mediator of homologous recombination in yeast, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, where most of the discoveries in homologous recombination occurred. In in mammalian cells, RAD52 became a forgotten protein because it didn't seem to do anything very interesting. You knocked out, you knock out the, uh, the gene or deplete the protein in a mammalian cell in a mouse development system, and it didn't really do very much. So it seemed to be like the ho-hum, not very interesting protein. But then, um, a few years back, we made this observation, which is that if you deplete RAD52 in a cell that's already lost the function of BRCA2, you have a real problem. Here is the um, growth of cells lacking BRCA2 but maintaining the presence of RAD52, and they manage to grow quite reasonably, whereas if you knock out or if you deplete both uh, proteins, the cells fail to grow, and you can see by in cell culture there's this there's this failure to complete cell division. 
resulting in no net cell growth. So this is a severe, uh, if you like, synthetic lethal phenotype of RAD52 in a BRCA2 background because if BRCA2 is present, <coughs> knocking out RAD52, again shown in blue, really doesn't affect uh, the growth of these cells. So this is a very specific effect where loss of RAD52 is lethal with BRCA2. Oops, that's called a mistake. Uh, now I've got to go, I've hit the I've hit the end button before I should. Sorry about that. Uh-oh. Close your eyes. Um, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I should have known not to be ham-fisted. I'll use the arrows. So here is the ability of the BRCA2 deficient cells to grow. Sorry, of the BRCA2 proficient cells to grow without RAD52. And then we ask the question, well, is this characteristic of this effect of RAD52 true for the entire pathway? And the answer is yes. If you knock out BRCA1, either by depletion or in a, in a, in a cell harboring mutations, you can see that, again, this is looking now at homologous recombination measurements. You see a reduction of BRCA1, affects homologous recombination. RAD52 on its own does very little. The two together, a uh, very severe phenotype. And if you, PALB2 is, is also very similar. So BRCA1, PALB2, BRCA2 all show synthetic lethality with RAD52. And a picture is often makes that story even clearer. Here again are our favorite RAD51 foci, these, these proteins that accumulate at sites of DNA double strand breaks. And here you can see when you deplete RAD PALB2, there's a little bit of RAD51 uh, foci formation ability left. If you deplete RAD52 on its own, it doesn't do much at all. But if you deplete the two together, the ability to make these RAD51 dots, which we assume is equivalent to the formation of those D loops, uh, disappears completely. So a very striking phenotype. And again, summarized by this schematic, in which this BRCA1, BRCA2 pathway, which I again have simplified uh, on, on the left-hand side here, is backed up by this RAD52 pathway that becomes highly relevant when any part of this pathway is disrupted. So it becomes a salvage pathway, which makes it potentially an attractive target for therapy. And this is certainly an idea we are pursuing in conjunction with uh, other collaborators, Bill Holloman at uh, Cornell, um, as well as Mike O'Donnell on translation synthesis polymerases, we're looking at the strategy of potentially targeting RAD52. Don't ha uh, I, didn't, I don't have a magic drug as yet, so when we get one, we'll let you know, but we're certainly looking at the ability, whether it is a potentially druggable pathway. But then you ask the question, so what is the real function of RAD52? I mean, okay, so we've shown that it does something when the cells are under stress, but what's it really doing? Uh, is it just a backup pathway, which a lot of DNA repair pathways do have backup pathways, or does it have a real role? And so we looked into this uh, in a little bit more detail, particularly at this, com this coordination between the D-loop formation and the second end capture step that I outlined at the beginning. So again, just in case you were sleeping, um, which I hope you're not, I'm keeping an eye on everyone just to make sure everyone's paying attention. Um, here is the D-loop formation. This is the second end capture. BRCA2 plays this role. Uh, RAD52, we think, actually may play an important role in this second step. Now, if this is normally rate limiting, um, and there may be a, 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 it may be that the loss of RAD52 uh, isn't critically noticed by this, this pathway, although that's something we're interested in, in looking at. But then we looked into, we've been looking for a long time for proteins that cooperate with RAD52, both from the point of view of finding a target that's druggable, but also from the point of view of trying to understand what this protein does. 
And I won't go over the details of all of the work we did to try and find partners, but the only one we found um, is a protein called HellQ. Now, HellQ is probably not a protein that anybody in the room has heard of, um, but it's certainly become quite interesting from our point of view. Oh, I've done it again. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know how the best, I've got a, I didn't, I've never made that mistake before. <coughs> Many apologies. I guess it's hard to turn your head. Okay, sorry about that. I really will try to avoid it in future. So, um, HELQ, it, it plays this important role. Um, but we think in this step of the reaction, so it's, if you like, it's one step downstream from the BRCA2 dependent step. And again, um, I'm not going to talk about further downstream today. So HELQ, as you might imagine, with the title HELQ is a helicase, um, which acts on, on single strand, which is a single strand dependent DNA uh, ATPase, like many helicases are, belongs to the superfamily two, um, and has been basically been shown to have three prime helicase activity. Um, and again, just exactly what its role is has been debated between removing lagging strands or other actions as part of maintaining uh, genome integrity. Uh, one earlier report had suggested it may have a role in homologous recombination from uh, Alan D'Andrea's group, at Dana-Farber, where it appeared to be, have some epistasis with the Fanconi D2 uh, protein, which he's very interested in, and also produced sensitivity to TOPO1 inhibitors, as well as uh, cross-linking agents such as mitomycin C. So we looked at whether HELQ had any activity in these uh, pathways, either homologous recombination or single-stranded annealing, and the answer was yes. Not a huge effect, but definitely significant. So whereas BRCA1 and 2 will decrease homologous recombination by five to almost tenfold, very large effects, these are smaller effects, but it has a, also a significant role in single-stranded annealing. But this was the most important finding we had, is that it was completely epistatic with RAD52. So RAD52, in and of its uh, alone, has a relatively small effect on recombination, as I showed, barely detectable. HELQ has an effect on homologous recombination, but there's no, in contrast to everything we'd seen with the BRCA pathway members, HELQ did nothing. Uh, so, uh, in, in addition to RAD52, whether it's for homologous recombination or this other function of single-stranded annealing. And so what is it doing? We did our usual sort of detection work, which was, does it affect the DNA damage response? This is using gamma H2AX, a histone modification as a reflection of damage. No effect there. Does it affect the recruitment of RPA, that single-stranded binding protein, no effect there. So this basically pushed us downstream of resection. And um, what we also found is that HELQ does interact, though, with RPA. So again, if you immunoprecipitate HELQ, um, you bring down a protein, and in the presence of camptothecan, you can see that RPA binds to HELQ. So it's a damage-dependent interaction between this protein and the RPA. And we think it's probably phospho-RPA in recent work that I didn't have a chance to make into a slide. We don't need HELQ specifically for RAD51 focus formation. So again, suggesting it's downstream of that D-loop formation. <coughs> However, you do need it to recruit RAD52 the only way you can detect RAD52 uh, recruitment is actually by using a tag protein because not much of it actually gets recruited uh, by, in terms of protein abundance. So you need the tagging to be able to see it clearly. But again, HELQ seems to be important to allow RAD52 to get to these damage sites. And so what we think is happening is the HELQ 
Q is recruited by RPA. It promotes RAD52 recruitment, which helps mediate this second end capture step. So again, um, as I've highlighted earlier, it's, this, it's not this first strand invasion, it's this second end capture here, which is an important part of the reaction. But this was the surprise. Um, we wanted to know whether HELQ is actually facilitating RAD52 dependent molecules recombination. This backup pathway that's perhaps keeping these BRCA2 deficient, these BRCA1 and BRCA2 deficient cancers alive, is this, is this a, a key mediator? And the answer was a surprise because what happened here is that here again you can see this is the effect of depleting BRCA2, which you can see is about a 30 fold effect. It's a, I mean, BRCA2 is a huge effect on a molecular recombination, as we know. But when you knocked out HELQ, instead of either further depleting it, as we might have expected, it actually went in the opposite direction. It led to some recovery. But if we did the same thing with single-stranded annealing, HELQ always depletes. And this curious feature that Maria Jason here had already described is that when you deplete BRCA2 from a cell, the, the, the double-strand break repair is diverted through single-stranded annealing because you don't need BRCA2 for single-stranded annealing. But then what we found was that if you deplete HELQ, this is again RAD50, our favorite RAD51 foci, doesn't have an effect. If you deplete HELQ, if you deplete BRCA2, a reduction, but some residual RAD51 foci, but if you deplete HELQ and BRCA2, look, you get recovery. So there's an actual, you're actually rescuing the pathway. And we asked the question whether this was due to RAD52, and the answer is absolutely. Because if you triple deplete, all of this recovery is lost by further depleting RAD52. So we struggled to work out um, what that meant, but we now think that we know that HELQ and RAD52 are working together to promote single-stranded annealing, uh, that HELQ acts downstream of resection, that RAD HELQ inhibits RAD52-dependent homologous recombination. And again, this was the surprising finding. And what we think is going on is that it's promoting second-end capture, perhaps through its helicase activity, to make the right DNA structure that allows the recruitment for RAD52, which, if you like, either diverts or actively inhibits its role in, in RAD51-dependent homologous recombination. And that's the idea that we're looking into. And then I rang Doug or emailed Doug uh, uh, when we had these data saying, oh, Doug, tell me what's going on in the Cancer Genome Atlas for HELQ. Because it, it figured it must be interesting and I'd heard there were uh, reports of, of defects. So this was the screenshot he gave me just to show that I do read your emails, Doug. And here we can see, um, um, here is, um, this is the, Cancer Genome Atlas data where there was sequencing and copy number data available. And as you can see, this is not, this, there are um, <coughs> defects either by uh, deletion or mutation or occasionally amplification, not quite sure what that means in relation to BRCA2, uh, other than perhaps global. Um, but nonetheless, you can see that there are the, as you expected, non-overlapping uh, effects for BRCA1 and BRCA2 which is clearly the most prevalent finding. Uh, this P10 deficiency, which again I know has been discussed and I think will be discussed more tomorrow. And here's HELQ, so it's only 2%, so it's not a big player, but actually it's strikingly uh, non-overlapping. Um, and I don't know whether that is gonna be significant or not. Um, I could have predicted a model that was either non-overlapping or overlapping, um, but nonetheless, uh, I think it's quite interesting that there is both homozygous deletion. And uh, any of you um, involved in the Cancer Genome Atlas will know that it's not just somatic homozygous deletions that are becoming interesting, but even uh, single allele deletions and, and gene dosage that actually may be contributing as well. So um, I know this is a, an area that will be, be growing. So just to summarize, uh, this first half, uh, 
we've, we've basically shown you that the BRCA1, BRCA2 pathway primarily works to promote RAD51 and this pathway of homologous recombination. We've shown you that that CHECK2 is an important initiating, makes an initiating modification of BRCA1 that allows this pathway to work, although the detailed mechanisms of what this phosphorylation does, whether it's working at the level of CTIP, whether it's working at the level of phosphorylated RPA, or whether it's working directly at PALB2 recruitment is something we're still investigating. So these, there's layers that are occurring right at the level of BRCA1. And then um, I've also shown you evidence that there are supportive role players such as RAD52. And the only uh, protein that we found so far that, that is cooperating with RAD52 uh, that's primarily involved in the second end capture step. But when this is missing, the RAD52 protein plays more of a role in this or can help uh, this RAD51 mediated step. And this um, left hand side of the slide is there to remind me that this homologous recombination pathway is not just to manage the double strand break that's created uh, um, either post replication or in G2, where there's an easily available non damaged duplex, but perhaps it's actually involved in managing. Uh, double strand breaks that occur either directly at the replication fork where the leading strand runs into a gap on one strand here shown on the lagging strand which creates a one-ended double strand break we know that that is not a good substrate for non for other parts of the repair pathway so a recombination may well be helping this type of lesion or another type of lesion that's produced uh, in association with replication, where if you have a lesion on the parental strand, the replication fork comes by, hops over a number of types of lesions, as Ken Marion's has recently very elegantly demonstrated, um, and produces the, these things called daughter strand gaps. And I come back to that, but again, the process in these daughter strand gaps by base excision repair <coughs> produces essentially a post-replication double strand break. And so then this becomes somewhat analogous to this where we don't know where the replication fork is. But I think it's important to remember that maintaining the genome integrity by this pathway is not just triggered by this lesion, but it's these replication associated lesions that really is what's driving it. Synthetic lethality, I've raised as a, a concept, although its, it's, it's poster child uh, was summarized in, in this slide from one of the two Nature papers published back in 2005, where the PARP inhibitor, which, uh, which inhibits single-strand brake repair, although it may not be its only mechanism of action, capitalizes on the ability to create this one-ended double-strand brake, as I just showed you, and that you need homologous recombination to repair this type of lesion. And in the absence of BRCA2, you become extraordinarily sensitive to uh, this uh, Newcastle University derived PARP inhibitor shown by this amazing sensitization that was reported. And again, um, this is just a, a diagram summarizing that it's not it's not just double strand breaks, but it's these replication lesions that produce these daughter strand gaps. And again, the PARP inhibitor emphasizes the ability either shown on the, this slide to create these one-ended double strand breaks, but also it's, it's, what, it's what converts this type of lesion into um, a potentially into a double strand break um, uh, if, if the replication fork has gone by. But another backup pathway is this translesion synthesis polymerase pathway. If you create this daughter strand gap, it's the translesion synthesis that comes behind the replication fork to fix these lesions. And again, the idea that you may have a synthetic lethality uh, to BRCA deficiency could be generated by a whole series of backup pathways. So again, 
just to recapitulate what synthetic lethality is, in the classic model of, say, yeast genetics, you have a single gene mutation that's viable. You have a second uh, gene when, as, as a single gene mutation that's viable, but you have the two together, and suddenly the two together are lethal. So in the classic model, it's two pathways, one defective, no effect on, on viability. But actually, in reality, if you think about synthetic lethality, it's actually probably more complicated than that. Epistasis, which, if you like, is the counterpoint to synthetic lethality, which is where you knock out one gene on the same pathway and then knock out a second gene on the same pathway, it doesn't do any more. It's epistatic. But in reality, if you have a partial inhibition at two steps along the same pathway, it could actually convert uh, partial effects to full effects, and, and you could get the appearance of synthetic lethality. And so synthetic lethal screens that are being carried out everywhere in the world with great vigor right now, looking for you know, the molecule to hit, um, they may not correspond to the classical model. They may well be actually uh, acting in the same pathway rather than complementary or backup pathways. <laughs> and there's another twist to synthetic lethality, which is really where you be a version on oncogene addiction you're used to having very high levels of the, of the protein or the, or in question. So a, somewhat a depletion of a, high, of a protein that you become addicted to can also produce synthetic lethality. So any of you out there doing synthetic lethal screens, just a little word of caution, but in relation to synthetic lethal opportunities in the BRCA pathway, the PARP inhibitors are the poster child mediating through base excision repair although it's probably more complicated than that. And then the areas that we're interested in, which I've tried to persuade you might be quite interesting, but we don't have a drug for you today, either targeting the RAD52 backup pathway or potentially targeting the translation synthesis polymerase inhibitors. And in particular, uh, the way those group of enzymes uh, link with PCNA, which is a potentially druggable target. So the other way you could get more interested in the relevance of BRCA pathway is to, is to also try to clarify BRCA-ness or the sporadic loss of function of this pathway. So in any situation where there's a genetic predisposition to cancer, the disruption of the same pathway in sporadic cancers is often seen for the same site. B53 is dominated by sporadic mutations, rarely germline mutations in Leaf Romani. Retinoblastoma is about 50-50. So what's the case for the BRCA pathway? Um, it was many years ago now that we got interested in finding out the prevalence of functional defects in the BRCA1-2 pathway in sporadic breast and ovarian cancer. And we wanted to really uh, extend this now to be more detailed in relation to both breast and more recently uh, work in collaboration with Doug on, on ovarian cancer. But the concept, again, here's the simplified version of the pathway we've been talking about. In genetic, uh, in patients carrying a, a mutation in the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene, their normal tissues are heterozygous. The tumors, uh, in almost all situations, it's a controversy, I know, so I won't dwell on it. Um, different people have different views. But the frequently, the, the second allele is lost, be behaving like a classic tumor suppressor. But it, it, sometimes in wild-type background, you get this functional defect that is acquired. So how do we know? Well, way, many of, 10 years ago now, we started testing breast cancer samples, taking biopsies from patients undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy. When, we, when these samples are acquired, we, we, we got them before the pathologist could stick them in formalin or anything else frozen so that the cells were viable. Uh, we only handled them for four hours after, irradi after we again showed a little bit of radiation to them to impart some DNA damage. And then we could freeze them, section them, and ask whether this same pathway functioned in the real breast cancer samples. So here are the cells in culture. 
um, where I've shown many examples of these RAD51 foci, very florid, uh, very extensive throughout the nucleus. And here is a high-grade uh, triple negative breast cancer um, uh, shown by the, the familiar H&E stain. And then on the left and right are uh, samples where we've stained for RAD51 in the tumor specimens. And what you can see is that in this tumor that has a proficient uh, RAD51 uh, spectrum, you can see the induction of these RAD51 foci. It, on the le right hand side, there are very few of these RAD51 foci. You always see a few basal level, uh, but there is very little ability to induce. So this assay became the ability to induce RAD51 foci. We've refined it somewhat since those initial days. Now we actually take tumor samples, disaggregate the tumor, get much prettier uh, cell nuclei. And here you can see a proficient cell in which BRCA1 and RAD51 gets recruited, whereas here is on the, on the right-hand side, in spite of 10 gray of ionizing radiation, not a single BRCA1 uh, recruitment focus and not a single RAD51 within this field. And again, this, is, this and this are strikingly different. And at the top, we just have a control for DNA damage, showing that these cells are alive and they are responding to DNA damage. So again, because just in case there's some technical aspects. So you can categorize tumors into proficient and deficient by the ability to induce these, to see this increase in BRCA1 and this increase in RAD51. Now, compared to cells in culture, you don't get 100% of the cells responding because it's really only the proliferative compartment of the cells that will show this reaction. But I think you can see that this, this reaction here is clearly different from this reaction here, this, this lack of induction. And what these BRCA pathway defects, as we're calling them, are actually categorical. Here is the analysis of, I think, the first 70 or so patients, in which you can see that the tumors either showed this very flat, complete lack of response to, of RAD51, or they showed a significant response, and there was, there was essentially a bimodal distribution. This wasn't just a spectrum, uh, which really was uh, quite striking to us. And here, if we look at BRCA1, same, same characteristic, and again, here's one example where BRCA1 was recruited, but RAD51 wasn't, suggesting that the upstream part of the pathway was intact, but the downstream pathway was defective. And so, again, as we applied this to the first, uh, oh, what is that, 71, I think it is, cases of uh, breast cancer that we looked at, triple negative, HER2 amplified, ER positive, this HR defective characteristic is seen across the, the spectrum. Uh, and although it's enriched in the triple negative form of breast cancer, which I guess is you know, analogous to serous adenocarcinoma of the ovary, um, you see it also in HER2 amplified breast cancer, not rarely, and even in ER positive, and we suspect this is more the luminal B rather than luminal A type, you see a, a significant uh, prevalence. So this was very surprising to us, even though the sample size is small. We then asked, okay, how do we know that this, this, this assay really is telling us something significant? So we did a pilot study of looking at six tumors that we categorized as deficient and six that we categorized as proficient and matched them for the IHC subtypes. In other words, we had two of each of the categories. We did uh, DNA extraction of the tumors, array CGH, and looked at um, the pattern of landscape changes in the genome. And essentially, in the repair deficient cancers, you frequently saw these large segment deletions and large segment amplifications, which was very characteristic, whereas the repair proficient also showed instability, but it was a much more granular pattern, much less gains and losses that we saw. And if you plot this, oh, here's the whole genome pictures which I'm not sure tells you very much other than I think it's, I'm trying to make this into a painting to put on my wall. <laughs> um, but again, if you really look at granular detail, you'll see that, again, the deficient cancers have larger blocks 
the distribution of where they occur is an interesting subject. But if what we did here was we then plotted the number of deleted segments <coughs> against the segment lengths deleted. And essentially, until you get to five megabase deletions, which are big chunks lost, there was very little separation of the curves. It's really these two curves only start to separate in this region between five and 15 megabase, mega, <laughs> megabase, megabase pair deletions. So big chunks of the chromosome getting deleted. And then, and as you get out here, which is like whole chromosome arms or whole chromosomes, there's no further change. So the, the, the divergence between the repair deficient and the repair proficient was in this very narrow window, which we think is another manifestation of homologous recombination deficiency. And the fact that these uh, two curves separated very nicely based upon this categorization, we really felt... Uh, corroborated our functional assay with a with a a, ver a different but verified form. So defects in this pathway, we think in breast cancer are common in maybe as much as 25%. So instead of dealing with 5 to 7% hereditary form of breast cancer, we're dealing with maybe 25% with some form of functional defect. And it's not specific to triple negative, We've largely excluded mutation carriers that are, you know, un, um, you know un, un, unknown BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation carriers that, that are in this population. In fact, we're now carrying out full exome sequencing of this population to verify, uh, that number one, there are no BRCA1 and 2 mutations, and number two, hunting for other mutations that are present either in the germline or in the tumors. But it's quite interesting that the commonest defect is actually upstream in this pathway. It actually acts above BRCA1 recruitment, a part of the pathway that we didn't uh, go into uh, much detail. And we're very interested in looking into that. Now, in contrast to ovarian cancer, where BRCA1 methylation uh, seems to be an important uh, epigenetic regulator of this pathway, seeing BRCA1 methylation that produces uh, low levels of BRCA1 protein was actually only seen once out of the 52 cases where we had the analysis. So f f BRCA1 methylation that actually produces functionally important lowering of the BRCA1 protein doesn't seem to be, um, that's the incidence with which we could find it. Now, it's not that aberrations in methylation don't occur in breast cancers, of course they do but it's a, it's a methylation chain that's sufficient to alter the function of the pathway, that actually we think is less common. And I know that's a controversial point. To this audience, we may not need to say why is it important to know uh, whether this pathway is or isn't working, because it not only predicts a different type of sensitivity, the cross-linking agents, the topoisomerase inhibitors, oh yes, so I'll come back to it. Yeah, I've forgotten that was included. Uh, this is another interesting drug, but for another talk. Um, but actually, perhaps the less well-remembered part of this story, but we think, again, could be very relevant, where we've seen examples of breast cancer patients who respond beautifully to cyclophosphamide and adromycin, go, move to taxanes, and start to show progression. And uh, It's a syndrome that we've seen, and we're, we're trying to pin down whether this is directly associated with this BRCA nest phenotype. But cell lines that are deficient in BRCA1 or 2 actually show resistance to taxanes, the mechanism of which is interesting. So in summary, we think DNA repair isn't just a subject for academic discussion, which we've always, I personally always liked, uh, but is actually now has a potential role in the clinic. Um, we think that homologous recombination repair could be important for the reasons I hope I've explained. We're not all talk and no action. We did, before I left Washington University to, uh, in 2008 to come here, uh, we had a clinical trial in progress where we were giving preoperative cisplatinum and radiation for T3, T4, triple negative breast cancer. And uh, we analyzed the response by the functional assay. And although we only have 10 patients analyzed and it's very preliminary, I couldn't resist the fact that 
we found five out of the six were actually homologous recombination defective, and all five HR defective cancers showed PATH-CR. And only one out of the five HR proficient cancers showed PATH-CR. So I know it's a small series, but it certainly is enough to get me interested. Unfortunately, it's the hazard of leaving because we were accruing well to this study, 18 patients, biopsies flowing into the lab, and as soon as I left, it disappeared. And I don't know which other protocol took over, but something became more interesting. And uh, there's always a moral to that story. So sporadic defects in homologous recombination uh, in breast cancer and perhaps also ovarian cancer to the, at least the same degree. Um, we think functional tests may be important for therapy-oriented classifications, uh, that sporadic breast cancer show functional defects, uh, maybe in as many as a quarter. Shown that the functional assay was supported by array CGH categorizations. And that, uh, oh yes, we've also, I didn't have time to go into how we've also found this phenotype in cell lines, and we're zooming in on perhaps an area which seems to be particularly prone to being affected. But either way, it enlarges the therapeutic opportunities for DNA repair based therapies and should produce more in terms of personalized cancer therapies. So those are the people who did the work. I'm not going to name them one by one because there was no time. But we're a very happy group. Here you can see us in one of our many Manhattan uh, uh, social outings when we're resting from measuring homologous recombination. And with that, I'll close. And uh, if the day allows it, uh, happy to answer any questions. Simon. I'll ask one quick question for you. Um, in the first half of the talk, you were talking about CHECK2 and its relationship to BRCA2, but you didn't really talk about the cell cycle very much. And since HR goes on in the cell cycle, how does all that interact? Yeah, that's a good question, Doug. The, um, again, I had to filter out some of the details, but the effects of that CHECK2 mutation or CHECK2 depletion uh, did not have an effect on cell cycle in those tumor lines because obviously they're driven to cycle. So if you, uh, in both the published paper and some of the unpublished work, this was really independent of cell cycle. Um, so obviously, anytime you switch off the cell cycle, homologous recombination will go down. Uh, but that check two effect, we can clearly dissociate from cell cycle checkpoint. Thank you very much. Okay, Appreciate Doug. it. Thank you, everyone, for uh, yep. for coming today. Again, a reminder: tomorrow breakfast is at eight o'clock. We'll start at nine o'clock um, in the Zuckerman Research Building. Please enter on the south side of 69th Street. Um, if you have any questions about logistics, I'm around for a few minutes. Any more questions? Dr. Powell will be here. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Anyone's flash drive? <laughs>